Hi, everyone. Welcome to Office Hours. Uh, if you are watching on YouTube and you see a little link, you can click on it and you'll actually end up in uh, Zoom. You'll see another little link and you click on that and you'll end up in Mukana. And that's where you can actually ask questions and, um, and uh, post questions, um, chat with folks. Now, if you watch all these questions being answered and you think that I, I could do better than that, I, I, have, I have things I could add there, then join us. Uh, what we, the best thing to do is to come in early. Uh, we, start the, we open the doors at... Uh, at six o'clock so you can come in as early as six to just check out your kit hang out with us a little bit um and at 6 40 we open up the mic check and uh, once we've started mic checks uh, today's a little different because we bring people in in stages but generally once we open the mic checks we're we're done for the day um so uh so definitely come in early and um yeah let's go ahead and jump into the questions go ahead bill Okay, Guy is starting us off with the first one that is a broad question. I don't think there could be a broader question in the world, and I love this. What is the best gadget device ever? Ever. 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 <laughs> Go ahead. I, I, ever is a... That's a big one. It's a big word. All right. This is, this is going to take some, some thought here. Um, uh, John, and then Peter, and then Bill. The stove. Because now I can cook and make you don't, a cooking you, you, show. You don't want to go all the way back to fire? Fire's a pretty good gadget. Fire's not a gadget. <laughs> okay. Because <laughs> I'm just saying that was a pretty gadget. useful one. I'm just saying, I'm just that, saying, like when you're talking about ever, I, when, we, when we go I, all the way back ever, <laughs> fire was pretty good. Like it was like, ah, you can imagine someone built that and someone just went, hey, that's a really good idea. Let's do that again. <laughs> but if we're talking about modern times, I think the, the smartphone, uh, specifically the iPhone, is probably <laughs> one of the most important gadgets of the modern era because of all the tools that it has allowed from uh, drone, better drones with their gyroscopes uh, to uh, smart control services and things like that. But uh, yeah, uh, the, the stove. Yeah, good. Uh, TJ, I, I lost track of who was who was who. So TJ and then Peter and then Bill. The steel knife. Steel Made knife. out of steel specifically. You know, I, but I, I will say... We did go a couple hundred or at least to tens of thousands of years on Flint. I'm just saying, or, or, or oh, obsidian, you know, like it was, it was like, it was like, yeah, it was pretty good. I go to Peter and then Bill. Well, I'll use, uh, I'll do the twofold one, the wheel. Yeah, if you want to go back and, 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 and then in modern <laughs> times, the transistor, the transistor. Transistor. Yep. Absolutely. Go ahead, Bill. So I'm going to, I don't know. I, I don't know if the transistor is a gadget. The wheel is probably a gadget at the beginning. Like the wheel was probably like there was there was probably a thousand years of them just playing with it, like thinking it was cool, and then someone was like, you know, we could carry stuff with this, and then then they built a wheelbarrow. Probably you, you anyway, need to Bill. read the history of the, of the building of the transistor at Bell Labs. It was it was a gadget for a while. Okay, Bill. I think it's it depends on what you who you are and what you like to do. And I, I my two answers, what I originally came up with, have been reflected. TJ got most of it. I do think in the modern area, in terms of pure gadget, the cell phone, the, the smartphone, the ability to attach the databases and bring all the information of history basically to your pocket was pretty transformative. The other thing I was going to think though, the one that impacted me probably more than anything else as an individual human boy growing up was the pocket knife. I remember getting my first little, the whole thing open was probably four inches and understanding how that was going to affect my life. And the fact that I didn't know I needed it, but then I suddenly found so many uses and it got me to understand the power of a tool. And mm -hmm. still to this day, just being able to open all the constant FedEx boxes and things like that, it's the one thing that I probably touch more than anything else. Go ahead, uh, Nigel, and then Sky, and then Stuart. Yes, as the youngest child, I'll tell you the television remote control was the best because I was the one who had to change the channel all the time. But in terms of this this video and this podcasting stuff, the, I mean, obviously the ATM and all of that stuff, but I have to tell you the Stream Deck was the thing that I used most that I didn't know about until somebody told me about one. <laughs> I do think it's funny that you brought up that I think that that must have been very formative for you to have to fight for the remote control because now you have a whole company that builds AV systems for people's houses. Exactly. But I didn't have to fight for it. As the youngest child, I had to go and change the channel. So we just automate everything now. See, see, like you were like, I'm going to fix this someday. I'm going to fix exactly. this someday. And now you have fixed it. All right. All right. Go ahead, Sky and then Stuart. Yes. As the youngest child of five, I was also tasked with that until I started pulling the knobs off because I was a little kid. Who knew? But to, to Bill's point of a knife, I was going to go with the Swiss Army knife. The gadget that has all of the different different things, and I also remember one of those that had a spoon on it, and uh, scissors and toothpicks, and it was pretty pretty magical. 
but I've also seen boxes of them at the airports with the TSA taking them off your person and then just throwing them into a box. Very sad. I, 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 I think almost all my kids, is at, when they hit about somewhere between 10 and 12, I buy them a tinker, you know, the, the Swiss army tinker, because it's, uh, it's what I grew up with. You know, it's what it's uh, anyway, Stuart. And then Charles. I can't believe how limited people are in their scope of deciding what is the best gadget or device. It's like working with amateurs tonight, I believe. The aerofoil. Now, this one's a little bit difficult to follow, but if yeah, you're we're, like we're Mr. Already. Burke's show. Okay, the first example of an aerofoil is a boomerang. So it's a hunting device that is over 40,000 years old. But more commonly, if you go back to the 1700s, you find them, well, actually, even the 1400s, you find them in water wheels and in uh, windmills. Then you move through to turbines, mm -hmm. steam turbines specifically, and then you've got an industrial revolution. Hmm. There you go. Okay. So you okay, get that's, that's power, cool. you get ability to move I... things, you get electricity, mm -hmm. you get the entire modern world, and it's from an aerofoil. Right. Fire, though, fire is a pretty good gadget. That's all I'm saying. It's it's it's, it's up there. I right, go ahead, Charles, and then and then John. All right. So I second what everybody said. One, I would say anything that SpaceX is doing right now, I'm guessing is changing civilization. But in the last year, my favorite thing for 3D modeling has been a 3D mouse where I can pull, and this is a 3D mouse. I can Do you like pull. it? I've seen it. So I've, I've tracked it and I've been like, does that really work? So you, you like I it. am in love with that thing. It, uh -huh. it lets me move the way yeah. that my brain thinks when I'm in. Who makes that? Uh, this is from a company called 3D Connection and Connection is X, X, I. You wonder why oh, I'm and... waving. It's, it's all the smoke coming off of my, <laughs> coming out of my pocket. It's like yeah, my, but, my wallet is on but fire. It is, again. But it is amazing for, the... <laughs> so that's for, cool. in the last year, that's been the best thing for me. Go ahead, John, and then Jeffrey. Well, I don't know whether guy has it with him, but do you have the uh, stream deck with that hand G hold near you? Guy showed that to me yesterday, and I've had that before. So it's just a little gadget normally in the back of your iPhone. He has it on his stream deck. Oh, that's cool. <laughs> that's taking it to a whole nother level. <laughs> yeah, it's just because just it's in my hand all the time. So now it's one of those like pop socket type things for cell phones. But yeah, right. it's pretty handy now to be able to let Good. go. That's awesome. Jeffrey? I think I know where you got that pop socket from. Uh, you know, I was thinking about this, and all time, the one thing, one device that has really helped me throughout my whole life and career was actually the Erector set, because not as the fact that I could build all the devices on there, but I could take the parts out. And I, I whenever something broke on, on a device, I would take an Erector set, a piece, and I would mold it into something that I'd need to, like for instance, my guitar, my guitar pick, I had to change that out, and I used the Erector set piece to actually set that guitar pick in its, in its place. So that really has gotten me into thinking about how to fix things that break and uh, and work from there. So if I, I I've been actually searching for erector set pieces, just so I had them in in shop here, just in case I need them. Good, Chris. Yeah. So interesting question um, with interesting answers. If you've ever read the book Lucifer's Hammer, it's interesting to see uh, how this group of people fits into one or two categories. What they consider to be useful technology. <laughs> go, yeah, go ahead, uh, Mickey, and then Michael. Uh magnets magnets are cool um you know they're the basis of microphones and speakers as well so they're cool magnets uh michael phonograph without the phonograph we would not have audio we wouldn't have movies we wouldn't have any of that stuff and and uh, you know all the great all the great songs and albums throughout you know the decades centuries whatever we wouldn't have any of it so it's pretty cool yeah alex I am um, my SIG file on my emails in the 1980s was designed paper ship, paper clips, not Porsches. I like the paper clip. I just like the idea of two different kinds of design. There's design that's all about refining something else and putting wing, well, fins on it. And then it's coming up with the original idea of taking a single piece of metal and then making it able to organize things. So a paper clip. 
uh, uh, Bill and then Paul. So uh, people have told me, though, that they think uh, movable type, resettable type, because without that, humans would not have created that idea of being able to codify thinking and pass it down to further generations. And I guess there is an arc of before printing presses and Gutenberg and all that revolution, how fast society moved forward before that versus after that. Paul? I would say uh, the the best uh, software, it's kind of a device would be Apple works on my old Apple IIe. I've never well, seen- Well, we've kind of gone into technology and I, I'm afraid I set the pace too, because I went out of gadgets and straight to, you know, tech, like what tech is, is the biggest thing, but yeah. Uh, this this morning I, I tuned into Clubhouse a little early and uh, there was this uh, Amanda person from Great Britain. She had uh, everyone change their picture to a gadget. And then she would she could go through about 200 people and pick out which gadgets she liked, and they would come on and talk about their gadgets like we're doing right now. It's pretty fascinating. No, those guys that's where I got the idea from oh. Paul. I was watching you in Clubhouse, and so I listened to it for a little bit. I was like, "That's a great question for Mukana." So we, we I had, kind of grabbed it from there. We, we had we had fun with that. That was good. That was good. It's a good way to start off a Saturday. Uh, next question. Charles Hodge of White Lake, uh, Michigan says, define super source. You know, I wanted to define it for, oh, oh. so the super source is basically, it's, it's a nomenclature for specifically for the ATEM. So there's lots of different words for it. So this isn't like a can't, the canon of video production is called a super source, but what, what black magic calls a super source is the essentially the ability to stack up to four video feeds together, like a DVE and put a graphic either underneath them or, ab or, or um, above them. And uh, you see it most commonly if you're watching CNN or, or some other TV show where there's multiple windows of people talking. That is what we typically refer to as a super source. No, Nick, uh, go ahead, Stuart. Just for the vMix users out there, the equivalent is a virtual set that's blank and it just allows you to drop the layers in and it's really, really useful. I'm using it to, at the moment for that background. Oh, nice. Next question. Paul Wallace of Austin, Texas is up next with Alex. Can we talk some more about doing some emulations of different looks in graphics like CNN, MSNBC, ESPN, ABC, NBC, CBS, BBC, and so forth to flex our Zoom OSC muscles we touched on this a few days ago. It's just a matter of somebody doing it. <laughs> I, I don't have the time to do it right now myself, but but it's just, I think all you have to do is, I would just grab, before I tried to reproduce the graphics, I would just grab the graphics that are there and just use Zoom OSC to paste basically images. This gets back to that super source idea to grab a couple people and just stick them over top of a background um, in Zoom OSC uh, with live video from Zoom, I think would be an interesting, that would be, step one like that for me that would be like hello world would be um yeah go ahead alex um could we in the discord have a place where we keep um frames or bits of video that we could use as reference for people to have a look at or sure. is that will be a place yeah well you can put it in zoom the zoom osc one we just you know or if someone wants to create a zoom osc challenge you know just talk to chad i'm, I'm 100 percent behind that cool. so zoom, so, zoom osc challenges would be great oh yeah because i've got some uk footage maybe Cool. Maybe. <laughs> yeah, might, might be good to put up. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Yeah, yeah let's let's let's. Uh, if we want to create a category, not a category, but a but a channel that's Zoom OSC challenges, uh, that that'd be great. Next question. I think Alex does this oh, for ahead. a living, don't you, Alex? I manage it for a living. <laughs> I don't do it as much <laughs> as I used to. So, uh, which I you know sometimes I'm become painfully aware of. Uh, anyway, so um, yeah, so I I don't I I uh, I do do it. I have done it a lot, but I, right now, my, most of my days are spent in keynote numbers. Next question. John Pewitt of Huntersville says, and here in the panel, when I plug in my 6K Pro into my Mac via USB-C, Blackmagic camera does not see it. What am I doing wrong? Yeah, the, the camera is not designed to push video out of the, out of the, out of that USB-C. I don't, I don't believe. Uh, go ahead, Peter, and then John. From what I've read, it, it, it does not appear as a USB camera, period. John, I wasn't trying to get video out of the camera through USB C. I was trying to control it with the camera setup utility. And I, I, it's just not seeing it. The only time I've ever seen it work is using the, the the iPhone or the 
iPhone yeah. app if you want to do it. I haven't seen any interaction so. through the USB C. It's it's just it, it okay. it's um the the only, it's, it's just dry it yeah. Yeah. It's 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 uh just right to drive. It doesn't have any I don't think it has anything else other than right to drive. Yep. Next question. David Brady of New York comes in with, is there an HDMI port priority of the ATEM Mini Pro ISO and Pro ISO Extreme? What should be plugged into the first port? Well, we've talked about that. In generally, uh, we found that plugging your computer into the first port is the best thing to uh, put it in there because it's designed for lower latency. Um, it also can be quirky with other things other than the computer. Um, so so it's, um, that, that, that's been our recommendation, at least from the first versions of it. Go ahead, Peter. I was going to say the it said it the first port has a different scaler in it than the mm -hmm. other other three, so that's why you use the. You, and I don't know want. this now, question I is. My, I have right. my camera plugged into the first port in that because that's also how picture in picture will will kick off correctly, right? right. You know, yeah. using the defaults, using the, I know you can do all sorts of things if you program it, but if you just want to use the buttons, right? Yeah. Yep. Yeah, so there you go. Next question. Nigel DeSaw of Austin, Texas says, if I bring a Zoom call into my ATEM Mini via HDMI, how do I get the person on the Zoom call to see the ATEM's output? Um, the, 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 there's two things. <laughs> there, uh, just know that that can be disconcerting for people to see themselves or see the, see the show on the way back out. Um, but, uh, but outside of that, when their, their zoom call is coming in, I mean, you have to also have to worry about video feedback. Go ahead, Jeffrey. What I would do is I would, uh, bring it into the computer, go into a, some sort of software switcher like OBS or Wirecast or whatnot, and then push that out. Into well, he's got an ATEM. The, back into the he's, zoom he's, call. He's got an ATEM. So, yeah, but he, so, he's bringing he's bringing the Zoom call in to come, and he wants to see that that video that's coming out. So that would, at well, least that's how I read it. How, no, Nigel, you can tell us how you meant it. <laughs> well, I, only in as much as I'm trying to set this up so I can I can do uh, some podcasting for work, and I'm concerned that lots of people I bring on aren't used to not seeing the other people on the other end of the line. So I'm trying to work out what to send them to make them feel more comfortable, rather than just staring at themselves. And the answer may just be staring at themselves. And you want to do video podcast and you want them to yeah. see. Yeah. So the, you know, one way to do that would be to, if you're using well, with the ATEM mini itself would be difficult with the extreme, you could send back a super source. So you put everybody in a little window and now that's not gonna, you could, you could send the super source back into zoom, but record a program. So, out of those HDMI outputs and out of the USB outputs, you can, I, I don't know about the U, USB output, but I know out of the HDMI outputs, you can send whatever you want out of, out, like I'm sending a multi-view right now back, you know, out of one of the switchers and then I'm sending program out elsewhere. And anyway, so you can, you could, um, uh, that theoretically could, um, you'd be able to send that out as a separate feed and then they just see each other talking. And then they don't need to see the switch that you're doing. They just need to see the talk. And then you can have a program that's recording out. And with an, if you have the ISO extreme, you'll be able to record all the, you know, you record all the tracks separately. You can do the edit later. So th that's another one where you can decide with the ISO extreme, you could literally send everybody back a super source of themselves. You can just record it all to drive and then edit it later if you wanted to. That way, as a host, if you don't have somebody else cutting the show for you, as a host, you're not, the the, the thing that I'll keep on coming back to as a host is that, the more present you can be, the better, you know, so, you know, if someone's not cutting the show for you, my recommendation is not to try to cut a live show if you don't have to, um, while you're trying to talk at the same time, because there's all kinds of things going on in your head then, and it creates lots of commas. And so uh, it'll be a better show if you just, if you just record it w with ISOs and then, and then do it. Now, the trickier part will be how you do that from the, from how many computers you use and everything else. Well, the way we do it is we do a point to point connection with the way we would do what you're talking about is we would do a point to point connection with each person. Yeah. So that's, that's, uh, there's a computer for every person. And the reason we do that is so that we get clean audio from every person and we get clean video from every person and there's no chances of it bouncing around. Now this is the heavy iron version of that. Um, you can also do it in the cloud. That's what we're talking about on, um, 
uh, on Fridays. So, but with in the in the office, that's you, we we would give each person a Mac Mini or something like that to to be part of the um, to be part of that conversation and then have them talk through it. It's funny. There is a little bit more latency when you do it that way than from a regular Zoom. In a real life conversation, it's a little uncomfortable or not as comfortable. In a broadcast, it's actually kind of, kind of nice because it slows it down just a little bit, <laughs> so so that the edits are cleaner, you know, as you as you go through it. So um, anyway, it's a, it's an interesting puzzle. Um, next question, Christian Ortiz of South Florida says, uh, "How do you handle?" new participants that have not learned your structure and rules, and this is for Alex, there will always be a new person that does not know the rules, especially if you're growing. Aside from having someone watch many past episodes, where should we go for info? Just watch. You know, like, <laughs> we had a little interaction before the show. Uh, the biggest thing is, is when you don't know what to do, just follow instructions. Like, I, to, not, I won't belabor everybody, but someone was doing something, I told them not to do it. And then they did it again. Like, after I said not to do it, like, be, to be argumentative, like, entering a community and being that way is a bad idea. <laughs> like, like, you know, like you, when you enter, when I enter any community, I look at what the, I, I don't say anything until I, uh, until I understand how it works. You know, I just, you just kind of mosey on along and you just figure it out. It's when people come in and try to decide that they know better, uh, for that community before they've been there for a little while. Um, it's, it's not a good idea anywhere. Not a good idea here either. So, um, you know, so it's, you know, people just, ha you know, some people are, have, have less skill sets in that area than others so so it's you just have to um but the, the best thing to do there's no there's no the rules are we talk about a lot of them and again when when someone in any community i'll, I'll just generalize this you just follow along for a while you know you know you go into a community and everybody thinks that they know what, how the way that this should work i went to africa thinking that i knew how this was all supposed to work like i'm gonna fix everything you know i have an idea this is 20 years ago and by tw 2005 i was pretty clear i didn't know anything <laughs> Like I didn't know anything about how this worked and, and there was, all, and I, and I was just sucking up all the, uh, learning, you know, and some still learning, you know, so, so, um, uh, so it's, I, I think that in any community people come in and we, we are definitely a different community than most of the internet, you know, which I kind of see as a, mostly a dumpster fire. And so, um, uh, so, it, but, but whether it's an online community or a physical community or, you know, whatever, it's just a matter of keeping your head low for a little while until you figure out how how the, how it all works and then then you can start to do things you know it doesn't mean that you have to follow along forever but it does mean that you should probably see what what's around you before you before you start uh ignoring the person who's running the show <laughs> all right next question uh richard mueller of johannesburg south africa says could a seven a 270 degree led wall act like a partial faraday cage for wi-fi and rather than just block wi-fi transmission cause extra interference due to the wi-fi signals getting trapped and bounced around inside the same way the space large spaces cause large acoustic echoes go ahead stuart Let's just lose the bouncing around inside part first, because that's not how a Faraday cage works. Right. And for everybody, I'll explain the basics. A Faraday cage is, uh, well, actually Faraday sat in a, a large bird cage, put a charge on it and showed that the charge moves to the outside edge so you could sit inside safely. Uh, the same works if you watch the videos of Arc Attack on YouTube, where there's a guy in a chain mail and he's dancing around with the arcs coming off of Tesla coils. The electricity moves through the outer layer of the chains, not the inner layer. Mm. Right? So you need to realize that like in this case, large metal structures, they absorb, they distribute the charge or the, the free electrons off their surface area. They don't bounce it around inside. Mm. And yes, they will cause an attenuation of the Wi-Fi. Go ahead, Richard. I apologize for my bad audio again, but uh, I understood that a partial Faraday cage had a problem in that it didn't create the desired effect and actually created a, like, a sort of refraction effect instead, well, especially with the EMF. What I can say is that, that, that Wi-Fi is very sensitive to metal. <laughs> so, so lots of it, uh, we, almost all transmissions are. And so, um, you know, if I was going to put it inside of a curved LED wall, for instance, I would make sure my AP was in the center of that, you know, um, you know, to, to go back out and go ahead, Peter, and then uh, Richard. Oh, 
two things. One is a, a live example of this is I suffered through this in my own house. My house is actually built rather than stick built. It is aluminum two by fours, if you will. So it's aluminum framing. And guess what? Wi-Fi doesn't do well with aluminum framing at all, mm -hmm. but it, it improves the fire resistance of the house. <laughs> uh, but it I don't know. I think I think your priorities are out of whack there. I mean, I think that you know, it's like, well, it might burn down, but but the Wi-Fi is great. <laughs> but the uh, but the other fact, the other piece I'll say is, I worked for a company for years that all the laboratory locations had copper mesh through the walls and through the glass in the windows because they didn't want anybody listening in. Good, uh, Mickey. Yeah, definitely uh, more affordable LED walls and even LED lights uh, can cause havoc on RF signals and um, uh, RF transmissions and propagation, uh, even not only on Wi-Fi, but all the way down to UHF and even VHF sometimes. Uh, and Michael, I don't know if Michael Fraley could, could talk about this, being that he works on sound for events. Um. I'll go, Michael hasn't raised his hand yet. So yeah. Peter and then and then Richard. So I would I would also point out that kind of what Mickey was saying that they can got to remember there's a copper mesh inside those there's there's wire mesh inside those walls, and Lord knows what the switching circuitry is doing as it's powering those walls right in terms of kicking out signal. Yeah, go ahead, uh, Richard. Uh, so I mean I think the the main thing that we're actually seeing at the moment, and it's before we've introduced any other Wi-Fi into the space yet, is that we are getting um, the camera moves from the edge of the volume into the center, and by the time it's ten meters away from the focus puller, he's lost Wi-Fi control of the camera, and that's without anything in between him and the camera except the fact that the camera has moved to the center of the space, and it just. Gone. And is and and the Wi-Fi the AP is in the center of the space or is it? Well, the camera is the AP. The camera it, it's that Wi-Fi connection to his focus unit, which is and a where is he? Four G connection about ten meters away at the opening of the space. Huh. Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah. Go ahead, um, uh, Stuart, and then Mickey. I'm sorry, okay. Michael. Um, Michael. I oh, sorry, one, one, I skipped Michael. Michael, and then Stuart, and then Mickey. Oh, uh, it's. It it's okay. The only thing I was going to say, uh, in most homes, the wiring that gets put in is not shielded. So it is extremely uh, exposed. And RF is extremely sensitive to uh, interference from everything, from dang near everything. So without using shielded cables, without uh, trying to eliminate those sources as best as you can, you know, you're, you're, you're fighting and losing. Plus how many homes, how many homes are 30 feet from another home, you know, so on and so forth. People driving by, I mean, just the handshakes alone, trying to, uh, make contact with a Wi-Fi unit does, you know, password and all that kind of stuff. No, it can't actually contact, but it's still doing the handshake, I mean, which takes part of, the router's time and and energy if you will and disrupts the flow and often it, i often think about how amazing it is we're pushing signals that we can actually send out and receive and they come back in in a, in a thing without any wires no strings no wires no smoke you know like it's 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 kind of an amazing thing uh, tesla, go ahead, tesla's stewart. proud tesla's yeah. proud yeah uh stewart and then uh, mickey okay uh richard Instead of uh, thinking of the LED wall as a Faraday cage, think of it as a reflector like you'd have on a telescope dish and find the focal point of that reflector. Uh, there's math all over the place you can find. It, and that's where your operator needs to stand to have all the Wi-Fi signal coming back at him to maximize his signal. It'll probably be behind the camera. So the camera's facing the wall behind the camera, but probably inside the wall itself by a, a few meters, depending on how big the wall is. Uh, so maybe, maybe a third back from the camera itself. But the best solution, I would say, is actually moving to a wired connection between the focus pull and the, the rig on the camera. Good. Uh, Mickey and then Richard. 
Yeah, more than any of the physical structure of, say, like all the metal and mat- physical materials in the space, I would blame, as Michael mentioned, the interference coming from the actual panels, the actual uh, RF interference from those. And, you know, like if, if, uh, if I, I jump on set and do my initial scans on set and see uh, crazy amounts of interference, or like if I don't, if I ha- find a, if I have a difficult fi- time finding uh, available space for me to set my my wireless transmitters, um, I immediately look at either affordable LED panels or uh, cables with broken shielding. And Richard, I'm I'm curious why are you using Wi-Fi to control like what what camera are you controlling with Wi-Fi? Uh, I'll answer Stuart and then that kind of one after the other. Um, mm-hmm. So Stuart, I think that I might uh, I'm curious in what we'll test this week is whether that idea works um, basically because you can hear it acoustically. So depending on where sound is transmitted in the stage, you can usually find a perfect acoustic spot for it in 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 relation to it. So I would imagine that, yes, if the camera's in the center, I should be somewhere on the perimeter in terms of the focus puller because acoustically, if you whisper in the center, you can definitely hear it like at certain points in different ways to wherever else you are in the space. So that'll be an interesting test. And then in terms of the camera, so um, most focus controllers are all two point are all either two point four G um, based or eight hundred megahertz based or um, and some of them are channel hoppers and some of them are direct connections. So with the WCU falls for the Ari cameras, which have a built in direct connection and transfer metadata as well as all of the lens mapping and can tell you your depth of field at any particular point in time and things like that, they're also just controlling the motors on the lens. So, got it. And, okay. Um, yeah. All right, go ahead, uh, Michael. So, two things RF Explorer, it's about 150 bucks. Okay. Yeah. And it'll, it, you can walk in the room and you'll see what's going on. And you can focus down on those frequencies that you're looking at. Second, have you tried a ubiquity bullet? Um, so, the ubiquity is. I can't really use an ubiquity with the camera. I can put boosters onto the camera, but I'm worried if I amplify that signal, I'm actually just going to make the problem worse. So, so the camera's got a built-in Wi-Fi aerial and a built-in connection to that um, device. And those things, at best, you can either put a microwave boost on, which would be highly illegal, or you can actually get a special device from URI called an ERM-1, which yeah. is a direct high, high gain booster. I just, but from personal again, experience, from per, a, a ubiquity bullet, I mean, I've taken a tablet hundreds and hundreds of feet all around a theater, gone up and down balconies, you know, elevators, the whole nine yards in a theatrical space, never lost signal. I mean, yeah, they're we, just... We, it's, we, we use ubiquities you know, for it's, our it's, basic it's networking. It's tiny, yeah. man. It's... It, <laughs> Yeah. We use them for our basic networking and data transmission on set and often wireless video as well, um, but like to QTake and iPads and things like that. But again, for the camera, it, it just doesn't integrate. It doesn't um, have that. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's doing its own part. Wi-Fi spot. There are, there are devices yeah. that specifically do, um, mm-hmm. but yeah. I'm just worried that they actually make the problem worse, not better. Yeah. Next question. Moving on, Eddie Scott is up next from Mission Viejo, California. Audio routing issue. TechRise appears in sound control panel on the Mac, but selecting it doesn't send sound to headphones. It stays on the audio port. Strangely, the mute button on the TechRise kills the audio out. The pulse and mic appears to work for input. Any help? Anybody knows. I have to admit that on the Mac... Um, like what I'm listening to right now is actually my built-in output from my Mac, not um, the, uh, I don't use the tech, I don't use the tech rise as outputs. I mean, I'm not using it now as an input, but when I use it, um, I almost always listen to the built-in output from the device. And it's mostly so that if something goes wrong, I can still hear. So I don't use anything because you get into some weird routing like you're having now. Um, but I don't usually use that the tech rise for I have never used the tech rise for for an audio output, John. I'm currently using it and I like it because it gives me a little bit better volume control. 
Okay. Uh, it's got a dial right on the device and it's easier to use when I'm on the show or on zoom than finding the button on the MacBook. I recommended, and I don't know if he did this, that he tries rebooting because sometimes I've had weird audio driver crashes and it could lead to that kind of symptom. I'm not sure how the mute button works. The other thing is to check zoom and see if you're using system audio, if you're using the tech rise or, and if you're using system audio that your system is pointed to the tech rise and not some other device. Yeah. Uh, those are the major things I could think of. Next, next question. Sky from Seattle is here and he says, may I thank and also let the office hours community come to celebrate 350 plus days together at 5 p.m. on YouTube okay, for okay. Mad Marchness. A little bit of a commercial. A little bit of a commercial. Promo. <laughs> <laughs> Embedded promo. That wasn't a question. That's, and it's even, okay, at the end, it even says it's not a question. Yeah, uh, it's not a question. But 5 p.m., we should, we should all go. We should all go and check it out. I know I'll be watching. <laughs> <laughs> so so anyway uh um yeah 5 p.m today uh on um on facebook and youtube so definitely check that out um, there is a link in the question for those of well, you who want to follow it what i yeah what i'd like to do is have folks watch it and then if sky's okay with it we'll discuss it uh tomorrow morning so um to as my, much as you my, want my as you comment want is everybody loves a train wreck so come watch and <laughs> the the <laughs> No, we'll, we'll have we'll have a we'll have a discussion about it. So it's it would be useful to watch today because uh, we'll we'll discuss it tomorrow morning. And and probably that first is thing. Exactly the 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 stone soup experience that we're having. That everybody is bringing mm -hmm. something unique, and every yep. and without this community, this event, a would not have even been conceived. It would have been a slack little neat thing. Yep. But this is a real show, and it is a real show because of this community. And and as I teased earlier yes john is going to be in there uh laura is going to be on camera because they volunteered because alex you participate jj um mm -hmm. uh, so many people yeah. alex my goodness 4d so th the gift of of your what you have to bring is is going to be a fun and delicious meal and yep. it's going to be a please and then we're going to tear it apart tomorrow and well, I think the, the biggest thing the biggest thing is to is to watch it either the recording or live preferably and uh, and then we'll we'll it'd be in, it'll be interesting to see what people think of it from the outside too, like just what it looked like, and 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 we'll discuss you know what could be better and and how to progress. That's forward. exactly that's exactly my ask in the yep. question yeah. of my shameless plug. All right, all right. Next question, uh, Charles Klein here in the panel from New York City. Richard, how is your multi monitor HDR test going? Have you made any decisions? Um, I have my decisions. Um, I'm still going to be testing some other stuff that they send me in the coming weeks. Um, so my primary monitor, my baseline is going to be the DM250, but I'm very excited to actually test that small HD against it again, because that thing is incredibly feature packed. So, and uh, considering the DM250s aren't in production any longer, um, Getting hold of one, getting hold of one proved really difficult. We only just just managed to find one, a secondhand one for sale, still at twelve thousand dollars for the secondhand price, twelve thousand euro at the secondhand price. Wow. So being able to pick up a four K monitor for the same price as that, small HD is a good contender. I think I'm going to test it again extensively this week. Um, yeah, and. Um, the LG CX is definitely proving you put some time into getting it working. Um, right. I haven't quite got it calibrated yet. I think I know you'd another three hours with it, I think, maybe. Um, yeah. So, yeah. Uh, you pay for that price difference. Time money. Time money. Time money. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's, how I, that, that, that's how I put the overtime uh, into production with. So I said, you said, right. They got about the good. It's funny thing. They could have put, bought an extra monitor. Like I, we have had those discussions about when you buy some equipment and especially when you're paying for it, you, uh, you're, you're paying someone to work on it. You're like, you know, you could have bought like two monitors for the amount it took to get that one work. I think they've saved about 18,000 euro going the CX route. So, okay. which is pretty good. Well, it's so better I to end up in, I, it's better I to end up in a technician's for a few pocket. Hours. Yeah. 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 So. Absolutely. That, that sounds good. Next question. Richard Mueller's back from Johannesburg. Uh, what frequency scanners are folks using? Any benefits to the Ikenau over the Y Spy for a production environment? Go ahead, Mickey. 
Yeah. Uh, now knowing what context you're asking this uh, uh, for, uh, Richard, I would, as as Michael Fraley mentioned earlier, RF RF Explorer I have a couple of the three G combos. Uh, that those go up to 2.7 gigahertz, but they have one that I believe goes up to uh, 6 gigahertz now. Um, and they would de- definitely come in handy for any set or any production where there is there is any sort of wireless going on. Wi-Fi, uh, lens control, monitoring, very handy. Richard? Um, I've actually got one. And um, I mean, standardly, it's great, but it's the, the refresh is pretty slow on it. And even if you've got it plugged into a laptop, um, I like, I kind of find the refresh and resolution not so good, especially when you're trying to scan a broader band. So hence the question about jumping to the Wi-Spy, which is a lot of, a lot of the ITs internationally use. And then I've been looking at the Kyle for a long time, but it's an $8,000 package and I'm just not sure if it makes a big enough difference. So I was curious. Go ahead, Mickey. I'm not familiar with these. Do do these only like search within the two point four to five uh, gigahertz range? If so, um, I don't know how helpful it might be to catch spurious. Uh, what do you call this frequencies? Well, I mean, the Y Spy is basically like an upgrade on the RF Explorer. You have to run it with a computer. It's not a standalone device, unfortunately, uh, which is what is nice about the the RF. But the Y Spy definitely gives you much faster readouts. So in terms of tracing something like the echo I'm expecting, things like that, I might get a better result off it. Um, the Akao is like a device you wear around your shoulder on a strap and you walk around with an iPad tethered to it and supposedly generates some very high quality results. But again, it's that. I mean, and there are a lot of other devices. You can buy Wi Fi scanners up to $40,000 a piece. But obviously, that doesn't fit within our sort of structure. Next question. Moving on to David Brady, who has actually got a part two here, and that was the one earlier. Uh, can or rather, will the Extreme ISOs twos USB C ports be able to record to disk on one while serving as a camera on the other, or is the intent to hang multiple drives? I have not tested that. I probably could. Um, I'm almost certain that it'll record and send out at the same time. So it'll send, it'll, it'll record to one and, and, um, and send out of the other. And um, Stuart? Yeah, that's what Grant Petty showed in the demonstration. He had it connected to record ISO feeds to one hard drive and going into a computer on the other USB-C. Mm-hmm. Yep. Um, next question. Maggie Barton Baird of Edmonton, Canada is in with Alex. What microphones do you put in your speaker kits for events? Are there different options you send based on budget? For example, low, medium, and high. So for for what we send out, it's really low and high. Like there's not, I don't find that there's a lot that we can send to speakers that's in the middle. That's been the challenge that we've had. Um, so typically we go with a Pulson uh, over when, when they're available, <laughs> the Pulson or the Pile is kind of the general, oh, we're just going to send something out to folks. When we switch up up gear, um, then we get either the Countryman or the DPA. So the And the ones that we're looking for are the new DPAs that that have the IFB built in. <laughs> so, um, you know, which is just magical. Like, I was just like, it's just all one little cable. Because it, 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 it turns out putting all that stuff on is, a, is trouble for some folks. And so being able to do it all in one time is, is useful. And so um, anyway, so that's, we really go. And then once we go up to that, now you have to deal with an interface. So we typically, so the, our high end kits are generally a USB pre, uh, th- a, a mic, I'm sorry, a mix pre three, two with noise assist and either a DPA or a countryman. Our low end ones are tech rise with, although we've tested these new tech rises because that's a whole problem in itself. Um, we still have enough of the older ones because we bought so many that uh a tech rise with a with a pulse in is the is the low end and we just don't find that everything in between distinguishes itself enough to be worth it like that's the you know like once you have the pulse i'm just surprised the pulse is so inexpensive it's now 25 bucks it was 10 when we started buying them um we just don't hear that much difference between that and until we get to a countryman or until we get to a pulse or a, a, a dpa everything in between as a small wire headset mic. <laughs> That's what we're 
generally sending out. And the reason we send those out is because we, we generally do everything we can to reduce the distance between the mouth, the speaker, and the, and the receiver. And the reason for that is that we don't know what the room is going to be like. So the room is going to be, you know, when the, the room can, uh, if they have a really hard room, you know, with lots of a live or a live, lively room where there's lots of flat surfaces, a lav or a shotgun become very echoey really fast. And we would rather deal with the sibilance that we get with um, the headset mic than we would with the echo that we would get because the sibilance is a little easier to filter than than the echo from the room. Now go ahead, Chris, and then Jeffrey. Alex, can you explain a little bit more about that DPA with the IFB built in? There is a DPA. I can't think of the. I don't know if I have the number off the top of my head, but it is a. It has either two ear or single ear uh ifb built into the wire and is literally attached to the dpa and i don't own one yet i just look at pictures of it because it's 800 and some dollars and, and i and I, I because i already have a bunch of ifb stuff i've i've resisted buying it so far but as i said we're looking at at, at switching over to those in the high-end kits because um they uh it looks so pretty um anyway and, and and we just know that that's been an issue for folks as they put this ifb on and then they have to put this other thing on and Having it all in one place uh, to us seems uh, advantageous. Go ahead, Jeffrey. Yeah, so I actually built a home kit uh, in the last couple of min uh, months here for a client, uh, and what we're not doing the the over the we're not doing uh, microphones outside the actual unit. Yeah, the unit's supposed to be basically set down and record as quick as possible. So we're using a boom microphone. Uh, option and that does bring a lot of room noise like you said mm -hmm. which of course is okay because this is not going to zoom this is being recorded then then uh, post produced so that can be taken out from there the kind one of. thing I wanted to mention <laughs> kind of yeah kind of yeah kind. They're, 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 it, it's it's a give and take but the, the yeah, sound because like... the other thing is he's they've also got a headset on because we're also in zoom monitoring the thing and they're recording from there just in case the audio is better on the zoom mic but the bigger thing is the one other thing you need to worry about when you have a home kit like that is if you have it plugged in because we just had this problem last tuesday uh if it's bad uh, bad power you're gonna you might get a hum from yep. uh from the audio so you want to watch yep. out for that yeah go ahead chris so if you're using those audio implement um in the ear to listen instead of a speaker for zoom you're saying that that new mic the ifb replaces that yeah, no, it's it's a uh, here. I have the forty-five sixty DPA forty-five sixty forty-five sixty. No, yeah, no. Are you sure? Like when I when I type in forty-five sixty, um, I get. Oh yeah, yeah. So the forty-five sixty is one of them. Yeah. So if you look at the if you do a DPA forty-five sixty core. Um, that is a, an example of that. And that would, that's both ears. I think, um, you can do one with single ear as well. And, um, yeah, you can see the single ear there. And so we're looking pretty seriously at that one for the high end kits. Just cause we think it'll be easier because those are usually what we would consider executive kits. Um, next question. TJ Asher of Minneapolis, Minnesota, and here on the panel often for panelists who need to step away. So here's the question. Uh, should we fade to black? Should we put up a still or just leave Zoom and return? Uh, fade to black. It's good. Fade to black. I, we, the still, I, I did the still for a little while, and then it really drives me crazy when people do it now. And so I, that's why I've stopped doing it. It's because when I started doing it, everyone started doing it, and then it I don't know whether they're there or not. <laughs> so And so it, I'd rather just them know, know that they're not there. Go ahead, Stuart. TJ, thank you for asking because I need cookies and I've got a life yeah. to change. There you go. All right, next question. Eddie Scott of Mission Viejo, California says, now that my headphones are working, thank you, Mr. Pooit, would you replay Mickey's audio panning demo, please? We'll do it if we have a little more time. I'm gonna. I want to actually give the educators a chance to come in and actually start on time. I think we keep on starting late for them. Um, but Mickey did an incredible um, stereo pan, and I, I don't think I don't want to set. I don't want to take up that much time right now to do it. But um, I don't have it wired up either. Oh, okay. Well, there, there you go. So Mickey did a uh, he did a Atmos pan uh, over Zoom uh, in the pre pre show. It was amazing <laughs> like it was amazing it was atmos ish 
Uh, uh, just a cheat in there. <laughs> it used the Atmos tools, but it, but the fact that it came out and you could actually, it actually sounded like he was moving above us and around us and everything else just through Zoom. It was kind of fascinating. All right. If you're an educator, please raise your hand. Um, we're going to bring you in and do mic checks real quick. So um, again, if you are an educator, go ahead and raise your hand and we'll bring you in. I'm going to step away for just a minute. And uh, Did I and hear we we're doing our Arduino thing at two at Two o'clock central noon 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 Pacific. Noon, noon Pacific. We're gonna have just a brainstorm. Yep. Okay. Yep. Hey, All Alex. Right. If we can't yep. fade to black, what do you prefer then? Uh, you you can just pause your video at that point. Yeah, All just right. just hit. I'm pause. trying to look for a back black image. Just all the black JPEG that I could put up there instead. But no, it's fine. Just pause. Just pause your image if you don't have a if you don't have a switcher. Copy. Yep. All right. Go ahead and raise your hand again. We'll give everybody a couple more minutes, and uh, we'll start with some mic checks. I'll be back at uh, in about eight minutes. Mickey, if you want, drop us back to um, attendee and I'll make space for the educators to have more space on the panel. I'll do that. Do that. Me as well, uh, please. All and right. for all the educators out there, same, enjoy same the next hour. Thank you. I believe it's the actually the next two hours. You, who was the other person that to... needed to drop back? Richard and who else? Raise your hand if you Chris want to G. drop back. Okay. Okay, I'll do those. All right. Um, Ciao. All. Yeah. Thanks for the morning. Okay, let's uh, let's start off the chuckle while we're waiting for others to to stream in. Um, Roscoe, remind me. I don't think we did a check with you earlier, did we? We did not. I'm I am new to the panel, and I'm a little hot, so I'm going to come down here a little bit. But uh, I do have a question because I don't think we want a black checkered screen, do we? If people are just fading to black during the show. Oh, I need to come down even more. Yeah, this is what happens when you put in, oh, went down too far and we'll come back up there and keep talking and see if it comes back up. It came back up to 26, so I'll push it a little more and it's coming back up to 24. Yeah, uh, maybe just a, a DB down. You got it, sir. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much, Chris. And then Alan. Good morning from Tempe, Arizona. This is Chris Clark. Happy to be here on a beautiful morning. Um, how's my numbers Can looking? Can you bump, bump up a two or three dB, Chris? Chris? Sure. Let's try that again. Are we closer to uh, fine where we want to be? And talking, talking through my hat. Um, number doesn't look right to me, but... Um, it's about the yeah, sound, could, could right? You give us, uh, could you give us continuous speech? Because there's yes. a lot of gaps in yeah. your speaking. Yeah, okay, okay. Uh, I would like to speak continuously without a break using circular breathing, which is a very tricky. <laughs> okay. another, also, another don't, put your, don't put your hand, don't put oh. your hand next to your mm. microphone. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Another, another two or three dB up, Chris. Thank you. All right, let's move on to, uh, looks like Alan isn't up yet. Uh, Steve Cotton, how's it going? It's going well here in the Bay Area, in uh, San Francisco Bay Area. And I'll be talking about this level. Looks like I'm just about at about minus 24 yeah, I think you're in, about there. in that range. Okay, yes, great, sir. thanks. Do you have an open, you speaker, have an open there? speaker there? I do, so, I'll turn it off, sorry. Yes, please. Turn off original sound, right? Yeah. Uh, no, turn off, the, uh, turn off the speaker. Turn off the speaker. Oh, yeah. And uh, switch switch your original sound back. All right, Alan may have been a mistake on the uh, on this the bringing people in because TJ and I were both doing it at the same. time. Copy. All right, uh, let's uh, send Alan back to attendee, and uh, looks like we have Tony and uh, uh, Nick Nick Jushishin back in. Alan, if uh, that was a mistake and, and you want to be in the panel, raise your hand again. Hey, Nick. Hey, how's it going? How's uh, mic levels? Is this uh, are we doing a mic check here? Seems like I'm yes, maybe sir. a little bit low. Yeah. Um. Actually, do you mind? Uh, what's your audio chain at the moment? All right. So I have that uh, AKG four one four. I'm going into a Behringer mixer. 
then unfortunately that runs into the ATEM Mini, which then runs through Potato, which then delivers the uh, sound to you. Okay. Can you check on your either the the mixer or on the ATEM if you have other channels uh, that might be up that aren't actually sending signal? We're just getting a lot of uh, noise floor. Uh, okay, well, that is probably the laundry room around. No, it, it sounds like have, it's, it's, it's potato, just the noise. You have the, on the potato, you have that three-band EQ. Maybe turn down the top end of the, the three-band EQ just a little bit. No. Uh, there's no EQ. Um, there are no gates. Uh, just double-checking on the ATEM. Yeah, the ATEM is just running sound clean. Yeah, are, are 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 there any channels, any faders that may be up? Uh oh, let me check that. Although you did do something earlier that cleaned it up a little bit. All right. I um yeah, I I killed that Intelli pan on the voice meter. Um so this is there's nothing else turned oh let me just double check there's no return yeah i think at the moment you're in you're in decent shape uh just might want to do okay. a quick recheck on level wise yeah there's um on the all right checking one two levels one two and this isn't, uh, it's not terrible, I suppose. I could be closer or I could be louder with my voice. Um, seems like I'm yeah, a little if low, you, if huh? you can bring, if you can bring the mic uh, a little closer, then you should be right there in terms of level as well. All right. Uh, it's the, a little bit of a precarious. Uh, yeah, about this, is this any better? Checking one, two. Wow, I've never got, uh, this is a luxury having this long of a sound check. <laughs> Yeah, uh, maybe yeah, just a dB a dB or two bump up, uh, Nick. You should be right. you should be in good shape. All right, uh, John, remind me, did we, did we do a check with you earlier? Thanks, Nick. John Ellison. Um, I I did a slight change. How am I doing now? I think I'm a little hot, right? So go down, down. This is a test. I'm hitting the 24, 27, 28, 29. Um, maybe I need to go back clear? up one. Now is the time yeah. for all good men to come to the aid of their country. This is a test of the emergency broadcasting system. This yeah, is just that's a good a check. Test. Right, uh, Tony, how's it going? Hello, office hours. Good morning, good day, good afternoon, good evening. Greetings from Metropolitan Atlanta. Yeah, on your ATEM, Tony, could you give us two clicks down on your level there, on the ATEM? That's two clicks down. It is a beautiful sunny day here in Atlanta. Uh, don't seem to hear a change there, Tony. Um, was it? Can you double check that we're on the the proper channel that the microphone is going through? And also check and zoom that you have automatically adjust microphone volume unchecked. And interesting to not uh, seem to be seeing uh, Emily and uh, and the um, what do you call this? The the rest of the Aaron the, Emily and Aaron are clubhouse ladies. Oh, they're. They're too cool for, for office hours now. Maybe we started mic checks too early. Uh-oh. We're uh, on I time. usually I usually see them uh in in the attendees like thirty minutes before. Twenty, thirty minutes before. They yeah. They don't actually have a live they, they should be here by now. It could be that uh the East went into daylight savings time and folks are coming late to church on the first Saturday after daylight savings time. You want to quickly finish your check, Tony? How's it going? Okay, Mickey, it seems as if I am coming through the ATEM Mini for my microphone. And that was two clicks down. Um, yeah. 
Can you double check on the actual ATEM software that things are moving? Sure. Testing one, two, three, one, two, three. I am looking into the multi viewer and the microphone is going up. It is in the yellow, almost to the red. Yeah. On your on your level, can you try another click down? That is one click down. Yeah, I think um, I, I I'm hearing a change now. You should be you should be good the level wise. Thank you. Thank you, Mickey. Hey, Mickey, you pinged me and said that I was having some issues. Is everything straightened up, or are we still weird? Uh, it sounds uh, better than earlier. Earlier, it sounded more distant and roomy. Hmm. Um, Interesting. Okay. This only during the first uh, question or two in the show. Yeah. Sometimes I think feeding a microphone from my ISP into Zoom is a black art. I, it looks like the meter's down a little bit on things. So let me bring it up Mickey, a little I'm, bit, see if that's pretty close. Am I getting better to normal because you pinged me a couple of times? Yeah, you're you're still coming in pretty low. And Bill, I think you're okay level-wise. I mean, you tend to speak louder when you're I well, do. reading out the, the questions. Yes. You've got I, I move a little into hiss, announcer Mickey. space. Yeah. You got a Show bit level. of hiss, You got a bit of hiss, Mickey. Yeah, that is my MacBook Pro fan yet again. Uh, uh, I moved the microphone closer. Does that help out at all? Uh, maybe just a little bit? Uh, maybe yeah. Maybe just another nudge. Yeah, another DB up. It was interesting. My wife and I were talking about it yesterday. You know, for so many years, I did so many spots. And in most of those cases, when I was working in recording studios, if we were working particularly against a music backing track, the engineer would send it into the can. So you would read against music and that would determine pace and tonality and everything. Um, more these days, people are asking me to cut just clear VOs. And it's interesting to me how much it changes the performance when you are or are not working against a track. Almost everything about how I perform changes based on whether I'm listening to content and talking against it or just listening to myself. Yeah. Make so I'm going to do a turned off original sound. Um, and I am checking my level. Uh, my audio chain is an AKG 414 going into a sound device of 744T. And that is going into, um, what is this? Uh, an Avid uh, HD Omni interface. And it looks like I need to go up a bit more. Checking, checking. Hey, hey, hey. Uh, how's that for you guys? Cool. Thank you. We get a chance to thumbs up for Mickey. That's awesome. I was going to say the same goes for narrative film. Many editors like to have a track to cut to for pacing. And it's odd because, you know, they'll put temp music in and you'll work against that and then they'll replace it with final music and it's going, because mm. I used well, to they... do it. one little thing. Yeah, we're off topic here. You heard that about, that, that's the, not the anecdote, but that's the, the story I heard about um, the Space Odyssey was they hired a musician to create original music, but they had scored the whole thing underneath the, some symphonic piece. And they ended up with going with the symphonic piece. I mean, the musician got paid, but he didn't get his music underneath the amazing movie. I've ended up with a lot of voiceovers that way. Because <laughs> it's when we're when we're working on the production, it, the easiest thing for me to do is just sit down and do it. Like, oh, let me just do a scratch track real quick. And I'm I literally usually I don't spend much time on it. I just go, I'm gonna throw something together. And then we then we send them samples of other people doing it over and over and over again. But they've watched it my my version for two weeks and and they have a hard time hearing somebody else's voice. And so unfortunately, and that's video, how Edna Mode was voiced by Brad Bird. Well, no. <laughs> Sorry. 
<laughs> Chris Clark would recommend. So, I, have, I, have, I, have, I have one character that I used to use, Chris, that was, now I never said that, now you would probably understand who I'm talking about. And uh, we, used to, uh, we used to have a lot of fun with that, that voice. Uh, go ahead, Nicholas. Uh, I was just going to say that, uh, that that Nicholas, I'll have to change that. Yes, um, that uh, Brad Bird ended up voicing Edna Mode because they could never find someone who could voice her like he was always voicing her at the table. I was surprised at how many uh, voices that Ian and I did. They ended up just kind of reproducing. They didn't use us, but they for the um, in the Senate rotunda, they had, you know, in episode one. There was two of us that in the scratch tracks did 20 some voices. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know you, you do all these things. It's fun. It's a good time. Anyway, uh, we are back to education. Um, lots of stuff has happened, I think, this week. And it's a very small crew today, so a very intimate uh, fireside chat um, to uh, as, as we go through it. And uh, so if you have questions about education now, remember, Resolve is coming up at 10. So we've got a couple hours of education. Uh, if we... We have been, you know, a little shorter on our Q&A and our, and our discussion. So if we run a little short, we'll give everybody a little bit of a break before the Resolve uh, training. Um, but, uh, but, the, um, but if you have questions or if you have comments or you know, things, things that we want to mull over, um, then uh, go ahead and throw them in. Has anyone noticed anything new to this week? Anything new from the, from the trenches, so to speak? Yeah, go ahead, Chris. Well, this week was the, the week when... Um, the majority of schools in Arizona reopened for face-to-face -face, uh, instruction. And uh, so it's the end of that first week of uh, return to school. There was still an option for students and their parents to choose to keep, um, keep in touch virtually, but it was, there was a, a kind of a push or a, a, a strong positive invitation to to bring kids back to school, and uh, and it worked pretty well. I we have a, a high school granddaughter who lives with us, and so we we have a case study to report. And she was quite happy with the return to school, seeing friends, uh, being able to work on in course. She's in a course that's called tech theater, uh, probably. Uh, Roscoe's familiar with what that <laughs> curriculum looks like. And it, it involves hammering nails and striking sets and, and painting things and, and doing things that uh, she's been deprived of for pretty much a year. So, so she was thrilled to get back to that. Um, and I, I developed a, this is a, a called a half-baked theory. Um, the question is, wh why did we uh, adults feel so good about uh, kids going back to school? Because they're great kids and she did well with uh, being in a room, locked in a room for the last year. <laughs> um, she was great. We just locked her in the room. That here, yeah, yeah it, it was great. It was very quiet. Slid, slid um, the food under the, under, the, under the crack of the door. But we, exactly. But my, uh, my theory is that what we missed and and uh, and were refreshed by this week was that uh, people are storytellers and when we send young people out into the world whether it's to school or to a job or off to college or or the, the army or whatever um, we expect to get stories back whether it's at the end of the day how was your day dear um, or call your mother, write to your mother. Um, these are stories that, um, that we treasure, but we also use as a kind of currency. We talk about our kids, we talk about our grandkids. Um, and, and we adults have been deprived of those stories or at least those opportunities to gather stories and to uh, edit them so that we become the heroes of those stories. And and we're proud of the accomplishments of our kids or outraged mm -hmm. at the indignities that they suffered or whatever whatever this, the uh, category of story is. So, so I think there's something fundamental about human society that, um, 
that looks for stories that needs a pretty much continuous input of stories in order to have a voice mm -hmm. in the conversation with other with other members of the clan or uh, friends and strangers. Anyway. I think that I felt like a lot of people were getting riled up by just feeling like, oh, they're missing out or they're going to lose a year or they're going to lose three years. And as someone who's had an awful lot of um, derailments in their life, uh, you can afford to lose a year. Like, 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 it's, you know, like that's the whole thing. It's like, it's like if you lose a year, two years, three years, you know, it doesn't mean that your life is going to turn out that much different. Um, and, you know, so, I mean, I think that that's the, I mean, if you decide it will, I mean, so much of life is is what you decided was going to make a difference as opposed to what actually made a difference. Um, In higher ed, we call that lost year a sabbatical. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's a treasure. Exactly. <laughs> I I still think that it, I think kids should go do, go, I, 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 I'm, I think after high school, I mean, during high school to some degree, but after high school, they should definitely spend two years in the industry that they think that they want to go into. I think that would save them a lot of trouble if they went in and just, you know, I know so many people who like decided they're going to be a lawyer, decide they're going to be an economist, decide they're going to do whatever. And they, they got these great degrees and then they did it for a year or two and decided I'm never going to do this again. And they could have figured that out earlier. You know, like my, my wife, you know, has a, uh, you know, she, she graduated. I don't know what, the, what those out magnum cum laude, what, whatever out of Berkeley and like the real high end, whatever that, that thing. And, uh, uh, out of Berkeley in, um, as, um, an, and she, she got a job at Franklin Templeton as an analyst, like for these huge things and didn't take her very long to decide she didn't want to do that. <laughs> and so then she wanted to be an artist. And so she, so, um, anyway, so, so I think that, uh, um, it would help students a lot to do more real world stuff. Um, anyway, yeah, go ahead, John. I, uh, I got a degree in anthropology but before getting a teacher certificate. And then I somehow ended up in IT doing cybersecurity. <laughs> I have to really agree with what you said there. The mm -hmm. uh, And this week I've been conducting a bunch of interviews, which is why I've been missing from the panel in the mornings. Uh, and I've noticed something that a lot of people have lots of these educational stuff, but they're not passionate about what they're doing. And I would much rather have someone passionate about what they're doing and interested in what they're doing than someone with a bunch of degrees. Yeah. I, and I think that's the challenge. And I, I do think that the, the challenge for education is figuring out ways to make most of what we learn something you're passionate about. Um, I think that right now we learned to nug through it. You know, I think a lot of education is proving that you could nug through um, a lot of stuff. Uh, Sky? I'm really exploring the word survival because if we work backwards from the need of what is it going to take to survive and then these choices of passion in some, con or some circumstances are a luxury. And so that uh, education is a, a, a commerce and that gets things confused from discovering the inner who who I am, why I'm here on this planet, mm -hmm. what what gifts do I have that I can bring, and that is also a luxury, oftentimes. And so to be able to be comfortable in your own skin is is I think what we're hearing now, the freedoms in in today's society, in today's world, in that yes, there are very poor fiscally individuals in the world. At the same time. I don't know what the death rate is compared to what it used to be. So well, uh, there's I, I think that the technology th where that's come in. I, I mean, I, I definitely think that uh, like my, my parents would just want me to be passionate. So my, anything that was around the thing that I was passionate about and my mom didn't make a lot of decisions about it. <laughs> like my mom would just go, if, if you're willing to read it, I'll buy it for you. Like that was mostly the, like, that was like, we go into a store and I'd hand her like soldier of fortune and she'd be like, sure. You know, like, if you're going to read, if you're going to read here, you can read that. And I was like, okay. And so, um, uh, so the, uh, so I think that, you know, we learned to be passionate just because, you know, that was part of it. I think there's a question coming up, but, but I think that figuring that out and also just getting, I don't know, I feel like still getting stuff out of the way is important. Uh, go ahead, Nick. Yeah, I totally agree. Um, and I ran the animation program at my university for a number of years. And um, 
I had one really top student. I mean, she was president of the SIGGRAPH group and fantastic work all the way through. And she was part of a whole group of students that I took to in a Los Angeles SIGGRAPH conference. And the one, one day after the conference, I just drove them around to different studios and, and, you know, met alumni, met friends. It's like, hey, this is what the studio is like. This is, you know, make start networking, talk to people. And we finished the tour and we're in the parking lot and she's about to leave and she just turns around like, and just like eyes really big, like, I don't want to do this. Like now that I've seen it, I don't want to do this. What do I do now? Right. <laughs> and, um, you know, it definitely speaks to the importance of, you know, a broad education, you know, coming out of your educational process with a number of avenues available to you. She ultimately went on to continue and, and finish a master's degree, and she she teaches animation at a at a school in uh, in Pennsylvania now. But um, so, you know, proud digital media teaching papa, I guess. But um, it, it's I've seen quite a few. I mean, particularly in the university system, we're taking in students out of high school that are absolutely dead set on pursuing a passion that they've developed really as kids, right? They, they've, they've watched animation, they've watched, they've played video games, you know, there's this industry that they know is out there that, ah, oh, my whole life has been about this. This is what I want to do. And, and they'll even do the work of studying and practicing and then discover that oh, this isn't really what I wanted to do. Well, so it's and, definitely good to have that broad base to work with. Yeah, and for me it was hard because I did. I was pretty clear early on. I mean, the only I started writing computer graphics programs when I was eleven. <laughs> you know, so, so I was like, I just want to make pictures, and I just was pounding it out of an Apple IIe, you know, like and 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 typing stuff in and getting pictures out the other end and and everything else. And so, but I didn't get any of it from school. I got it from the fact that I, I had a computer, you know, and and uh, and and I look at the opportunities right now is that there's. You can learn anything at almost any age if we just created some structure around it. Go ahead, Nick, and then John. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, I mean, my likewise, my first computer graphics work was on a Commodore 64, right. you know, Apple IIe era, um, you know, programming sprites and machine language and all this kind of thing. And mm -hmm. that moment as a kid was the moment where forever the idea of art, computers, programming, gaming – entertainment and work like it was a value of other you know friends of mine um all of those things became converged and and that's it from then on and my career out of my my first career out of bachelor's degree was not what i wanted i knew it wasn't what i wanted and i kept an eye on that computer graphics and ended up pursuing it um i had the same encounter honestly with my son one time you know i could hear him 10 30 at night he's talking with his friends on an on a video game or something it's like you know kid's 12 years old he needs to be going to bed Op throw open his door come in like i'm gonna you know bring down the hammer and i see that on his screen are like all of these linux shell windows and he is programming in minecraft and he's creating logic systems for his buddies because they don't understand how to do all of that with minecraft and he turns around and he's like <gasps> like what, what's going and i was like you just keep doing what you're doing and just hold the <laughs> door closed good. really slowly. Be you. That was the <laughs> Let me stay out of the way oh, there. Bye-bye. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. You just keep doing that. Yeah, John. Well, that was always the challenge uh, when we were teaching at Chico. Is at the university, we required general ed, which is outside the major. And within our communications major, even the people who are studying broadcasting who wanted to do only courses in the studio, um, two thirds of them were outside of that. And there's always this tension of why are you making us do all this other stuff that we don't want to do? And it's sort of, well, someday this will be helpful. And for me, my undergraduate degree was in radio, television, film. And then when I got to visit every radio and television station, North and South Carolina said, I don't want to work in the broadcast industry. I'm not into sales. And the, uh, most of the local production was just uh, like styrofoam to hold the commercials apart. Well, I the, I think the challenge is, is that I will argue that people aren't ready to learn something until they want to learn it. You know, like it's, that's the thing that, and, and you can, you can force them to do it by just, you know, basically it's like a, it's like making, um, what was it? Faux gras. 
Foie gras education is what most of education is. We're just going to open your mouth and we're just going to shove it down your throat. And so, so the thing is, is that, is that, you know, like I, there was a, where I was teaching um, visual effects, I was at I, ILM and, uh, but in the evenings I was teaching at San Francisco State and um, in the extended program, because I'm not allowed to teach it at a regular San Francisco State because I don't have a degree, but I can teach at the extended program. Anyway, so there was somebody before me that would talk about the basics of fundament, the fundamentals of visual effects, I think was the class that I took over. And I was like, yeah, we're not going to do any of this. <laughs> Let's just do a visual effects sequence. And so I said, we're going to have this little thing and it flies down the hallway and it flies back and it flies around this person and it lands and everything else. And the general response was, is that they learned more about visual effects than they had learned in any other class ever because we didn't bother to deal with, I didn't, literally, I just said, let's just go do it. And then I would sew in theory, you know, while they were working on it, like when they couldn't figure something out, I would, I would go out and say, well, this is what this looks like, but it was all contextual to what they're doing. And when they did it, we would like show things that were related to that shot from Armageddon, from Star Wars, from let, let me show you a couple of things that are like what you're about to do or what you just did and where that goes from there. And they were just completely like, it was like this little magical time. We all just kind of worked on stuff and they had a great time doing it. And I think that, um, I think that there was something there. That's all <laughs> like, like, like it was just like, you know, it was like exploring it and you picked it up as you needed it. But, but I think that a lot of times we try to, um, I think a lot of education we have to, that I think we're challenged by is the fact that most of it is kind of force fed, you know? And, and I think that it's, um, uh, it's really be hard to get that image out of my head now, you know. Faux gras education. I know. I, yeah. I, I just it, came up with it. It literally just came out of my mouth. I'm going to use that all the time. It, well, you it's, know, like, like, it's not great for right the geese, but sure tastes good. But, you know. Yeah, it's, it, the liver tastes good, but I don't think the duck, duck enjoys it at all. Right um, uh, John saying, you know, styrofoam radio. The yeah, stuff yeah, yeah. that keeps the commercials apart. Both of those yeah. back to back. So, yeah, yeah, it, I'm yeah. sorry. Did you say Sky? Yeah. I no, I did. didn't. I didn't. Uh, uh, we'll start answering some of the questions. I think we we're just kind of meandering around because there wasn't a lot of questions. Go ahead. Next, next question. Okay. The first one we're dealing with today is Skies, and it's from Seattle. For the sages in the room, what are some of this week's wins and RFIs, room for improvements? Which we've kind of been riffing so, on. So we had we we've talked about it a little bit during the week, but since the educators are here, I just want to say that a win that came right after edu the education hour was the Raspberry Pi build. Um, I would go back if you haven't seen it and you're into education and you're watching this or whatever, you should go back and look what happened there. That was, that was profound. Like that was like, a, you know, every once in a while you go through this thing in, in, in our, in our little exploration in office hours and you're like, Ooh, something just happened. You know, like, like, like that, you know, and you know, to back up a little bit, there it is. Tony built one, Tony built a raspberry Pi. I built a raspberry Pi. It's right, right here. Um, and, uh, we about, you know, there's about 30 of us on camera, 15 or 20 had multi-camera. So we're able to show that what they were working on. Um, and about a hundred people were watching us do this thing. I don't know how many of them were taking it on at the same time or not, but there was something about us just working through this problem together. And it, it's very different than what we do here because it's like question, 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 discussion, discussion, discussion. There was something about doing it and then just trading notes because what was happening was someone would say, oh, I have, I don't know why this is happening. Someone, oh, I know what that is. And it wasn't just Jonas who was the developer and helping us through it. It was um, all of us helping each other. So in addition to the fact that we all learned faster and, and in some ways answered questions that Jonas may not have had the answer to because someone who knows it too well can't figure out how to back back up again to tell you what that was. Someone who just discovered it can actually say, oh, that's that, you know, because Jonas would never think of doing that because that's stupid. <laughs> you know, so, but there was like four or five of us that did the same stupid thing, including me. And so, um, so the, the, the interesting thing was, is that it was like this, this groupy, this group, we're going to use it a lot. Like, I'm just letting you know, like, this is like, and the fact that we did it globally, but what we saw was something that you cannot do in the physical world. You could not put 130 people in the in a space, have everyone listen to the conversation at at um, at inside inside the room voices. <laughs> you know, like you know, uh, have us all just be able to sit there and discuss and explore and see what everybody else is doing and learn from everybody else that's that's working on it. And it was just a, I thought it was, I don't know if everyone maybe I'm over over stating it but I, I thought from an educational perspective it was really really interesting go ahead roscoe 
Yeah, I, 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 maybe John had the same feeling, and Tony, you, uh, you know, putting us back in student mode. We're not the experts in the room. We're not. No one's looking to us for the answers. That was the best part. Is you know, yeah. getting back and reminding yourself that, you know, and then just the basic. The the moment for me was when someone said, "Did you read the manual?" Yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, and 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 I think that the uh, it's it's it was rough in its in its little early stage, but but I think that um, mixing it like we're we're not getting all of the pieces in in or in order yet, but they're coming together. So mixing that kind of exploration space with the Q and A that we see around, let's say resolve or, or other things with watching videos, discord, you know, all those things, as far as being able to explore those things, I think is an, is an interesting, it's an interesting solution. Go ahead, Nick. And then John. I, uh, I missed the, the live presentation, but I did watch it after the fact on YouTube. Um, I don't know what the plans are for the Raspberry Pi, but I was just going to throw in a suggestion that uh, the idea of being able to develop a status board or dashboard using Raspberry Pi, I, I just feel like that would be so useful. Like I could use that in my home with a spare screen or right. in a production, being able to monitor bandwidth. You know, just the idea of creating a framework with a Raspberry Pi on a network that can just monitor things and, and put up gauges. Yep. That would be really cool. Anyway. Yeah. I mean, I think that we're going to keep playing with it. Um, Arduino will be another thing that we're working on, but I think that beyond a physical thing, you know, I I'm looking at, I'm talking to some folks about the summer about Swift, you know, <laughs> like, like, you know, like what, it, you know, it, it could be, we're all going to learn how to program, you know, or we're all going to learn how to um, you know, and, and they can all happen in parallel. It doesn't mean like we could do Arduino, but at the same time, the two hours after that is Swift that, you know, there's, there's, um, but we're all going to learn how, like, I think that we're going to do a two hour one with the, uh, there was a request to do one with the ATEM switcher. I mean, I think people are now starting to request, like there's a new request in the second hours, which we almost have to, I think we're gonna have to create another channel called labs. Like what do people request? What are their ideas about doing for a lab? Um, because I think that that's, Interesting, yeah, John. And we could do this with Unreal too, by the way. Do the same. Well, that's approach. the plan. Well, you and I discussed yeah. it a little bit. Yeah. So, like Nick's thing is going to transform. Like Unreal is going to be a is going to be the next generation of this in April, where Nick's got a couple videos that we can watch. There's going to be Q and A, and then we're all just going to work on it, you know, for like an hour. You know, just just kind of plod through what Nick had outlined for us, and I think that it's a piece that's been missing in what we're doing um, that that we did have from school. Uh, go ahead, John. I think the sort of magic that happened with this and it happened to you and also happened to me is that for a moment, I thought, oh, I'll just step back. Originally, when Guy and I mm -hmm. talked about it, I was going to be the overhead camera. And then I realized that I was redundant. Yeah. Uh, and so all, I said, I'll just, we all had know. overhead cameras. <laughs> yeah. But so I said, I, you know, I did this, but I won't put it together because I, you know, and I got sucked in. I said, no, I can't stop. And the same thing here, you were going to watch yeah. and you said, I was going to well, stop. I was going to do it. And then I saw how many multi cameras there were. And I was like, I got to watch this. Like, this is going to be amazing. And I got to watch it. And then I was like, no, I got to do it. I have all the stuff here. And they'll be never, they'll never be. Here's the funny thing is I realized there will never, ever, ever be a time like this moment to build this Raspberry Pi. Like, like that, that, I, that I have a whole bunch of people that can answer questions that it's okay to fail, that I have the developer that we're all talking about it. Like that's, it, it created urgency that, that didn't, um, hadn't occurred for me before. Yeah. Uh, John. So Alex, <clears throat> you, you mentioned that it would be hard to duplicate what we did in, in person. And I've been through hundreds of labs, uh, for my degree, and you're there with your lab partner and you're kind of in your own world. Courtney and I were on the same track. We had already have our Raspberry Pis already done. And so we that put us on a different branch. And for me to look over his shoulder on his camera where he was at was super, super helpful. That got me to the finish line. Well, and it did. And I, and I think that, that there is a, all of us do it. I mean, you guys did it together and then all of us doing it um together gives you puts you over the shoulder of a whole bunch of people's there was a there was a point where i went oh i can't talk to it oh i didn't put the e i didn't hook the ethernet from the from the switcher in and then john was like i can't talk to it i said oh just put <laughs> you gotta put the ethernet in the switcher because i'd done that five minutes before and so and again it was like this this kind of uh bonfire of learning 
You know, like it was just like this whole, like a whole bunch of people and we're all doing it. All, and it was all over the world. And, you know, I, I very, my mind immediately went to, you know, a thousand people, <laughs> you know, in breakout rooms, like, you know, you could have breakout rooms. One of the, we would talk, we were brainstorming about, you could have this huge room, but you could also have, you could theoretically have every step of the, of the, of the process in a breakout room. You know, so let's say there's 20 steps, there's 20 breakout rooms. You go into that breakout room and work on it. And there's one person that can answer your questions. There's a bunch of other people that are working on it. When you get that step done and say, good job, go to the next room, you know, like, and, and, and you could just like plunk to the next room with a different expert. That's going to be there. That isn't there to tell you how to do it. You're there, but you, there's like 400 other people or 200 other people in that room that are trying to figure that step out together. Um, yeah, go ahead, Emily. I was going to say, we do that, um, or we're trying to do that in education where um, PD is more ed camp based, meaning if you're on step 13 and you want to go into 14, you just leave the room and go to a different area of the PD and learn from that point. So you're differentiating as well by providing those multiple breakout rooms and abilities right. for people to join in where they, they think they fit, or if they need to go back a step or go forward two steps. Right. And there's been this discussion internally about whether that makes sense to do it room to room or whether it makes sense to stay all in the same room because you're hearing about, like Roscoe was talking about earlier, you hear someone else doing something three steps ahead that was somewhere in the back of your head while you're working and you immediately get through that, that step because you were listening to the next discussion while you're working on what you're working on. Go ahead, Chris, and then Tony. And you're not just stuck with one lab partner who right. may or may not be... Uh, a supportive person for you at this particular step. You've got a hundred or a thousand potential. I mean, that's the whole thing. You're right. I mean, that's that, that, that is the thing was that we, we had 20 other lab partners that we were working with that, um, made it really, I think just go really fast and slow, you know, like it was, it was, but, but we learned a lot, uh, Tony. Yes. I, I think it was important that the, um, you know, what Chris was saying about the, the lab partners is extremely important because um, I was kind of bringing up the rear, but I had at least six or seven different people at various times telling me what to do to get to the next step. And, and I think that um, I, you know, because I had a lot of questions and this was something that was completely out of my wheelhouse is, you know, I, Raspberry Pi was an extremely foreign thing. I, you know, I've heard, of, I had heard people heard of them, but it was just not something that I ever tried to do. Yeah. And because there were so many different people helping me come along with it, um, I felt comfortable enough when the class had gone way beyond where I was that I would ask a question and then the group would pull me up with them. And so that's a different kind of educational experience, I think. And it was, um, it was refreshing and it, it, it kind of uh, allowed me to not just stop with what was going on on Saturday from the standpoint that now I'm asking questions that are kind of mushrooming from that to help me with my other things. So like right now, this week, the big thing for me is I need to connect this, this Raspberry Pi to the ethernet. And so now I'm learning about um, switchers, different kinds of switchers, power over, over E uh, switchers. And, and so that wasn't even a conversation that I would have had a month ago about all of the different kinds of switchers that you can utilize to, um, to make things work right. um, with your system. So it, it, it's, it's, it's exciting. And at the same time, it's like, this helps you build on other systems, all other, other chains that you're dealing with. So I, yep. I just wanted to say again, thank you so much yeah. for the group um, for just, you know, opening this particular um, outlet for me.
So I want to say thank you again. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and thanks to John and Guy who are, you know, coming up with it. I want to make sure that, uh, you know, I, I wish I had thought of it, but I didn't. Um, anyway, so the, uh, uh, the, um, I think that the other thing is you look at a lot of, I, even as a kid, I, I don't like things that feel contrived. You know, I know you never think that I'd be the, the anti-contrived person, but I, I, and so as a kid, like people do t team building things, even as a kid, like in school and I'd be just like, yeah, I'm not interested. Like, I'm not, you know, like, let's just get back to what we were doing. And, um, so I think that this is a really authentic way to team build because as a group, you're, it, there's a vulnerability of saying, I don't know how to do this. Everybody's saying, I don't know how to do this. I don't know how to do this. I don't know how to do this. And everyone else is helping them. And I think as a team building thing, it's, it's as important as education. It's, it's, a, it's an interesting way to, to build um, community. Uh, go ahead, Bill, real quick, and then we'll move on. Well, I just wanted to say, I think part of that is the ethos that Alex has established for office hours, because one thing is really unusual about this place. You do not gain status on the panel, really, by how much you know. You gain status on the panel by how much you can help. Right. And it, yep. that's always been from day one, the focus here is that the people who can simplify, communicate well, and help people bring them their own level of expertise up are the people who become the stars here, as opposed to look at how much I know about how many things, and I'm just gonna constantly show right. you that. Absolutely. Next question. Um, James Babbitt of San Diego here says, are there any plans to do another edition of the coffee challenge? The coffee challenger is its head. We had a great time. If you go back and look at some of the videos, we had a great, uh, a, a great way of doing the coffee challenge. We did this challenge where we, for the for the folks who hadn't seen it, um, we challenged everybody to just do a a video about how they made coffee, you know. And um, and so we're definitely gonna do it again. I I just need a little bit more time to figure out the structure of it. Where that where are people gonna put the videos so that we can download them and play them out? Um, where are we going to, you know? So I'm just trying to figure that out. And then also, I'm gonna tighten the rules a little bit. So that they're, you know, like, so I think that we should try to fit them into a minute, you know, like this is like, you know, to make it a little more challenging. Um, and, and for us, you know, the structure is what makes a game interesting. So making it a very challenging thing of you got to explain how you make coffee in a minute or so it might be coffee in a minute or whatever. Um, and, and then play with that or in Emily's, uh, you did it, Emily did it in Google Docs, which was really cool, little interactive guide. So that's okay too. Uh, if, as long as it takes a minute to go through the interactive guide, that's the, that's the key to the operation. Um, but uh, I do think building, building that, we will probably do other things. We'll, we'll do coffee again, because I kind of want to use the one we already know how to do, and then put the new rules in and see if they work. And then we'll do something, uh, something else. Go ahead, Jeffrey. You know, we've been doing the resolve training, so maybe uh, doing the coffee challenge at the end of the resolve training might be a option. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, yeah, I, I think that uh, yeah, doing HDR, <laughs> do an HD, do, do a vision vision grade of a of a coffee challenge, but then we have to make sure we've, everybody has a camera that can do that. But um, anyway, I think that uh, I mean a lot of the Pixel Core was based on challenges. We just keep challenging people to do stuff, and then we all talk about it amongst each other. And and there's a I think that the one thing I do want to do is, is ask people to shoot behind the scenes of them shooting it. So get somebody else to take pictures of them while they're shooting it or little videos so that so that we can see what it took for them to do it as well. Go ahead, Emily. Um, a little combination of question one and question two um, is uh, this week our schools decided that they're going to go back four days in person. So they want to live stream the class period home to the kids that want to stay fully remote. Right. And the IT guy called all panicked because this will actually be the first time that they're on live Zoom meetings for the whole day, everybody in the district. And um, I showed the assistant superintendent, my coffee video. And I said, are you going to learn more from watching my coffee video? Or are you going to learn more from me telling you for 45 minutes with other people asking questions the day after I do it, where you don't have access to me and you can't ask questions anymore. Like the recorded version of that 45 minute class. And she was like, I guess you have a point. And I was just like, you guess. <laughs> and she was like, well, but what are the best practices? And I was the best practices to have something made specifically for the remote kids, the remote only kids, and not expecting them to sit through a 45 minute Zoom meeting of the whole class. I really, yeah, to your point, you know, I, I got um, the books around here somewhere, but 
uh, Edward Tufte has this talk about representing graphical and representing information. And because of the COVID, uh, you could never get a video of it. But because of COVID, they published the video of it, which I quickly bought. And then it takes forever for it to show up. <laughs> like, this is the funkiest thing. It, it, it shows up and you don't get a code to watch the video until you got the books because the books kind of go with it. You're supposed to open up, go to page 30 or something like that. And um, he talks really slowly. I mean, he's, he's, you know, he's very, you know, like, he's, he's really slow. I'm from Pittsburgh, so we, we talk really fast all the time. And so you're just like, okay, keep going. The best part of it was I realized I'm so glad that I got the video and didn't go to the, didn't go to his actual talk because I could go to 2X. You know, I can just listen. I can just comfortably, he's, he's a 2Xer. There are some people that are 1.5s and one point, in this case, it's how fast you talk is what I can listen to. Um, so he's a two X. I probably could have even done two and a half X with him. Um, the, of uh, what I, I can't listen like, so that I realized how much I can listen to when it's faster. And, you know, we didn't do that before because we didn't have video. We didn't have audio. We weren't, we didn't have all the tools to watch at two X or 1.5 X. And the reality is to your point is that the kids are way better off with the record. Most kids know how to go faster. You know, like they just turn it up and now they've taken your 45 minute course and it's now 22 minutes. And the funny thing is, is that I understand more of, I can grok more from the faster version because I don't, I don't do as much. Um, it requires all my attention. You know, like I have to pay attention the whole time or I'll miss huge chunks of it. So I just sit there and just stare at it. And it's like, it feels like the matrix, you know, I know Kung Fu, you know, like, like, you know, cause you just sit there and just stare at it and you're just pulling all the information in. Whereas when people talk at one X, I'm usually, I've done three other things between every word you know, in my head, you know, and, and I can't, I can't, I don't remember what they said most of the time. Um, Nick. Yeah. Two X has started to become normal and yeah. it feels like anything at one X is. I, every so, once in a while, every once in a while, I take my, my audible books. Every once in a while I take my audible books and I pull them back to one and I'm like, Oh my gosh. Like how could anyone listen to this? <laughs> and audible and masterclass are, are two also that I, you know, besides YouTube and Vimeo that I like crank up to whatever the highest speed is. Although David Mamet, David Mamet's a 1.5. Like he goes, to, he goes pretty fast. Like I have a hard time. I had a hard time masterclass speeding him up as much. Go ahead, John. Do you remember the FedEx commercial with the person speaking at 2X? John Mashita. But what's funny is, is that when you re speed someone up 2x, the diction is so good because it started at 1x, it's actually clearer than if you talk fast. So it's, I, you know, so it's, it's an interesting puzzle. Anyway, I, but I agree with you, Emily, that if you're not going to make it interactive, like if you're just streaming it, like if you're going to make it interactive, if those students, because they're not planning to do that, right, Emily, they're just going to stream. Well, the the kids at home are allowed if they're in person, like they're actually simultaneously watching the class as it's occurring. Um, they're allowed to ask questions through Zoom, but only through the chat. And if the teacher unmutes them to ask a question, um, and the teachers are concerned about not seeing it happening because they're at smart boards, and then the Zoom is on a separate computer next to the smart board. So, you know, if you don't have someone monitoring it for you and and going, oh, Johnny has a question and he wants to know X, Y, and Z, if he's muted, it's really hard to get that teacher's attention. Um, and then the other part is if a student, this is the messed up part, which hopefully they'll change this policy, the union's working on it right now, but um, the big messed up part is if you're absent and you, it's what they call an unexcused absence, you won't have access to the recordings, but if it's an excused absence, you'll have- what access to the recordings. And the difference between an excused and unexcused currently is a note from your parents. Like, so the parent just has to write a note so that they know that the kid missed the class, but they're also asking the middle school and high school students basically to be on the computer from 7:45 in the morning until 2 15 to 35 in the afternoon with only lunch. And if they're lucky, a study hall break from the computer. So they're sitting at home in front of a computer for four and a half hours. And my thing is like, I can barely pay attention. Like we're doing this here and I'm answering stuff in a chat and I'm looking at things that I did before. And I'm looking up links for people that ask questions. I can't sit in a class where someone's explaining, you know, a math concept and not 
you know, be what fully I've... engaged after four hours of sitting through other courses. So I'm really concerned. And like I said, in the chat, I'm kind of hoping it crashes and burns just so that they'll rethink it and go, maybe we should just be providing asynchronous recorded for the, the mobile kids with office hours on Fridays or after school, like during a teacher's not their prep necessarily, but giving them an extra prep where they can meet with students asynchronously or synchronously to go over the asynchronous work might be better. But it's like the disconnect is at the administration level. They're like, it's not that hard. We go to Zoom meetings all the time. And I'm like, you go to a Zoom meeting for 20 minutes to maybe 40 minutes. And it's a discussion. You, yeah. And it's a discussion that you're Discussions involved are in. easy. It's Listening not, to people is hard. It's not watching something happen. I'm like, go well, do that. <laughs> not it's it's not it's not it's it's literally not watching someone with not very much technology with a board with a bunch of other people where you're sitting in the back of the room. I mean, you're you're basically creating all the things that don't work about video and putting them all in one place and then expecting people to sit there and watch it. It's pretty brutal. Um, yeah, uh, uh, Bill and then John, and we'll move on. Well, I just wanted to put in one little caveat here for informational listening. I 100% agree with this, and I turn up all of mine to be faster as well. I do think there's another mode you get into, which is creative listening. If I'm listening to uh, poetry or something like that, I'm not sure I want to go that fast. And in point of fact, my analogy would be if I'm waltzing with my life, doubling the tempo with my wife, doubling the tempo does nothing for me. I prefer I, I, the tempo to be slower. The way I handle fiction, you know, when I want to read fiction, it's called a movie. <laughs> like, like, like I don't, I don't, I don't read fiction. Anyway, go ahead, uh, John. But that loses out on all the audible books and and the, sure. the great works of art. I mean, there are a couple of authors. I just think their sentence structure uh -huh. and the rhythm of their words is magnificent, and I don't want to speed that up. I, I, I'm I just don't read well, so I do. I I, I I have so much. I'm so far behind in the non-fictional books that the idea of spending time on something that isn't that that doesn't move me doesn't move that other part forward is hard for me to budget. Uh, John. So I'm in a corporate environment where we're having when I'm having meetings six out of twelve, you know, six out of eight hours a day, and we are encouraged to take breaks to shorten our meetings to 25 minutes instead of 30 or 50 instead of an hour. And it's not working by the way, but we're being encouraged to, I can't do it as an adult. I can't imagine children who have all that energy being forced to sit still. I think what it is, is administers administrators do not understand how to navigate this new environment. Well, it's they won't, to recreate the classroom experience in the students' homes. And that doesn't work with it's, this technology. We've got better options. It's called uh, new wine and old wineskins. <laughs> All right, next question. John Pooit uh, here from Huddersville says, how do you promote passion in your students? Go ahead, Emily, and then Nick, Steve. Um, relationships. If you understand what your kids are into, you can, you know, change what you're talking about and offer things that appeal to them, um, that get them excited about things, listening to them. Um, you know, the relationships is the number one thing, being able to know that you have kids that are into Fortnite and then creating a lesson plan around Fortnite or adding characters or lingo and getting the kids go, Oh, it isn't just Romeo and Juliet. Now we're doing Fortnite. Okay, cool. Um, you get a lot of buy-in that way. And then just allowing them to demonstrate their understanding in a way that comes naturally for them so that they're not just regurgitating information, but creating. So if they're a creative kid and they want to do a creative writing piece to explain under the understanding of a concept, that's great. If they want to make a movie, that's great. You know, I have a lot of kids that love stop motion and I would love them to do all their concepts in stop motion. Cause then I could share those with the kids who didn't understand it when I explained it. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. But Nick and then Steve. Uh, as usual, Emily is brilliant. Um, in this case, she stole my answer, but um, the, yeah, I mean, absolutely. One of the first things I'll do in any class is go around the room and ask, well, what is it that you want to do? What, what would you like to get out of this class? And but beyond that, like, what do you really want to do? Like, forget about this class at all. Mm -hmm. What is it that you want to be doing? Yeah. And then that helps set the stage for me to do my best to connect whatever that subject material is with what it is they actually want to do. 
Um, the other thing is that I tend to be, I, I'm, I'm a bit lucky in that I'm, I'm fascinated by everything. I, I think there are quite a few people in the visual effects industry that, you know, oh, explosives might be fun to play with. Oh, you know, I'd, I'd like to do some machine shopping, you know. And, and so it's really easy for me to become excited about the things the students are excited about. And then I share that excitement with the topic um, mm -hmm. rather than simply, all right, well, that's nice. That's what, that's what you want to do. Here's the material now. So, uh, so. Absolutely. All right, Steve? Yeah, I think igniting the spark is really important right from the beginning, igniting the spark of this is, this is something exciting you're going to learn. And it's, you know, and then you can see the passion in their eyes. And then if you fuel that by giving them projects and standing next to them and supporting them, as they fail, much like the Raspberry Pi situation, you know, you're all together working on a project together, then it just, that passion just carries through. And, and I think it's, as Emily said, it's real important to establish that relationship that I'm here to support you. I'm here to go with you on that journey. So let's, let's go, let's, let's dive into this. And, and I think it's all about getting your hands dirty and just doing it, just get in. Okay. You want to do video, you want to do a movie, you want to do, the, let's just do it. If you fall down, the teacher's there to help pick you back up, point you in another direction or, you know, dust you off and say, yeah, that was great, but let's try this or that and get going. And I think the relationship is, is probably the key thing that, that, that happens. If you could build that relationship and start to build that spark, you just watch them fly. And that's just great. Yeah, absolutely. Chris and then John. One of the keys to those relationships being invitational and empowering is to make it safe to reveal your passion because a lot of kids a lot of students uh, come into a situation where a, a course where you're not sure whether you know what what the boundaries are what's safe to be uh, revealing about yourself and about your your deepest uh, maybe uh, tentatively held uh, ambitions and, and passion. So, so setting that tone that says, it, it's, as Steve was suggesting, it's, it's okay to fail. That's part of the process is trying things that are just beyond your grasp and, and looking for help and, and making that be an ethos of the, of the community that you're trying to build, the temporary community of the, the group is is essential uh, making safety trust and care seem to me to be the foundational pillars of a setting in which uh, i as a student can be myself um, with all the the warts and incompletions and and wild ideas uh, dreams of glory are are permitted here uh, you're not going to be ridiculed or uh, told to get back on task when you you go off on a what seems like a tangent uh, it's it's a, it's a uh, it's the hero's journey it's not a tangent and everybody everybody gets a chance to be to make a little progress on their own hero's journey which isn't all to the same destination so it's it's a divergent experience each of us is headed to a different uh destination not a conversion experience where it all comes together in a, a common standardized test. Yeah, absolutely. John? Uh, two rules served me very well for 32 years of teaching. One, never instruct or teach anything I was not excited about. If I couldn't get excited about it, I wouldn't teach it. And the other rule is I let my students know the more engaged they are, the less jokes I'll tell. Those two <laughs> things served me well. You know, I, I start off almost every talk that I do, uh, almost every single talk I do, I go, hey, I just got to let you know that I'm not a very good speaker. Like, I'm, I'm pretty good at answering the questions, but I'm, I'm really not very good at, like, speaking. So this is not going to take very long to get through the subject matter, and it won't be very interesting if you don't ask questions. So I'm just letting you know, like, right now, I'm not, we're not going to wait until the end. You can just start asking questions at the beginning, and, and we'll just start digging through it. And as I'm going, the best thing to do, I said, if you ask me later, I'll forget what I was talking about. <laughs> so uh, just, just ask me now. And, and part of that is creating the safety for everyone to ask those questions immediately. And then what my talks for 20 years or 25 years have looked like is a random 
popcorn version of, you know, exactly what you see in office hours. This is what all my classes look like. Um, and I know where I'm trying to get to, but it's just like everyone, you know, because then it keeps everybody in active listening. Um, the other thing that I, uh, I tend to focus on a lot is what I call dessert first instruction, which is that I, I look, most people do this thing where they grind us through all the basics that you have to do so that you can do the cool thing. I look at my curriculum of what I'm going to do. And in the first week, we're going to do the coolest thing you're going to do all the whole time. Like, I want you to go, wow, okay, I'm really into that. It's got to be relatively easy and relatively impressive. Now you're ready to talk about all the other things. Like, you know, because now you want to know more about that and you want to dig into it and you want to, but you have to, you know, you get over that. I think that a lot of times we, we make everybody get bored before, they, by the time they get to what, you, what was cool, they forgot about it because they're just like, oh my gosh, this class is killing me. And so, so, but they're all interested in math and all kinds of other things when they do something that's really fun. Um, anyway, uh, Emily and then Roscoe, and then we'll move on. I was just going to say that the, the whole reason I became a teacher was I was tutoring um, first graders in reading. And I had this kid who just wouldn't move off of a DRP of six, which is really low for first grade. I think they need to be at a 13 or 16. I don't remember what it was anymore. And we read a book about mangoes and it was a very basic book. It was like, mom goes to the store, she buys fish. Mom goes to the store, she buys mangoes. And the kid looked at me and he was like, what's a mango? And I was like, well, and so at the end of the week, I said, if we keep reading, I'll bring you some mangoes, you know, and really work at it. So, you know, I had tried everything with this kid, like penny racers, drawing chalk, playing games, all sorts of stuff. This mango on Friday, he was so excited to eat. We had a red mango and a green mango. We had some with salt and some with whatever. And then he became, he jumped in his reading from level six to level 18 in like the course of a month, two months, two months. And the first grade teacher was like, what did you do? And I was like, he was interested in mangoes. So we read about mangoes. But what happened was, is he realized that there was information in books about things he didn't know. And he liked mangoes. So now he wanted to know what else there was. And so it, it, it was like watching this light switch turn on. And then every time I worked with kids, I was constantly looking for the light switch. What is yep. it for you? So I'd have, you know, 125 kids in the high school level and it'd be like, what's the light switch for this kid? And you, you pay attention to the little things and that's where the relationships come in. And if you can find that light switch, then you're able to more customize and get them engaged or stumble through something that interests all them like food or, you know, discussion. Yep. I'm going to stop talking. My dog's freaking out. <laughs> so you're saying selective bribery is, is important. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Got bribery it. did not Got work it. with this kid we, until the, the, oh, mango. the mango. We don't, like to call it, we don't like to call it bribery. We call it incentives. It's incentives. a carrot. Uh, yeah, I get yeah, it. Exactly, carrot or exactly. a stick, right? Yeah, or a Ros mango or a stick. Roscoe. Yeah, my job's much easier because uh, college kids know pretty much why they're pursuing a particular discipline, but it's storytelling. Bottom line is find the story inside of them. And uh, oftentimes, uh, if you're familiar with either Bill Moyer's World of Ideas or Joseph Campbell, A Hero of a Thousand Faces, I can get into their history and ask who in your family immigrated and what courage did it take for them to leave where they were and come to this country or come to this area and, and ask them about that aunt or cousin or grandfather, and they become passionate about those stories. And then they say, tell that story. Next question. James Fosslein in Minneapolis, Minnesota says, professors sometimes need to move large video files from one online platform to another. This is easy on campus with bandwidth. Uploading is hard on home networks. Have any of your educational institutions created tools with which you can do this? Yeah, go ahead, John. Nike makes an incredible tool. We use it regularly. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So yeah. Still put, put your shoes on, put it on a, a USB drive. And we were it. doing, we did some experiments where we were doing production in Zimbabwe. We were having the students learn how to do post-production in Zimbabwe. And uh, one of the funny things, someone was like, how, how, how do you handle the bandwidth that I'm like, FedEx is an incredible CDN. Like, like it was just, you know, it's like you put a whole bunch of stuff on a hard drive and you send it over. Um, one of the things that I do a lot is I have uh, to. Uh, I don't have as much bandwidth at my house, but I have a lot of bandwidth at the office, and I use Apple Remote Desktop all the time. Now, you might be able to use, um, you know, Team Viewer or other things like that, but to, you know, you can log into your computer at work and then move the files from there rather than. Um, uh, that's what I do all, I mean, I download, I mean, cause I have two, one gig connections at the office and I've only got, you know, 
uh, 10 up at my house. And so, but I have enough bandwidth to control those computers. And, and when I pop it into full screen, it's a little laggy, but almost, it's almost like being there. And I can sit there and just move things around and, and recopy things and render things. Like I'll, why have my computer render when I can have my work computer render? Uh, go ahead, Nick. Uh, solutions that allow you to have like a, essentially a watch folder on your computer work really well. I mean, Dropbox was one of the earlier ones that was used quite a lot in production. Uh, my university uses uh, Microsoft OneDrive because it's just part of our mm -hmm. Office 365. And, you know, when I hate them being installed on my computer, it's so, like the very first thing I do is deactivate syncing. And then I make sure I move, I designate all folders that are in the cloud as not to synchronize so that really I'll just have on the computer a single folder that like is meant for synchronizing up to the cloud. The nice thing about these is you don't have to do a, a deliberate drag and drop uh, to and, and then keep your browser open and watch that and then restart anytime an upload fails. You can load a directory full of thousands of files and they could be all JPEGs or they could be large. And then in the background that software solution running on the operating system is going to manage the upload of that however long it takes and if there's a you know a glitch and one of the files fails it'll just resume that file and move on and then once that material is in the cloud it's very easy to share links for others to download um, with the office solutions you know you could take something from OneDrive and say oh, i want to move this or copy this to teams and now a whole team can use it or uh, sharepoint so um, I, I've done a few productions. We, we did a production in winter where we took the, the college jazz band. We sent them all green screens and they all had to film themselves uh, using whatever cameras and lighting they had so that we could make a, a virtual production jazz concert. And we managed everything using uh, OneDrive and Teams. And most students were really just dealing with a couple files at a time, but I could manage moving blocks of files, folders of files um, through these solutions. Most of the shuffling was happening in the cloud and just the moment that I needed it on a computer on the cloud, I'd say, all right, move these files over to this folder in OneDrive that's syncing to that particular machine. So, Next question. Okay, moving on to Roscoe Jones. How do you attempt to build credibility with a class when you first meet with them? Usually, I do something that melts their mind. <laughs> like, like, you know, like I show something, I unwrap something for them that, that establishes that. I do that a lot though. I mean, in, you know, with clients and with everything else, like that you'll step into something that I know a lot about and I just ex explain it in detail. Um, and that usually kind of establishes some credibility of, of what that looks like. I don't, I can't say that I do that on purpose. I just kind of look, I see an opportunity to really dig into something, but I do think that if you're teaching something, hopefully, you know, something that you can expound on, um, in detail, you know, um, that, that will have them think through that. Go ahead, Chris. In my, my uh, first meeting with a class is always my favorite. Um, and, and it's so important to set, set expectations and tone. And uh, the big message isn't so much that uh, I have fancy degrees and, and uh, decades of experience. <laughs> That's never so, my message. <laughs> yeah, it, we, don't, we don't go through my, uh, my CV. That's, that's, that doesn't work. Um, they roll their. They would roll their eyes, um, but but my pitch is this: this course, this experience is is going to be different than anything you've ever been enrolled in before. It's going to be different. It's going to break all of the rules and expectations that um, you've done so well in that got you here today. And the second pitch is that. Um, you're going to learn more from one another than you are from me. So look around you, uh, there, there are 30 uh, wise instructors here, each of whom has a part to play in your success. And the third pitch is um, this week, we're going to do the final project. We're gonna get that out of the way, or at least the first draft, first version of what it is that you hope to um, be able to show off with pride um, 16 weeks from now or a year from now or whatever, whatever the timeline is. So, 
so we do, as Alex was describing, we do a mind blowing version of the final product, uh, not, not to build it up by, by little bricks and pebbles, but to say, let's try to do the whole thing and maybe maybe we're done. When we're going to be done at the end of the week, but I'll bet that uh, you'll think of ways to improve it and improve it and improve it, so that the the course becomes a, a repetition, a cycle of let's let's do this thing that we we came here to do. Let's do it first um, before you're ready, before you think you're ready, and then let's look let's share what we've done with one another and critique it and improve it and provide help for one another and do it over again and over again and over again. So, and that is truly different for them. And uh, the, my credibility is not about um, my wisdom and credentials. It's about uh, being able to deli deliver on the promise that you're really going to be doing something right away. You're not just listening or reading a textbook for yep. 15 weeks and then trying to apply it in the well, 10 and, minutes we have left. Yeah, and 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 the and when I say I try to do something that blows people's minds, it's not so much about me blowing their mind. It's about getting them excited about something. Like, let me open up this door that's gonna have you get super excited about this thing. And the less you can get about yourself and the more you can get about that thing, the better. All right, go ahead, Emily. I set up a reputation. So my, I overheard some students talking to each other and one of them goes, don't worry, you have Miss Gilbert. That was my name at the time. Miss Gilbert, she doesn't teach English. It's not all reading and writing. You do photography and film and marshmallow peep dioramas. Like it's way more cool than just writing or reading. <laughs> and so once I heard that, I was like, okay, I'm good. <laughs> like I don't have to sell myself anymore. Well, and that's the, that's the idea. Like it should be like fun. Like it should be something that's exploring. And the problem is, is again, we get into this, anyone, anyone, like we're going to, we're going to, you know, we're going to, you know, faux gras education. Um, anyway, uh, Peter. I was going to say, I also follow the old rule I learned in Toastmasters, which is tell them, you know, tell them, tell them and tell them what you told them. And in a video concept that says, and I was noticing Emily has her STEM reference, show the, the, what the end product looks like all at once and then how do you get to the end product and right. end, end with the end product again right mm -hmm. whatever that is whatever the experiment is we're trying to show I, I do it with cub scouts a lot and that tends to hold their attention yep. that, absolutely uh, next question speaking of emily's super chris russo from red hook says emily russo may we get a tour of your desk and what you used for your origami lessons this morning. Good, somebody, somebody, that I think somebody, somebody threw Emily a softball. That's all I'm saying. I, I think that a I think softball there's a softball or a, in front of a bus. What the, <laughs> I'm not prepared for this. Um, <laughs> I did a girls rock STEM this morning. And so it's an organization that provides STEM for uh, learning to interest girls in fifth through eighth grade in STEM careers. And um, I was showing them how origami um, influences all sorts of aspects of STEM. So we talked about soft muscles and robots, and we talked about um, uh, airbags being created, you know, based off of STEM and all sorts of things. But then we built, I'll quickly change my screen here, but I used the OBS that y'all taught me how to use to do this. And uh, I taught the kids how to make these hinges so that they could make these transforming ninja stars. Um, and this is a really basic, simple fold because I only had 45 minutes to work with the, the girls. And um, it was cool because they were all able to do it in the 45 minutes. Plus I had a little presentation um, of it. So I was able to do the folding here on this work area which is why my STEM looks better. My origami and STEM looks better on this screen than it does on the other screen because I have a white background. Um, but I'm able to pull things in and show the kids, you know, this is what we're going to do and this is how we're going to do it. And they all really enjoyed it. I got a lot of positive feedback from the kids and that's why I came in hot today because I literally came from there <laughs> back into right. here. Um, but I have an overhead camera, the OBS setup, the, um, so so what are you using? Uh, yeah, I think this is important for for folks. To get. So you're, what what cameras are you? What cameras do you have, and and how are you mixing them together? So I have a Logitech Brio as my forward facing camera, 
Um, mm -hmm. And that's fed into one scene on OBS. And then I have the one C that we mm -hmm. talked about over the summer um, set up as an overhead. Let me see if I switch it back. There we go. So then I have the mm -hmm. keys programmed on my keyboard so I can switch back and forth really quickly. Right. And this allows me to do things mirrored mm -hmm. correctly, as well as, you know, do the folds and show the kids, you know, I want you to hold it up, make sure the seams at the bottom now push it forward to get a square and walk through and, the and, steps. And how are you, and how, how have you mounted that one C uh, above your, what are you using? <laughs> It's an arm, uh, uh, our, a camera arm that is attached to my ring light over my work area. So I have a picture of it. I can pull it up and, and um, show it to you guys, but it'll take me a minute to grab it. I, this is the setup I showed my superintendent and after he made me come back to work uh, and he looked at my setup and he was like, oh, I want that in my office. And I was well, like- <laughs> And my argument of course is that <laughs> that I've said before is it'd be great if all the teachers had that in there, you know, it, you know, like rather than, um, and with $130 billion, we could afford it, you know, so that it, it, that and more I mean, the teachers wouldn't have to buy it themselves. Like I'm sure you did. Yeah. I actually have, I have the picture. I just don't have the ability to share it with you guys. Cause it's not in my OBS setup. Mickey can set I... you up there. Okay. Hmm. Oh, there we go. Okay share screen. So this is my setup. And this was for my superintendent. That's why all the writing is in there. <laughs> um, but this is the arm over the workspace. This is where mm -hmm. I'm working, folding the papers. Then I have the two big screens that you guys are on my Brio's right here. Um, and then I just, you know, my microphone and everything else is kind of in the area. And then this is what I got to find my tools again. Stop share. And like a standard C stand with a grip arm. Yeah. That, that microphone is more expensive than some entire teaching setups. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's the perks of having a, a husband who works in audio and having extra equipment <laughs> lying around. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. That's fantastic. I just I, found, I, go, go ahead. I'm sorry. I just found that same microphone at the bottom of a bin at work. And when I Googled it, I was just, I just found literal gold. Yeah. <laughs> so. yeah. That's great. I just think it's important. I mean, to, to show that because I, I do think this is what we missed during COVID, you know, was teachers being trained and equipped with that kind of setup. And I think that if we had done that more and not had teachers just struggling along without giving them the tools and the training that they needed, we would have been in a different place from an education perspective. Go ahead, John. Just, could you put that picture in the share your setup? I have a number of people I'd like to send that drawing to. That would be yeah. great. Yeah, I'll That's do great. that. A lot of people don't, when I say this, is, you, there's people doing this, they go, name's one. You know, I say, I have a friend. <laughs> <laughs> we, we know somebody. All right. Uh, next question. Tony Mobley here in Newman, Georgia from uh, the panel has there been any exciting news about the new stimulus funds people figuring out how to spend stuff i, I hear that they've they figured out how to spread kids instead of six feet apart three feet apart which means twice as much plexiglass <laughs> it's the only thing i've heard so far uh, all right yeah go ahead chris my daughter victoria is a an assistant professor clinical professor at asu and um there was an emergency meeting of her unit, the, uh, the School of uh, Health Solutions, basically. She's a speech language pathologist. And the emergency meeting was about, uh, we've told you to uh, not spend any money and don't come to us, don't come to the Dean with great ideas for how to spend money. We don't have the money, but uh, now we have to change that. Uh, we need a lot of million dollar ideas quickly because we've been invited to bid for uh, support out of this 130 billion or whatever smaller subset is uh, going to higher education. So, so in the next two days or three days, we need your one page proposals for your million dollar ideas that can be, that are shovel ready and can be completed in 18 months because then, then the money's gonna go away and uh, we'll be back to uh, talking poor. So it's, it's one of those um, 
head banging familiar experiences in education where um, folks are asked to uh, hurry up and and be creative and uh, uh, you know you know we 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 need the money we're, we're not so much concerned with the uh, I, the quality of the ideas or the the long term uh, sustainability of the ideas we just need to quickly get on this gravy train while we can it's it's sad but that's that's the news from Lake Wobegon uh, the key is to keep thinking about it you know like i i i've i've spent a lot of people's money that way in a good way like like people come to me and go hey what would you do like i <laughs> i can't tell you how many times someone someone ping, ping me and just said i've got a million dollars to build something and i have to spend it in a week what would you do and i i send them a whole deck like this is what i would do with a million dollars and i a million dollars i can fill really quickly i have trouble i had one where i had i had a week to to figure out how to they said just you know, there's no limit. And then I had trouble because I couldn't figure out what to do. I gave them a $5 million um, plan and they wouldn't do it because it was under 50 million. Like it was like, but I was like, if you had told me it was 50 million, but I was like, but if it was 50 million, it would have, it was in, you know, in the Middle East. And, and I was like, I, I, you know, I needed to know that ahead of time um, anyway, but the, uh, um, the, just as a, as an aside, for teachers who are thinking about that, just be careful about the, there was a broadcast unit. I talked about this in the past, but I'll just say it real quickly. There's a broadcast unit we worked with in Washington, DC that had the nicest server rooms, nicest studios I've ever seen ever in any broadcast room ever. Everything's perfect. And I was like, how do you do this? And they said, well, what we do is at lunch once a week, we build a, we have a, we have a Excel file that has what we need next. And we work on it one lunch a week. They work on this this Excel file that is the most important things at the top going down, right? And they just keep on reordering it and keep on at, oh, I saw this thing. Oh, that'd be really good. Let's put that at, let's put that at number three. And let's put that, you know, like, and they figure it all out. And then he said, we work at a publicly traded company. It was a broadcast company. And and when they say, when the when they, they'll put out a thing that says, hey, we need to spend, you know, in the next week, we have to spend $440,000 or, or whatever for the taxes or, or whatever they're doing for the numbers. And he goes, we just go into the Excel file and we just, we have a little calculator and we just drag down this Excel file until we get to the number that they gave us. And we send it to them in a minute. Like all of us have alarms that go off on our phones. When that email goes out, it's from that. If any, any email from that person, all of our phones go off and we try to get within a minute respond because they don't care. They don't care what, what division gets it. All they care about is that this is no longer a problem. And, and, um, and so we get everything we want all the time <laughs> and, and, and he goes, we're the best funded part of the group, you know, because, but it, it's, it's luck is, you know, um, opportunity went me, meeting, uh, you know, preparation. And I think that constantly thinking about it, which is hopefully what we're doing on Saturday mornings, uh, helps, um, good sky. And then John. Well, and a lot of that is attitude shift. I remember a great disaster recovery organization that I've uh, connected with. They said, if we went to Bill Gates and asked for $10 million, they would not give it to us. Now, do they have it? Obviously. But the Gates Foundation is about exactly as you're saying, solving a solution. So if you can come to them to solve a solution, they have $100 million for you. Yeah. So a, a pile mic is a great solution for an instance. But again, maybe that's as you say, maybe there are other options than plexiglass, but it does start with attitude. Yeah. And, and, and it's hard also to have experience. Like if someone said, what would you do with a million dollars for an educational facility? I'd build a studio. You know, I, I would very quickly build a studio that allows you to do virtual training what, with all what the What problem that does that solve? That's the yeah, sales. It means you, yeah. It amplifies, it amplifies your best teachers, you know, and it allows you to have, you know, virtual classrooms that actually work and it, and it lets you experiment with where education is actually going to end up going. And then going I would to. lead, I would lead with that, that second sentence rather than the first. Well, some, but, but, but I want to know how much you say with money. Yeah. Go ahead, John. I was just saying uh, the lab of the university, when we would get grants and as long as you didn't go over the grant, everything was good. So we were forced to have a contingency. So the closer we got to the end of the grant, we had our list of, you know, under a hundred dollars, under 500, under a thousand. And it was really great because everybody wanted to make sure we could get more gear. So we were really very careful on our money. And that last month when it was, uh, you know, use it or lose it, that's when we go, okay, how high up the list can we go? Yeah. And the, a lot of those quick spends too, is, is some of the best opportunities. I built a whole school that way. Um, and um, uh, the, because you don't, the one thing I learned really quickly is you don't have to succeed. Like, I know that like 
And the reason I say that is you have to get the money and you have to go down the path. We did it. I turned down a World Bank fund. You know, it was like a World Bank grant for it was an experimental grant that was out there. And I turned it down and I was like 300 and some thousand dollars that I just didn't want to take. And they said, why did you why did you not apply for this? And uh, because you would have gotten it. And I said, well, because I wasn't sure if I could succeed. Like, I I didn't know if I could do what I, you know, like I didn't, they said, we didn't care about that. We just cared about the data, like what, what worked and what didn't work. (laughs) Like, like if we think you can succeed, we'll give you, you know, a hundred million dollars. But we just want to figure out, we were just exploring and we just want people to explore. So you have to understand, like, especially on a fast, on on those ones where like, hey, we got to spend a million dollars in two days. It just has to look good on a deck. No, I, I you know, that was like, an early lesson for me. There yeah. was five people applied. We got a federal grant to create this instructional unit and we killed ourselves. And I mean, but we got it done. We finally went to the meeting mm-hmm. where all the projects showed up, all five of them. We were the only one who had a product. I'm yeah. looking around. Well, what, what do you mean? She said, Oh, we tried real hard and this is what we learned. <laughs> this is what we I, mean, learned I didn't <laughs> have to have a product. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Go ahead, Peter. I was going to say the other thing you can always watch out for, particularly if you're dealing with with governmental or pseudo governmental entities, is they're often tied to uh, annual budgets that are tied to their fiscal year. Right. And at the end, there seems to always be some money left over yep. that they you use it or lose it kind of model. Yep. Yep. And I know Absolutely. there have been a number of cases where I've done some consulting work, not necessarily in this field, what we're talking about here, but where all of a sudden, Suddenly, two million dollars appears out of nowhere. Yep. Oh yeah, <laughs> absolutely. And I've done lots of projects like that. Next question: Andrew Flowerdew of Warwick in the UK says, "I have eight to 10 76-inch multi-touch screens. I'd like to make a room like the Harvard X virtual classroom from X Two O Media. Any ideas on what I need to build to get something like this with perhaps six different people per screen and individual sound and cameras for each screen?" And uh, they know, Andrew notes, by the way, the X20 demo this week seemed to have zero latency between Tunisia and the UK, X20 media site. And he's got a link to looking at the virtual classroom. If only we could get the Harvard X guys to come on the show. Maybe in April. Anyway, um, uh, I haven't, I'd be curious. I think what I would back into is what do you want to do with the multi-touch? is the thing that I would um, ask. What I will say is that I've had a lot of multi-touch. I've built a lot of things with multi-touch. And I I will say that this is more important to me. You know, <laughs> like like as a teacher, that being able to do that has been has proven to be more impactful to my ability to describe a problem to someone than the multi-touch screens. And I don't like doing this all the time. It seems like a really good idea until you do it for a whole day. And then you, you find out that your anterior deltoid gets really sore <laughs> and you start having things with problems with your, your rotator cuffs and everything else. When you, when you do this all the time, it seems like I, I built one and we used it all the time. And I realized I was having problems with my arm. Um, you know, the whole different part of RSI that started showing up and where I don't have any of that, you know, with this. Um, yeah. Uh, next question. Michael Fraley of Dallas, Fort Worth and the panel says, isn't one of the main goals of education in general and higher education specifically to teach not only the subject matter, but how to think, not what to think. Well, I mean, I think that that is the, the question is what should you, how should you think? I think is the, is the, the question that pops up there. You know, um, you know, I think that we have a hard time. We often, um, when we get kids out of school that we put into the, into our productions, we call it unlearning them, you know, like we have to unlearn them from where they were, um, you know, and, and because what happens is they go, well, where's like, we say, okay, we'll learn this. Well, where's the manual and where's this and where's the instructions and who's going to show me how to do this and how is it going to work and, and everything else. And I'm like, no, you just bang on it until it works. You know, like, like, you know, there is no, there is no, you know, pick up this machete. There is no road. Now, now work, work your way through that. And so I'm not sure we have to be careful about what we, how we teach people to learn is the, is part of the problem. Go ahead, Nick. And then Chris. Um, you know, a lot of the times we talk about teaching problem solving because you're 
that's what you're going to always do. You just yeah. there's going to be problems, and and that's how you you know we were talking about what makes a panelist valuable. It's like if you're, if you're sharing the solutions to problems, that's what makes you valuable. Right. And, and so we view that as being, you know, how we can make our students valuable. And I yeah, and I will say that it is a a, a lost art. We talked about doing a second hour on it at some point of <laughs> problem solving. You know, reduce the variables and then keep on adding them back in until something. You know, like it's 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 a uh, to me, it seems obvious because there was a lot of things that we did in the farm that if we didn't get it right, we, you know, we'd lose our fingers. And it turns out you learn really fast that way. But but the um, uh, uh, but but you know, so problem solving was part of just doing that. But but I think that sometimes I, I'm always surprised at how hard that can be. Go ahead, Chris. I think the the distinction between how to think and and what to think about um, is really a, an unhelpful distinction because when you're thinking, you have to think about something. And um, as educators, we, we have a lot, we have a res an opportunity and a responsibility to, to make some decisions about what's worth thinking about. And it's only in the engagement with something that's worth thinking about that you practice different ways of thinking. You, you discover that for example, um, some things that are worth thinking about are in the category of problems, meaning they have a solution. It may be very complicated. Um, and some things that are worth thinking about are dilemmas. They're not problems. They don't have a solution, no matter how long and how much mental power you apply to them you still have to balance between two valued outcomes and more of one is gonna sacrifice something else that you value and vice versa. And it's a, it's a continual balancing process instead of a, a breakthrough that leads to a, a single silver bullet solution. Mm -hmm. so, so I don't, I don't, I think that by choosing wisely things to, that are worth thinking about and that connect with our learners' passions, as we were saying earlier, um, you also teach thinking or you provide opportunities to learn how to think or different ways to think because that which you're thinking about calls on or invites different kinds of thinking, critical thinking or uh, this seeing distinctions where they were invisible before everything was a problem. No, not everything is a problem that has a solution. Some things are dilemmas that require managing the dilemma forever. And right. that, that's, a, that's a form of being, and that's an important uh, thing to get experience with. Yeah, and knowing, knowing which one is hard. <laughs> the next, next question comes from Brian Schwartz of Baltimore. Could you please review the dream setup for teacher and for students to virtually instruct the basics of Final Cut Pro with a minimum amount of time? Go ahead, Bill. So I would want the following. I would want each student to have a laptop, a MacBook Pro, preferably. You said dream, so what the heck. I would want them to have a camera so that I could watch their faces as they're working through things and gauge the level of their frustration. And I'd probably want them to have an A to mini or something else. And the only function of that is so that when you hit one, I can see you and that's where you are. But if you hit two, I immediately see the screen interface so that I can troubleshoot with you. And if I had that and constant communication back and forth between people, I think I could easily take four people through Final Cut from start to finish very quickly. Yeah, I mean, I think that the, the first thing I would always do is have a project that can be edited together into a final piece uh, that they don't have to shoot. Shooting it is something that is, is really hard, you know, to do first, you know, and, and so you shoot a bad, a lot of bad footage, you end up with a bad edit and then you don't want to play anymore. Um, and so, so I think that, you know, giving them a bunch of footage, you know, that is a complete piece that, that has it there and maybe even a few that might have a different, a couple different things to, to do. Now I tend to be, again, I won't do any lecturing if I don't have to. So I will say, okay, everybody, here's the, here's what you need to know how to cut, you know, and start cutting it. 
And people will say, well, I don't, this seems hard. And then, okay, and then I'll do a little bit of it in front of you. And if you want to go back and look at me doing it, then you can watch me work on it with you. This gets into that kind of lab mentality. I usually want to show you a couple things or point you to some videos to watch. And then I just want you to watch me do it or or to have watch somebody do it or, or do it yourself. Um, and then ask questions as you go. Because I find that what I'm trying to do when I create the project, when I create the edit, is I'm putting things in, like I might have some close-ups of a hand. I'm not gonna tell you what to do with that, but you're gonna say, well, that is not very clear. I was like, well, you have a video of a, of a hand, <laughs> put that in there. You know, and, and um, but the idea is, is that people aren't ready for, they're not ready for the answer until they have the question, in my opinion. Like I, everything I do is wrapped around, people aren't ready for the answer until they have the question. That's what we're doing here for hours every day, is you're not ready for the answer until you have the question, you know, and, and so I'm constantly trying to do things that scare up. I, I call it scaring up questions. <laughs> like let's, let's let's do this. Let's just dust this up a little bit and scare up some questions. You know, and and uh, and that's what we do here. Like the, the model that you watch, the first ten minutes of of a second hour is me scaring up questions. Like that's what I'm doing. Is is we're just talking to somebody, and the goal is is to stir it up until there's enough questions to get started. And I, I'll just keep on talking. We'll just keep talking until enough questions get scared up, and then we start answering them. Go ahead, Roscoe, and then Nick. Yeah, uh, ten minute video that shows the interface, what buttons to push to just assemble a basic timeline. I got miles, literally probably ten years out of a dog wash video that mm -hmm. Apple put together with iMovie years ago. Two little kids, uh, dirty dog, put water in the bucket. Dog gets washed, hose yeah. gets sprayed around. I use a thing. Put and then number one is music too. If they can do a music video, awesome. What I use now is a skiing video or skiing videos, which I have them. The guys are driving up to Mammoth. They get out of the car. They go up to the slopes. They come down. Give them a story from the get-go and then watch them and have a checklist of teaching them the skills. Oh, I want you to do a cross dissolve here. I, I don't care where they do it. I just want to teach them the skill of doing a cross dissolve. Let them tell their story. The one that, the one that got away for me was when iMovie came out, I emailed Steve Jobs and said, hey, how would you like a bunch of people from ILM and Lucasfilm to show people how to make movies with iMovie? And he said, tell me more. And then there was this little path of, of stuff that didn't turn out, didn't, didn't come out. But I had Doug Chang and John Knoll and Ren Burt and, uh, the, you know, David Desorts, all these guys lined up to do it. And we just couldn't, couldn't make it go. And, and I was like, that's what you, but somebody should do that. Like do, do something where you, you do something with a bunch of filmmakers and they, they put it all together for you and they walk you through it. And I just still hasn't been done. We'll, we'll figure it out. Uh, Nick and then, and then John. Uh, it's interesting because they've been, sh some of the iPhone commercials have been along those lines, hiring professional. But they should give us the footage. Film. Like, right. But the they haven't given footage. that right to make it. Yeah. Snowball, snowball that, that snowball that snowball fight they should just publish that footage and let everybody cut it together the way that they wanted to cut it together the problem you get into is you work with traditional filmmakers and then they get all ownership over the you know they, they get into this weird thing about what they shot and created and everything else and and so that's what you get you get into the cycle of not being able to publish the actual content and that's yeah you, know, you can't do it I, I really liked Roscoe's point about you know like there's there's something like a dog wash that has a very clear beginning, middle, and end, right? The dog is dirty. The dog has got suds on it. The dog is clean. And the things that in between that lead up to that. And there's also value to providing a large library of this could be anything type of material. I actually, when I took, uh, I had to take a editing class, a final cut editing class for as part of my MFA. The final project was here's this whole pile of clips that were shot for a student film and it was it was like a party setting in uh, an apartment and all these different conversations happened and there was no we were not given a script we were not given a this is how it needs to end this is how it needs to begin it was just here's a pile of clips and it was conversations at a party and then there were you know different people arriving at different times and we had complete freedom to edit it and another piece of that that was really important to take away from was learning to manage the media. So as an editor, you know, we had the opportunity to decide, all right, I'm going to call this scene one, I'm going to call this scene two. Oh, like the sun's golden here, the sun's not golden here. And that media management side of editing is most overlooked by people that are new to it, that are coming in and they, they want to know, I need to know how to cut, I need to know how to stack, I need to know how to crossfade. And the whole concept of managing a large amount of media, managing just a talking head interview, the amount of material that comes out of one of those shoots and 
distilling that down to something meaningful is a great challenge. So yeah, I just thumbs up for all the ideas of providing different types of pre-shot material and then, okay, edit it, manage it and edit it. Yeah. The, uh, I was trying to find it. I, I, I think I have a very low res version of it, but my daughter asked when she was five years old, how to make, how a movie gets made. And I did one called Hannah and the pizza. And I, we literally did a, did a video of her going to get run, having to run all the way to the pizza and bringing it back. And it was, uh, it was on the DVD garage site for a long time, but I haven't found it since. I'd lost it in a, dr in a horrible drive failure um, or a series of drive failures. Um, and, so anyway. And again, the, one other thing for educators in K through 12, the idea of making a film about a topic is hugely useful as an educational experience because number one, the students involved are learning about that topic, how to teach that topic, but then they're filming it and they're seeing that topic over and over again. And now they're also thinking about, well, how much you know memory card capacity do we have? How much film have we got? How long is this gonna take? How, how do we edit this? And, and now they're working through problem solving and, and right. thinking processes. Yep. Um, yeah, go ahead, uh, John and then, and then Peter and then Bill. A person who could really help answer this question is John Woody. Uh, he's a professor emeritus at James Madison, but he was also an Apple Distinguished Educator. And he did a little, yeah, Roscoe's putting up, he did a documentary. He visited higher education institutions, but he's he's magic when he teaches Final Cut. And um, he's very, he, he very much wants to share stuff. So John Woody and BEA is a great organization. I think, Roscoe, you could probably talk to that. Yes, it is. Uh, go ahead, uh, Peter, and then Bill. Well, it seems to me that, I mean, a long time ago, for different reasons, I had to learn the construct of storyboarding, particularly if you're going to tell us before you actually can get down to all the, the technical aspects, decide what the story is you want to tell. Now, maybe it's, maybe the dog, washing the dog thing is a kind of a simple approach, but I've had to tell some rather complex things and how to assemble equipment and and really have to understand how things are put together and what are the steps. Cause you, you'll find that like in my case, I knew how the thing went together. So I didn't think about it, but how to explain it to somebody means you yep. really actually have to write it out. No, absolutely. Storyboard it, you know, and you know, mm -hmm. simple things like taking a eight and a half by 11 piece of paper, fold it in half one way and fold it in half the other way. And each scene goes in a quad of that paper. Uh, so that you can and then you flip through it um good bill and then we'll move on well i'm just gonna say real quick if you're looking for footage i actually had a product about a decade ago called start editing now that was designed for education that had a whole series of what we call multi-track movies where the first scene led to a possibility of three scenes then four or five scenes then three scenes and then a close the purpose of it was to allow a whole classroom full of kids to tell their own story through that and it was designed with things like going from every two to three causes a jump cut and then you have to fix it with the cutaways that we provide and things like that. We actually had two or three versions of that. And so I've got a lot of footage. I own it all. If anybody is interested in doing this, just drop me an email and I'll send you some footage that you can have fun with in your class. That's great. Next question. Uh, Brian Schwartz of Baltimore is back again with most kids get super excited about flying dro drones. Excuse me. What kind of virtual course would you develop to take advantage of this passion? Um, DJI actually has a pretty cool setup for that. They have an education drone. Um, uh, it's a little drone that you can, um, let's see if I can find it really quickly. I've been thinking about getting it for my kids. I just haven't, haven't, uh, there's a, I think it's DJI, the steam education, DJI. Oh, that's, well, they have a bunch of different things, robots, uh, drones, the Tello, it's the Tello EDU. And you can actually uh, use it with um, Swift Playgrounds and other programmable stuff where you can use your iPad and actually run the drone. <laughs> now, I don't know if that gets it into a position where it's too expensive to do, but um, they're about, I think they're about $150, um, $129. And it will, but you can literally program it to do stuff in, and it's an indoor drone. Um, and uh, I, I haven't gotten, a, uh, my, uh, I haven't done it yet, I, but, um, but I'm, getting close to it. Go ahead, Emily. We have a bunch of co-drones that we used to take in. They're little mm -hmm. tiny drones that, you know, 
maybe under a hundred dollars, like $75 ish, uh, for the pro and it has a remote control, but it also can be programmed. And I put the link in, um, the chat, but it's, you it can be programmed with Python or Blackie. And, uh, we set up a obstacle course, um, and had the kids do it in person as a, as a class, like where there was a class we would do, we'd hang hula hoops from the ceiling and try to get the drones to fly through with programming, not with hand controls. And, uh, so virtually, um, you run into the problem of getting the drones to the kids so that they can actually see it. But we did have one of the teachers, um, that teaches, uh, he teaches technology, STEM and, and math. And he did a, um, he has a DJI, a DJI um, big drone, and he flew it up over the school and took shots of the school. And they did math based on the school and location and things like that. And then he was trying to have the kids write the code at home in order to program the drone in person. Um, but they just ran into problems with uh, the kids not really responding to the virtual code. Like, even though they got to see the drone, they weren't there to see the drone. So they weren't as engaged as we were hoping they'd be. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Mickey? As a beginner course, I would probably lean more towards um, something along the lines of studying uh, effective use of aerial footage or drone footage, because I think a lot of uh, at least. Uh, beginner entry level filmmakers tend to use aerial material um, for the sake of having aerial material because it's so affordable nowadays. So, uh, breaking down like effective use, I think that's what, where I would start off. That's great. And we have gotten, oh, good, good. Uh, Steven and Chris. Yeah, uh, we, we teach a, a drone class. And one of the things we do is uh, we've used the Telos, but we've we give them a small, uh, inexpensive drone and say, practice with this. And until you get to fly that stable, then we'll move you up to the next drone and to the next drone. And so then it, it's, it's a real easy, you know, they crash those little cheap drones real fast, but then they start to learn and then just keep stepping them up into uh, more sophistication along the way. And actually we have done this virtually, uh, you know, uh, you know, they're at home and then, then the instructors outside with larger drones and can actually have them follow along and have the students follow along with what he is doing uh, back and forth. But it, it is possible, but it, it is degree of difficulty is high on that. But there's a Lego, Lego crank. There's a Lego based drone that, that my, I, I did get my son and he used it for quite some time. And, and every time you wreck it, it just blows up into little pieces and you have to put it back together. <laughs> it's actually a pretty good, pretty good one. Go ahead, Chris. I'm going to look at that. Half facetiously, I was going to suggest that you start with a field trip uh, to a, a local pond where you observe dragonflies and try to get your head inside mm -hmm. the, the mind of a dragonfly as a, as a way to uh, in, sort of internalize the connection with um, drones. Well, and then, okay, how can we do that? Um, electronically and mechanically. Well, I think also the, that gets back into what we've been talking about all morning is in a virtual event, get somebody who is a drone operator like Ray or someone else to talk about drones and show you footage and maybe even fly a drone during the event where you're feeding that footage in so they can see what that looks like and, and what it takes to do it. And, inter, you know, an opening class with a couple of drone operators like office hours, you know, talking about that would be pretty interesting you know, about what the challenges are and some of the footage and, you know, everything else could be a really interesting conversation. Anyway, we're going to take a little bit of a break. We've been going for quite some time here. Um, and so uh, it is 945. Um, and what we're going to do is we're going to take a break until um, 10 o'clock. We have the guys coming in from, uh, we have uh, Mark and Steve. And so they will be, uh, or I'm not sure if they're both showing up today, but they'll, I think that they'll both be here today, but one or the other to answer your questions. If you haven't put questions in about the Fairlight page, it's time to do it. Um, we've got two questions. It's going to be a really short conversation or we're going to talk a lot about those questions. Um, but uh, think about things that you, if you went through the videos, even if you didn't go through the videos, uh, what questions do you have about audio inside of Resolve? And, uh, and then we'll go from there. All right. Uh, see you guys in 15 minutes. Emily? And by, and by the way, I, I forgot to do the... the it was great. Like great conversation. Like I was, there wasn't as many people here today and I was like, oh no, this is going to be like a 10 minute, like a 10 minute call. And, uh, and 
as always, you guys pulled it out. Anyway, all right. All right. Go, John. I was going to say, Roscoe, if we wanted to make it go longer, we would have talked about our that article on academics aren't content creators. Oh, there's another one that I'm reading, John. It's taken. The comments are great. I, I've literally spent a day and a half reading the, the comments of this article, and it's all about the same stuff. I, I find that it? I find that com comment concept absolutely amazing. Considering my father was an academic, he was an MD and a professor, and and has like a half a dozen published books. Now this is. No, that's old style content, but it's still content. But you take the model, not every professor writes their own textbook. So the idea that every professor should create their own videos, this whole article was just stating sort of a regressive model. But uh, I, he, he never wrote his own textbook. That was the one thing I, and, and by the way, I suffered through a professor who wrote the textbook we were using, and that was pure suffering because all he did was regurgitate the textbook. You didn't, you could have read the book and learned everything in his class. I, I took that. That's exactly I I, what I was getting at with my question uh, during the show, because to me, that does not teach someone how to think. That's just teaching them to memorize and regurgitate something. Yeah. That, it, it, that, that was, it's something that has bothered me since I was a young kid. It, it was even worse for it because if you can picture that it was engineering calculus. So have the professor who wrote the book, he thinks he's have the perfect way to explain a, how something is done. Not necessarily always true. Oh, my, my first uh, economics class in a junior college in Hutchinson, Kansas, the professor physically memorized the book got up onto the front of the board, wrote the book out, just verbatim, just word for word. And it's like, Ouch. interesting. Well, that's a junior college, but I don't know, you know, he, he was making a living. So Emily, you would continue to inspire me. I love the origami. I love the, the engagement. I'm, again, the tools that you're doing. But again, tonight at, what, at five o'clock in Pacific, what is it your time? Because I want you to see John learn to cook be eight o'clock it'd be eight o'clock for emily hey john you're on watching me learn to cook will be dangerous yeah but uh that the, the joy of professors and roscoe will get this is what i liked about you you get a textbook and the professor's greatest desire is to rearrange the chapters by which they're presented <laughs> so True. so emily i i i what what i find interesting is with the with older youth that i would deal with sometimes is they, I have a, and I, it's out on YouTube and I'll, I'll go find the link and stuff it out there. We had a young lady who explains some of the interest because she is actually on the Annapolis high school sailing team. And she showed some of the intricacies of how you do s certain types of sailing. Um, and she clearly had some help from, I don't know if it was her dad or from, somebody else but on a second boat you could hear her talk but she was actually sailing on the boat and she was you know maybe 150 feet away from the camera so you could see all the stuff that she was doing and then she'd cut the slides and she would explain with pictorially what she was doing she put this all together herself and she's yeah the kids do better than than the adults when it comes to content creation they're just they figure out what they want to look at and then they make it look that way. And, you know, if they stumble through it the first time, the second time they get better at it. Um, the, uh, I, shoot, I was just going to say something totally lost it. Um, but the origami and STEM thing, like people, we had to do virtual girls rock STEM this year and we've never done that before. Obviously we've been in person and it was like, what can we show over the internet that, you know, they can participate in and be engaged in. And the interesting thing was when I showed the girls my slides and I had one slide and it was like everyday things that you deal with that were influenced by origami. They were like, Oh, like I asked them what, <laughs> you know, what do you do right now that has origami in it? And they were like, Oh, nothing. And I'm like, uh, 
think about it for a second. And then they looked at the stuff and they were like, oh yeah. And they came up with some ideas. Did, um, you, pro did you provide them with papers? No, I did. So what I tell them and one of the scientists, one of the mathematicians that I quote in my slideshow is the reason that origami is so great is because you really don't need a specific paper as long as it's not like construction paper. So I tell the kids, like I make these guys, like out of every time I get a wrapper from candy, I make a little, <laughs> you know, <laughs> crane out of it just cause it's like a fidget thing that I do now. Um, so I told them to prepare to bring eight pieces of paper that were all the same size. And it could be, and I went through like wrapping paper, magazine paper, or notebook paper or whatever, as long as you can fold it at least four times. So they had to be able to fold it four times over in order to make the thing we were making. Now, if they were going to make a sculpture with a dragon out of one piece of paper, then they were going to need the rice paper because you need the thinner paper to be more detailed. Um, but it was just, it was really cool because they were, they were really into it and they didn't realize how much it influences things and all these robots. And, um, mm. there was a pill that I showed them that MIT developed that you swallow and then use magnets to send the different parts of the body. And then it unfolds and it's like an origami wrapper that unfolds. And then this little robot folds itself and walks around and it can take samples of tissue. So if you have like a polyp or something, it can like go over and like pinch off a piece and then they collect it. <laughs> um, as later. long as they don't think about where it is at the time, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it was just like, they were like, oh my God, you can do that. And I was like, well, it's still, you know, out there, but yeah, there, that's what these things are. And so, you know, and I said to them, if you, if you learn origami and just have basic folds down, then when you're faced with another problem in your life and you're trying to make something happen, you might look at that problem differently. And it might be a f the way you fold clothes to sew it, you know, like it, it can be applied in all these different places you wouldn't think of. And they were like, Oh, so I had, I had the best turnout of the, the, uh, group. I had the most people sign up for my group, which was fun. Cause I wasn't sure anyone would sign up. Cause there was like heart dissection, like live heart dissection. And someone else did like scuba diving something or other. And I don't know, I was like, mine's kind of lame compared to the other ones. And then I had the most participants. <laughs> so well, like, it, but it, it's also the most hands-on, right? I mean, yeah. approachable. I mean, the, 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 that's, that's the key thing. And we, we did it. We didn't talk about it from an origami standpoint. I did one a couple of weeks ago with some older youth. We were, we were talking about the perseverance and the fact that the engineering design, I mean, if you think about it, the perseverance is a good example of, of mechanical origami because how it had to get packaged and then unfold. It's, you know, the end, it just simple. The dish antenna is a, is an example of origami. It, it, it folds up into something that looks like an umbrella and then it, 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 it expands like a petal like a series of petals on a flower, right? Yeah, in, in my presentation on, I think it's like slide 10, nine or 10, 10 11, somewhere in there, there's a um, star shade that they've, they've built theoretically, but basically what it does is you can bring it up in a spaceship, pop it out of the spaceship. It makes this huge shield so that you can take telescope, telescopic pictures of other galaxies because it blocks out the light from the sun. So right. all the light pollution and it's like this little tiny thing when it goes in the spaceship, I mean, it's not tiny, tiny, but considering the size that it gets to when it blows up all the way, the kids were like, you can do that. That's so cool. <laughs> I was like, I was, yeah, I was exactly thinking of that example. I'm so glad you brought it up and you used it. But I also was thinking about when my kids were being taught Latin in the classical education system. And I thought, what? That's crazy. That's so antique. That's so. Oh, no, it's That's not. Oh, no, it's not. I, no. Okay. I'm a believer. Peter, to your <laughs> point, I was converted. And consequently, the logic that was being taught, the, this, the solution skills that, that it gives. Well, you. not only, not only that, but it's and the evolutionary skills, right? How many languages? Anyway, that, that's Latin? a big word. How many, la how many languages are based upon the Latin? romantic? Yes. Yes. The romantic language. That's true. Yes, exactly. So Real yes. Quick. Michael Fraley, you're asking how to fade to black when uh, you don't have a switcher. Watch my camera real quick. <laughs> <laughs> Lovely work, Roscoe. Hey, Emily, Jeff were you talking about the James Webb telescope? 
Let me see which one I, because there are multiple ones. That I think that James yeah. Webb does something like that for. Yeah, sitting. that's the one that's been delayed basically for a decade and a half. Yeah. By the time they're ready to launch it, uh, Starship will probably be able to lift something bigger. Yeah. This well, is actually, it could lift it without folding it. Yeah. So Richard, you're coming in five or six dB too hot. I can't share my screen again, but um, it's a star shade and um, it's the link is in. Oh, you no, should be good to Thanks, go, Mickey. Emily. Yep. <laughs> yeah, there's a new one where they plan to put the um, the telescope something like 100,000 kilometers away from. Yeah, that's it. That's it. Uh, yep, 100,000 kilometers away from the, the actual telescope itself. But that's so that they can blot out a star that's in the field of vision of the telescope. Right. Yeah. Wow, that is really hot, isn't it? Yeah, still four or five too hot. Yeah, I'll turn down a bit more, mate. And I've and still got to turn little, my lights back on. This is the little uh, uh, digestible robot. It comes as a pill and then it unfolds itself and they can use magnets to take it where they need to <laughs> go inside the body, which I think is awesome. But there he goes. Look at him. <laughs> He's so tiny. <laughs> Um, but the kids were pretty impressed with that one. They liked that. Did being they give a, it a scalpel? Being over, being over 50, that would be a useful thing. I just, though the prep work is probably the same, whether it's a normal colonoscopy or the little robot ca crawling inside. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure what I walked into. Does anybody know that Alex give us, sent out a link for the noon discussion on... Uh, Adreno. I think he's leaving it in place. Yeah, I didn't plan to change them. Well, okay, so I, I, I didn't send it to Roger. So, yep. so it would be this link. Yep. Okay. I'll send you a message on. on Discord as well, uh, Alex. Okay. And on the chat links, I went ahead and scraped from the seven to 10 o'clock hour. So if, uh, and I'll mention that to Benjamin if he wants to scrape from here on. Yeah. Can I get some thoughts and feedbacks? I now have an extra rim light over here. So I've got ones coming in from behind. So without the fill from the front, it's either side lit up. I think it I think it looks fine. I mean Alex is the expert on the panel, right? <laughs> I just thought I'd try something different. I had the light and I was waiting to put a proper globe in it, but I had to find its barn doors and put them on. I think you'd uh, look better without keying anything. Hang on. Let me just re grab a mouse. I'm going to pop out. Thanks, guys. It's good to see you. Have Thank a good you, rest Emily. of your show. Awesome. Great work. <laughs> Always. Yeah, if I had the black background up, I would leave the key off. I think Emily is miscast. Meaning she could, if she was in some place where she have a broader sense of influence, she could do a whole lot more, to be honest. Well, to ask her to go ahead and start her own clubhouse, I just thought, she's the perfect person to do that and that she did it she's yeah. she is casting and then she is writing her own story which i think this is what this environment this community is allowing us to do is is to find ourselves and and be encouraged by one another yeah i i don't know how to do this well neither does anybody else <laughs> especially clubhouse yeah i've been i've been pondering how you know come come back to you alex's how would we do something like this for young adults? Um, given that there are certain laws that we have to worry about, right? I mean, we, we've got Benjamin on and we always have to be careful about that stuff because that stuff actually, unless we have a talent release form, we're, we've got a problem. Hey, Ray, uh, you want to do a quick check?
Yes, uh, how's this? Testing one, two, three. Ray Maxwell from Vancouver, BC. And it looks to me like I'm coming in in the right ballpark. What uh, do you think? Uh, just uh, come up a DB or two. Tiny nudge up. I like the blue hair, Ray. Oh, I don't know what's oh, yeah. causing it. <laughs> oh, that may be my shampoo. Testing Chris, one, two, three. Chris Oops. Comfort, did you, uh, you want to do a, ch a check? Yeah, check one, check two, coming in from uh, East Village, New York City. Uh, looks fine to me. Yeah, it looks like you're there. Maybe just a, a DB up, it's the smallest nudge up. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. And Mark Hadley, I don't know if uh, you wanted to join the panel, but you had your hand up earlier. So if you are, please turn on your camera. Uh, if you do want to stay, please turn on your camera. And uh, if not, we'll put you back to attendee. So Mickey, I don't think you need to shorten your chain too much on on your feeding it to Clubhouse. I mean, it wasn't too bad from my at least listening to it. Cause it's literally coming from the other side of the world, if you think about it, from you, if you're the one feeding it. Oh uh, yeah. Well it's not the most efficient uh chain that I could uh no, set up I, for this. So I understand yeah. that, but I was like I said, when I stepped away for a minute. I, I switched for a while to just listening on the YouTube on my on my iPhone. And then I saw the notice that you were on Clubhouse and switched over to that. And it was clearly closer to real time. And when I walked upstairs and before I switched my camera on, I was still listening. It was darn near real time as far as my ear was going. You know, you were almost it was almost an echo until I could till I turned off Clubhouse. Whereas, gotcha. you, whereas YouTube is definitely several seconds, if not minutes, out of sync. Yeah, um, well, it's an ever-evolving thing, I think, with everything office hours. Maybe I missed it. Somewhere there needs to be something in uh, in the Discord on what is the, what are the, you know, inexpensive more expensive and alex level styles of hooking an iphone into clubhouse for use on clubhouse in the evening because i know i don't have the right mic right now yeah for well for me i'm just using an an irig oh which is i'm just shipping out the line level out of an interface and uh going... and are you doing that are you doing that right now we're still waiting. I'm just uh, checking yes, to see if Mark and Steve might be having a technical issue, so we'll see. Yeah, um, I'm, I'm, but are I'm you uh, that now? Mm -hmm. And it's going out. And, and how many people are, are, are? Is there anybody listening? There was like five people earlier, but now mm -hmm. there is. It's all me alone in the room at the yeah, moment. I, I was in there for. I was in there. I was in there for about an hour or so, Alex, just to because that was. I had to take care of some other things. So I had to step away for a while, but we haven't really promoted it much either. So it's been one of those things that we're just trying to turn it on, see if it works. Um, yeah. so, so could I take, so could I take the, the analog output of my mix pre and feed it into the iRig? Is that for the mic? Is that what I would do? With the right cable, you can. Oh, Cause, yeah, because <laughs> the iRig, there's there's one that either takes a, a what do you call this, a quarter inch uh, TS because it's expecting a guitar input, um, and there's another iRig with a XLR input. So you just need to have the right cable to go from uh, the mini jack to either of the two. Okay. All right. Sounds like a trip to Amazon Prime. Yeah. <laughs> Alex, they're not coming the, oh, three or four it, times it, a week to your house if you can I'm if you shocked. can add uh uh they're in okay cool oh no i no, no if you can add mark harder i think is trying to get in 
Mark was here earlier, but he didn't open his camera. But no, maybe it wasn't. It was Mark. a different Mark. Different Mark. So, okay. so Ray, you think your 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 shampoo is reflecting the light in an odd way? <laughs> I I think it's the blue monitor on my right. <laughs> <laughs> and Alex Hunter Hugh Munzel test. Yes, no. Sorry, say that again. Oh, I haven't done it yet. No, I'm. <laughs> The hard part for me is that there that there is a uh, a between between office hours and work there's a very small amount of time so anything outside of office hour and work tends to take a long time for me to get to because it also competes with little things like my family so so um, so it, uh, there's a lot of things that I would love to do more of you know like getting into some of the challenges that we do and everything else and it's just usually caught up in there's already you know basically 14 hours a day that are is kind of accounted for so. And then there's like six that I have to waste on sleeping, you know, little things like that. So. Hello, Mickey. This is Mark. Uh, one, two, three, four, five. Trying out the uh, riding the brand, the pulse and into the tech rise and trying to give you a little more. And one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Yeah, just give us the tiniest, the tiniest one, two, three. one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. The ballpark there. Thank you very much. Is my level okay now, uh, Mickey? I, I'm showing about the right level here. Uh, yeah, it, it's just, I think when you, uh, get excited it jumps quite to quite a bit your level's fine you have a very yellow light coming at you from the stage left side whatever's your key light from that side the other side looks like a window like looks like daylight but that's even more yellow than tungsten no it's it's a monitor i've got a uh monitor on my right here and i do have a uh swedish globe on my left which is yeah is is a warmer light there's no question and i i've i've turned up the saturation on my camera and i think that's why everybody's seeing that today that's that's my next goal is to work on my lighting yeah, it just was causing me to go get somebody to gel that light. <laughs> it's like that's my obsession. No, yeah. needs about half a stop of CTB. I just figured you took a dare from a grandchild somewhere. <laughs> Ray, what are you shooting? What's the camera again? And you're using the seven, the X seven? Uh, no, this is the this is the Brio. No, 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 the on your on your uh, drone. Oh yeah, it's an X seven. Yes, the drone's an X seven, and and I'm happy to announce, I have a Blackmagic six K Pro in the mail on its way to me. You put it on a. Are you going to put it on a drone? No. No, that's going to be for my terrestrial work. And, Big uh, drone. Put it, give it some wings. Put it on a drone. Is the, the new Black what? Magic is actually heavier too, right? The camera's physically bigger, I know. It's a yeah. little bigger. The thing that's really heavy with all, all of that arrangement is the lenses, not the camera. The camera's only two and a half pounds or something, but the lenses, you know. Well, plus powering it for more than five minutes, even with lithium. Yeah. Minutes. <laughs> yeah. Because they do suck a lot of power. Don't you want a real wide-angle pancake on a drone, though? Well, I, I have four prime lenses for mine, ranging from now to Super 35, and it, I range from 16 to uh, 50 millimeter. So one and a half times that for, you know, full-frame equivalent. And, Ray, what's been your experience in the last few months with your Mac Pro, have you had any more issues? No, no, none at all. And uh, I'm, 
I'm wondering what uh, they're going to do when uh, the uh, M1X or whatever comes out. Are they going to have an upgrade path for us, or are they going to go to a totally different machine? Yeah, I know how I would do it. I mean, that extra, what do they call that? The uh, programmable gate array that they... The afterburner. Yeah, the an afterburner, afterburner with four or five M1s or M2s. <laughs> I mean... Wow. That slot's wide open on my on my Mac Pro, and I could just see sliding in a, something with some M1s in it to make it go to the next step, if you will, without having to throw everything out with the bathwater. Oh, Stuart? Yeah, just for you and Ray, I'm putting a link in the chat. Um, Merck FPV recently put a Komodo on a sub X-Class drone. Uh, so... It's um, worth watching for the size of the thing and the footage that they get out of it. It's um, I'm guessing that's not, not the sort a of thing you want to drone. fly near a crowd, though. Now, Stuart, the, the background now really accentuates the fact that it's a key because you can see the black edges around, especially your hand. If you lift your hand up when you had your hand up. Yeah, it's something I'm doing for a family thing. I'll probably swap it back in a second. <laughs> That'd be great. <laughs> but what I was trying to do is actually get the CG lights to match the reflections I was getting on my skin, whatever you said. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's not that hard to change. It's just a matter of that. Yeah. It's a little stark as far as the background goes. Um, composite's still a little hard on the edge. Still looks a little CG. Yeah, I need more light on the green screen. Sir, are means. you doing are you doing any attenuation on your levels after the microphone? Uh, you're muted. Yeah, when I came back in, the mic level was high on WLM. Is it well I'm looking there, I'm seeing twenty two, twenty three, and maybe it's a little further away from me. Yeah, but uh, I mean in your audio chain, are you doing any attenuation after the microphone? Only a very small amount. Uh, nothing that you should actually be able to hear. Uh, it's just, it's brought down the device volume from 100% to 94% in vMix because it seems to clean it up just a little bit. But as like I said, I do have original sound switched off at the moment because I've got fans running for a rendering PC. Yeah, it just sounded like it was it was clipping earlier. When you when you project a bit more, it, uh... speaking speaking of sound, how hmm. hard is it for you to set up? Since we're waiting for Mark here, uh, how how hard is it for you to set up the little demo that you did before? Ooh, uh, ten minutes to fire everything up. Okay. <laughs> um. It's just interesting. I think people would enjoy that. Th that record was uh, it's pretty slick, I must say. We'll see if we have time in the end of it. While we're waiting for Thanks. Mark, let's go. If you have any other general resolve things we want to discuss while we're, while we're, while we're doing that. Um, Charles, I saw that you said uh, you asked the Ray if he had any experience with HDR and NIT level. What do you feel is the where the monitor market will settle? Do you have any opinions? Well, I, 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 on just TVs that the public are buying, I think they're going to settle somewhere between 1,000 and 2,000 nits, be my guess, just because of the technology. Now, it may go up, but the other thing is, my gosh, a 1,000 nit screen, if you're sitting anywhere near it, is pretty bright. and uh, Suntown you know, territory. Yeah, and I, I can't see us going to 10,000 nits, man. I'd have to wear sunglasses to watch. But uh, on the monitor, uh, you know, I'm talking about the uh, uh, grading monitor. I don't know, right? I mean, I'm happy with the XDR at this stage. You think somebody would come out with a like a skin oh, is the, tone? Is, is, is the XDR is the XDR 1600? Is that right? That's now to be fair, that's peak. its maximum peak. Right. Now I, I keep mine set for most of my general work. I keep it set at 500. Okay. Mm -hmm. You know, the thing that I really like about it is it's switchable, but when I go to grade an XDR, 
thing. Then I switch it up to the HDR level, which mm-hmm. it has a HDR P3 setting. Right. Yeah. Charles? Yeah. I was interested what Ray thought about it because I was actually on the phone with Flanders considering the XM310 and there's been a run on the XM310s. They're all now backordered. They went from having stock to none. And, uh, for f- by the way, uh, Mickey, uh, sorry, uh, uh, Steve Martin's in there. He, he hasn't raised his hand, but he's, Copy. he's, he's there. Yep. Oh, okay, good. Yeah, and and um, and those have a max of a uh, three thousand at a, I believe, uh, a ten percent or twenty percent window. So I found it interesting that those in particular are now you know four weeks out or six weeks out. Right. Yeah, I've seen a four thousand nit monitor. Um, it was really expensive. Yeah, the pulsar. Yeah, the pulsar, and it's like I mean, it hurts. It, it yeah, it was like I don't know if I'd really want to work at that level. You know that like it it is especially in a darker room. I think that's part of the problem is that you we saw it in kind of a medium gray room, you know, with it kind of dark, and it it was painful. Like it was it actually did was not a comfortable experience. Go ahead, Richard. Um, I'm coming more from an onset and DOP experience. And I would say a lot of the guys I work for would be very happy at the 500 level. Like most of these guys are going to cut and clip and control their footage up to that point. I'm not sure what it's like when you get into final grade, Charles and Ray, Mm -hmm. but yeah, the guys I'm working for are probably pretty happy at the 300 to 500 level. It's already 400s already two stops brighter than what they're used to working at. And anything more than that, they tend to look at as excessive on set at least. So yeah. and hey, how will you be able to grade on, the, on your laptop on the beach? I'm, I'm confused. <laughs> hey, Steve. Uh, yeah, we're, um, we're just, we're chatting. We're, we're chatting HDR. Morning, everyone, or afternoon, or wherever you guys are. It's good to see everyone. Yeah, good to see you good too. To see you. Should we? Are we expecting Mark as well? Or just, you know, it's, it fun, just... it's funny. I, um, I think we got our wires crossed. It's uh, you know, he <laughs> he was taking his wife in town in San Francisco for breakfast, so he just anyway. So he won't be joining us, but I'm here. Excellent, excellent. Let's. We don't have a ton of questions, so I think it could sure, go we're relatively we're quick. We, yeah. um, it, it may, it may, uh, un, it may unleash itself um, as we. Uh, uh, as, as we start to answer questions, but we'll, uh, we'll see how it goes. Uh, go ahead, uh, Bill. Let's go ahead and um, go through it. All right. Our first highest rated question comes from John Puitt of Huntersville. And when editing audio, how do I judge what is too loud or too soft? Is it is a fairly subjective, is it fairly subjective or is there an objective standard? I noted that the training preferred the windy background to be much louder than I would have preferred, for example. I guess it depends what you mean by standard. I mean, in the for a long time, it was, you know, you're, you're using um, a DBF scale, um, digital full scale. And basically, I mean, anyone can here can chime in that deals with audio. I mean, we're, there's one method is, is, is judging the volume level by DBFS, but over recent years, more and more uh, platforms want a LUF standard like uh, LUFS. So you gotta be kind of monitoring both. But what I was doing is in the tutorial is, is saying, okay, here's where dialogue should fall on the DBFS scale. Here's where, and, and I said somewhere between, I think minus, minus uh, between minus 12 and six with the peaks at minus six, but the average around minus 12. And then, I, and then I gave another standard for where sound effects should fall and then where music should fall. But those are just general. I mean, usually if you're delivering to someone specific, a broadcaster, they'll have a they'll have a Bible that says this is this is where your audio for each of those elements should fall: dialogue, music, and effects. So in the tutorial, I'm saying like in general, this is where dialogue should fall if you're delivering for Netflix. Excuse me, if you're dealing for YouTube or you're dealing if you're outputting for uh, for the web or what have you. So it's it's kind of a general. Um, uh, approach for, for for levels. Yep, Mickey, do you want to add anything to that? Yeah, exactly what Steve uh, mentioned. Each each place you're delivering to will have their own specs that you that you would need to hit, and these specs are either most of the time they're they're lofts, and either they're measuring the entire program as a whole, or mm-hmm. some delivery platforms uh, require you to 
um, to meter only dialogue and everything else mixes around dialogue and dialogue anchors everything together. Well, and there's a, there's a lot of drama around that. I think, uh, with loudness, you know, I, I've talked to a couple of designers that, that get frustrated because they say that, you know, like if you're looking at, at Luffs, that the problem is, is that you get into the situation where the average, if you play in music, for instance, the average is much higher than a dialogue, you know, that, you know, like it's so, you know, so, so the thing is the kind of music, and then it starts pressing the music, a music portion down or something that's got a lot of content in it is actually getting pushed to a quieter zone because of this arbitrary number. Go ahead, Mickey. Yeah, definitely. Like, uh, I, I really like how um, Netflix, uh, I think a, two years ago, shifted to uh, measuring dial norm, which is essentially you look at the dialogue and everything mixes around that. And I like that because like, if you're, say, mixing uh, an action-packed film versus a film that is mostly like a, like a walk-and-talk rom-com or something, uh, the action pack film, generally speaking, if you're measuring the whole program as a whole, will sound quieter than the rom-com because you have more material in there if you're also measuring your effects and music together um, right. with the dialogue. So I really like when, when you anchor it with dialogue because it just means like a loud film will actually play louder and a quiet film will actually play quieter. Bill? Also, there are more tools coming out all the time to help you do an objective measurement of audio levels. I know I, since I work in Final Cut, uh, Klangfund has a, a, a level meter set that gives you all the momentary peaks, the averages, and it will tell you, it'll give you a readout on your soundtrack based on that. And even more uh, consumer friendly things like Crumble Pop has a level Matic, where if nothing else, you can set a dB target level based on what the station or the broadcaster tells you. And it will make sure you don't exceed that. They're, you're useful if you don't want to get too deep in the weeds. Yep. Next question. Moving on to Robert Harvey of Fairfax, Virginia, and Robert asks, uh, any way to use voiceover and still see the video playing? It seems like it's done in Fairlight, and I'd like to see the video I might be commenting on. Um, let's see here. Yeah, you, you should be able to see it. I'm going to, uh, let me go ahead. I'm, let me just see one sec. I'm going to pull this up. Um, just so you guys know, um, I think I need to share my screen only because um, I don't have my ATEM running today. I, I, move, mm -hmm. I move my whole setup upstairs, so I'm gonna, sh I'm gonna, if you don't mind, I'll just share my screen really quick. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, okay, so you guys see this? Hopefully, you see this. Okay, so uh, see, I don't know if you guys see here, but this little panel up here, you should see the little um, video. A box up here. This is this is the reference video that's coming from the edit page. Okay, so I'm, I have my mix here, and so there it is. And I, I, I there's I don't see why you can't see it while you're recording it. So what I did in the video is I, as I set up, I think I've I, I created a track and recorded the the voiceover into it. But as you record, and you're looking at the video right here, it does, the screen doesn't go black, so I'm not really understanding the question because there, there's your video monitor right there. Unless maybe you're seeing something else or maybe this is closed or you have this like, you know, yeah, you could have it. Put some, I think it somewhere else, you know what I'm saying? So it's, it's always there. How do you set it to a default layout just in case to make sure that it's there? Um, just good question. Just go to uh, workspace reset UI la la layout. Mm -hmm. And that should bring you to the, there, there's your default. And what it does is it, it turns it turns a bunch of stuff off, like the media pool, and it just it's what it does. The default for or Fairlight is it maximizes the timeline, uh, so you have the you know the most area for your tracks because apparently you're going to be working with up to up to two thousand tracks, and mm -hmm. you need as much real estate as you can can get. But to answer the question, it's right there. There's no reason why you shouldn't be able to record and actually see the video right there. That's great. Next question. Next question. Chris Comfort here in the panel, and our friend says, uh, with automation, does a lane only show up after you've written some automation for a particular plugin setting? Also, is there only one shape of automation node, a square? All right, so the question has to do with, actually, um, I'm going to share my screen again. Um, 
just trying to think. I sort of at, answered my own question between the time I typed it and the time that you came on today. Yeah. Using the pen tool. So yeah, you can I was going to say like, that. And also those tracks, if you're creating a set, if those, uh, if you're, um, those extra buses that you would like doing automation, they won't show up until you actually toggle the automation button right. on. Right. I mean, but even toggling it on and then selecting it on the left drop down on the, uh, the track header, I guess you're calling that. Right, um, right. And then you've got to still use the pen tool and draw something first and you'll just right. nodes and a line will show up. My other part of my question though, was those nodes, if you zoom in on them, they're kind of squarish only. Like when you start moving a single node around, like I tend to do things with a mouse more than a, a fader movement. Mm -hmm. um, and in other DAWs, you can right click on that node and tell it to be, rather than being squared off to the next node, you can have a linear, uh, like a, interpolated from one node to the next or like a Bezier curve from one node to the next. And I'm not looking for Bezier necessarily, but even just a linear interpolation that's a diagonal or something. Yeah, I that's just, a fear screen, but I, I, I'd have to do a little bit more about research on that. I, I right. don't do a lot of automation, but um, so I'd have to defer that question till next time. Okay. But, but yeah, I, I'm just curious. Sure yeah. Yeah. yeah, I was just curious. Uh -huh. Great. Next question. Christina Borer says, I love being able to solo audio tracks just to hear just that track. Is there a way to solo video tracks so that I only see that track? This would be especially helpful for virtual choirs where the playback is jumpy due to the high number of video tracks. Um, I think you can, can't you solo, um, can't you solo a, a track itself? I th think, go ahead, Charles. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, for the video, I actually use it all the time when I'm in the color page, because if you can see your timeline in the color page, all the way to the right, you see all your little tracks and the little V1, V2, V3. Mm -hmm. If you click on it, it's going to go gray, which then it's going to make disappear all the clips that have to do with that track. But there's also something cool that you can leave them up, but then not have them show up so you can click on them. If you option click on them, that V1 will turn red, which comes in very, very handy. So that is one way when I'm color grading a large, um, massive clips, I will turn things off that I don't need. And then I just have the clips that I'm looking at just to make sure. So if you go all the way to the left-hand side, the V1, V2, V3, whatever, if you click on them, they'll go gray. And then you could just view what you wanna see. Next question. And it comes from Charles Klein. Uh, how does mixing and monitoring surround in Fairlight compare to others like Pro Tools and so forth? Well, I'm definitely, that question is outside my pay grade because I have not done any surround mixing so far in, in Resolve. I, I tell you how it works in Final Cut, but I, I haven't done anything in Resolve uh, surround yet, so. Mickey, do you have any opinion? Uh, I haven't really played around that much in terms of the monitoring capabilities within uh, Resolve, but from uh, you know, from from playing around with it just a little bit, um, I would say if you want complete like really deep control of your monitoring uh, routes and and paths, uh, you can get that easier in Pro Tools. While in Fairlight, it tries to because um, they have terminal their own terminologies for for your monitoring sections like you have your your main and you have your they, you have more control in pro tools that's that's what I, at least i can say from from you know from just looking at it they've also speaking of which since and mickey you mentioned the word main so in a typical mixing environment you deal with mains and subs and oxes you guys know what i'm referring to like on a mixer right well just so you know uh uh black magic's changed that okay so there's what they call fixed busing and they have a new thing called um flex busing so i should point this out because it's something you're going to run into so um just want i i i really i think this is worth worth uh worth showing you so I'm going to go share my screen again. Okay, so I'm, I'm here and you'll notice that, um, just so you can see, I'm going to say I have to show you this. 
So I'm going to go back to the project manager and I'm going to open up this. This is the, this is the actual project that you're working on for the tutorial. And you'll notice when you go up to the uh, Fairlight menu and you go into bus format, you're going to set up your buses. You'll know at the top, it'll say main, sub, aux. And this is what you worked with in the tutorial. You I had you create a bunch of sub, sub buses, right? Well, now let me go back to the settings menu and I'm going to create, I'm going to open this one called Flexbus. You'll notice if you open a project from scratch, you know that you create a brand new project. Not, you're not opening, opening a previous one, but a brand new one. If you go up to Fairlight and go to bus, check this out. Um, let's see. Notice now that there is no, there is no, mains, subs, oxes, what have you, they're now just, um, they're now just called buses, bus one, bus two, bus three, bus four. And the idea is it's flexible. You don't, they're not naming them for you can send any track to any bus and any bus to any other bus. So they, they essentially removed all this ter terminology of main, sub, ox. And the rate, why this is important is if somebody gives you a, if you're working on a project someone gave you, if it was originally mixed in the fixed bus system, you can't change it. You're stuck with a fixed bus system. But when you create a new project, you'll have the flex bus system. So I discovered it really at the, at the end of the day, it works pretty much the same. It's just that it's how they're naming the buses. So I, so when you're gonna run into this as you use Fairlight, you're gonna like, wait, wait, I got a project and before it was main aux subs and now I open a new one and there's none of that anymore. It's just, but it's just subs. So, or just, um, yeah, just buses. It'll just say bus one, bus two, bus three. So, anyway, I just felt that was important for you guys to know because you, you'll, you'll run into it in the future. All right, so. so I'm just trying to see if we have anybody else I can. Oh, go ahead, Charles. Yeah, so a quick, a, a quick question. So for the buses, is that, <clears throat> can you assign then, a stereo pair or front and back or like surround? Is that how that works? Well, the buses, if you hit, I'm right, is my screen still being shared? Yes, you're still shared. Okay, so, so the, the way the busing works is it gives you a lot of flexibility in your mix. So for example, if I open this up here, I don't know if you can see all the buses. So I created I created separate buses. Like for example, you can see I have a, so first of all, I have, I have all these dialogue tracks, all these effects tracks, all these music tracks, and I wanna control them as one unit. So instead of, instead of me adjust, adjusting all the faders for all these individual tracks, I send them to a bus. So I set up these buses, um, basically in this case, I call, call the buses, um, uh, you know, when I call them like uh, SF1, FX2, and then what I do is I send those tracks to those buses. So when you, and it's really simply, it says bus outputs, you just click plus, and you say, all right, I wanna send it to the effect sub, or the, they, by the way, these were my naming conventions. So I then set, I set it to the sub, and then I set the subs back to whatever main is the output. So then I can then control all of those effects as one unit with one slider, right? So basically it sets me up for my stems, it sets me up for applying effects to one bus instead of effects to each individual track. So it gives me a lot of flexibility so I can send content from one bus to another and I can then uh, monitor the output of a bus, right? And then what's also nice is up here at the top, I didn't cover this in my video, but under this viewer here, this is great. Right now I have it monitoring my main, but you can tell it, oh, monitor my effect sub or my dialogue sub or my music sub, you can tell Fairlight, what to actually monitor. So, but right now it's set up for main. The main means what the, the entire the entirety of my mix is being sent to the main bus, which is way over here. And you can see that here. It says main. I've, I've got a. I have, I have it disabled right now. Here, let me just do this here. See, what's nice is I. This is another reason for color coding things is I can quickly see. You can color code every bus, every track, and say, oh, these two dialogue tracks are being sent to the main. Oh, look at that. These two effects tracks are being sent to the effects sub. And you can quickly see the color tagging and it's really flexible and it makes it really visual uh, for you know sending your, your audio um, here and there. Good, uh, Sky. Yeah. Hey, Steve. 
So yeah. as a video editor, I guess my, my brain is trying to translate this into a language that I'm familiar with. So mm -hmm. I, I'm starting to feel these are kind of like not mix downs because that's a flattened file that you can't un unflat. And I mean, that's a single new, new, new element. Mm -hmm. So what you're doing is these are more like uh, what consolidations in After Effects or what do they call them in, in Media Composer? And what do we, you know? Well, I, I, here's what I like to, I like to use this analogy. Yes, please. You, you use a mixer. Think about audio is like plumbing and you have water going through different pipes. You know, one pipe is your dialogue. Another pipe is your music and effects. And you can have, let's, you can have 10 dialogue tracks, a hundred. They're just pipes. And what you're doing in the mixer is you're routing the router to different, you're routing that signal to different pipes. That's all you're doing. So, and you're getting, the pipes give you a lot of control. For example, I, I can create a, a submix of just reverb. Now think about this. And then I can then send all my dialogue tracks just to that submix and then have the reverb on that. So I'm not applying the reverb to all those individual tracks. I'm applying it to the sub, right? So it, first of all, it, it, it helps processing. So the processors doesn't have to deal with all those individual tracks with the reverb on it. It's only processing one track with the reverb on it. Does that make sense? Yeah. So, so really that reverb track with that bus now, I can then mix it in relation. So I can now, and this is what's great about busing is that with that reverb on that one bus, I can mix the wet signal with the dry signal. So I can now say, I want this much reverb on this bus and I can control how much reverb I then apply to those things that are being fed into it. Does that make sense? You're good. Yep. Very and, helpful. Uh, Thank you. And Mickey? Yeah. Mickey? Oh, yeah. Just going back to Charles's uh, question earlier about uh, routing. Yeah, you can go into the preferences of Resolve, mm -hmm. go to video and audio IO, and that is where you can set up your speaker arrangement. You can set it to 5171. I haven't played around with it in terms of Atmos yet, but once you select your, your monitoring format, you just get a list here of you assign which actual physical output on your interface the left channel is, the right, the center channel is, the right channel, um, and so forth. And in terms of busing, like when you're doing, uh, you know, film work or TV work, it's very important to be able to very quickly and easily spread out your mix in terms of your food groups, dialogue, music, and effects. That's an oversimplification of it. You usually end up having, you know, a couple dozen stems uh, for that so that when you go into your final mix, your, your mixing team doesn't end up with, you know, 2,000 tracks. They end up with maybe 100, 200, 300 tracks instead of yeah. thousands. Yeah. Right, next question. Uh, Christina Borer says, um, I popped out the reference video viewer and placed it on the top of the Fairlight panel. But every time I clip, click on the Fairlight panel, it gets sent beneath the panel. How do I keep it up on top? Um, oh, so it got separated from it. And if it's not in another monitor, it's getting pushed behind. I think that's what happened. So if you pop it out, um, pop yeah, out I that think video. she wants to know how to pop it back out. Oh, how to persistently keep it up on the top layer. But it, well, I, don't, I, I don't, don't think that'll help. So? I don't understand the question because my when I pop it out, I don't know if you've seen my screen here, mm -hmm. um, but it's mm -hmm. always um, it's always floating above everything. I don't right, but if you touch your, your timeline now, does that push it behind no. when you touch it? No, it's staying up. So there must yeah, be so some way. Saying, that it would make no sense to go behind a panel because you... <laughs> Sounds like her frustration. Well, yeah. one one of the things, Christina, is let us know whether you're uh, using a Mac or PC. Maybe there's a difference in the build. Um, and also let us know if you're on 16 or 17, um, just to know where we're at uh, related to that. But it it looks like, yeah, the behavior. And this is 17.1. Is that right, Steve? Yeah, I think it's 17. I don't think I've updated yet. But mm -hmm. I don't so that should give you hope, Christina, that it doesn't have to go to the back. Right, right. Yeah. Next question. And she has a second question here. Her next one is, I've been doing most of my audio mixing in Studio One and then importing the mixed tracks into Resolve. Is there any advantage to doing audio mixing in Resolve itself besides skipping the import self it, step? Um, real quick, uh, Mark's in the house now. Just want to let you know, Alex. So you want to let him? Oh, yeah, yeah, Mickey, can you let Mark in? <laughs> oh, and Christina just popped in and said, I'm using a PC Resolve 17. Yeah. I, it, honestly, the, 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 the two... The parity between the Mac and PC should be identical. I, I'd have to see the screen. I, I, it shouldn't be going behind any panels. 
And the only thing I would say about Studio One is I believe the Studio One, in addition to doing, you know, audio editing is also a MIDI, you know, it, it does a lot more to, it has a lot more to it, I believe. And so uh, there's, there's definitely things in there that you probably wouldn't have access to in, inside of uh, Resolve. Go ahead, Chris, and then, and then Mickey. I think obviously for basic mixing, I I can see where Resolve would be just fine. But as a Reaper user myself and former Cubase user, I would need those tools if I was doing any kind of composing or even if I was building my own sound effects where I needed like Reactor or something else or Contact and I was doing some like surgical building or some like compiling myself of sound, sound effects, I'd definitely do that outside of uh, Fairlight and then do it in Reaper and then maybe even bring those into Resolve and drop those newly created things into Resolve and do the rest of it there. But I couldn't do that inside of Resolve for sure. Go ahead, Mickey. Yeah, I would say like the last time I used Studio One was a couple of years ago, but it's a feature set in terms of working with pictures specifically is quite, uh, at that time, it wasn't as developed yet. Like, you know, having to, line things up the time code and such wasn't really uh, something that Studio One did. Good, Charles. And this is just to go back to Christina's question. I actually just launched my project. I'm in 17.1 on a Mac and my window is staying on top of everything, my video window in Fairlight. So it might be a PC thing. Next question. Jason Panks of Nashville, oh. Tennessee. Whoops. Did you need, oh, okay? Says, uh, is there a way to use a physical fader controller with Fairlight? For example, a Personas fader port 16. And what about the human user interface or MCU? That would be the Marvel Comic Universe control. I'm sorry. I just, well, I just you, spaced I, out I, on all MCU. I can say is, uh, Black Magic is a hardware company. They make all kinds of control surfaces. <laughs> they make really expensive ones and smaller ones. And you go to the side, they're, you can spend, I mean, they, they, they have very nice control surfaces for Fairlight. In fact, I just, Fairlight, before it was ever really software, it was all hardware. It was all, I think it was pretty much um, all mixing. It, it was all based on hardware. And it was only recently that they ported it over and made a, a, a software interface out of it. So um, I would say, look on their site. They, they got some great control surfaces for this, for this page. And a lot of times, you know, I've had some dis some great discussions with um, some sound designers uh, that are using a variety of things. Um, and one of the things they talk about is having the physical surface makes you more creative because it's right at your fingertips. I think Charles can probably talk to the you know the the color panel, um, you know, but but having those those tools right there is different than software. In fact. Uh, I one of the persons I was talking to said, "I can tell you whether someone mixed it with a hardware panel or with a with a so in software." because there's a clickety click that happens with hardware that, you know, he said, like, there's a way that you transition and way you do things when you're clicking it that you don't that you don't do when you're mixing it. And he said, and I can I can hear it. And I can but he can tell you the size of the room you were in when you were mixing it as well. Go ahead. Well, uh, Mickey, and then, you, have, you have all these digits, you can be manipulating multiple faders at yeah. once, which you can't in the, the mouse, yeah. obviously. Yeah. Mickey and Charles. Yeah. Yeah, uh, I'm I'm looking at Resolve now, and it seems like you can hook up uh, both Huey and Mackie uh, control to it. Yeah. And you go in, you, in the control panel, excuse me, the settings of Resolve, it gives you, that's where you go and set up all this hardware. It's click the little gear icon. Yep. And go ahead, uh, Charles. Yeah, um, I completely agree with Steve. I wish I had more limbs to work <laughs> on my control panel because I can do two, three things at the same time, and it's responding to me. I don't have to go one by one. I, <clears throat> I can let the creativity of what I'm trying to achieve take over as I'm maneuvering instead of going this thing, then that thing, what slows down the process. So I'm all about the panels. I, I talked to someone about, I was talking to someone about there was this color correction and he goes, well, when you if someone throws you a ball and you go to, <laughs> when you go to catch it, do you think I'm going to lift this arm and then this arm, and then I'm going to move over here? <laughs> because that would, that would be very uncomfortable. And you wouldn't know which one you were supposed to do first if you're doing it one at a time and, and being able to just get to a point where you're, when you get good at it, that you can just do it is, is a big piece of that. Um, ne next question. 
Uh, Ray Maxwell is up next with uh, from Vancouver. I'm getting the studio version of Resolve 17 with my 6K Pro. Somebody said there were differences in the software depending on where you get it. Something about tools delivery being different? The one you get with your, your uh, camera will be fine. Don't download, don't buy it from the App Store. Don't, yeah, that's, don't, that's the key. Yeah, don't buy it from the App Store. You'll be fine. It's the full version. Yeah, it's, so that's 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 the only. Yeah, don't get the one off the app store. So it shouldn't be there, in my opinion. Um, anyway, so uh, uh, but yeah, the, it's pretty awesome that it comes with the camera. We had to buy a bunch of the cameras, and so I so I, I uh, a lot of computers with Resolve on them right now. You're rich in licenses. You, you get you get the software, and then you get a camera. Exactly. Yeah, you buy the software, and then it comes with a yeah, comes with a camera that 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 you can use it with um, the Polaroid model. We don't care about the camera. Just keep buying the film. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Now, have you guys played at all? Have you played much with the? And, and by the way, for everybody, we're gonna we're gonna just riff a little bit uh, before the end of the hour because uh, we don't have any more questions right now. So, um, so the uh, do you, have you guys played with much of the hardware? Have they have they uh, have you had the opportunity to play with much of it, Steve and Mark? Just this. Oh, there we go. Well, that's then that's for the edit page, right? That's for the cut page. It is. It's primarily you could you could use it in the edit page, but it's primarily designed for the cut page to be sure. Yeah, yeah. Make sure ahead, you remember the RF four hundred and fifty, RM four hundred and fifty. I was just saying, Da Vinci. They they loaned me Black Magic loaned me a mini panel back when I did the sixteen color correction because I did a you know full training on how to use a mini panel, and that was awesome. I didn't want to have to send that back because that was <laughs> quite awesome. <laughs> yeah, go ahead, uh, Sky. Working in the color facility at Burbank. I had the opportunity of working on the big panel and uh, that is, it's, it's the Lamborghini. It's got all it's, and as Charles and I've discussed the flexibility of having to en enough arms, it, it almost gets us there because you're, you're, you're doing at least in the color side of things when you're, when you've got the different balls and you're able to move multiple things and multiple, it's almost a 3d experience of what, and I'd, I'd love to hear Charles's definition of that. I think Charles, you were the one that said, you wanted not the big one and not the small one. You wanted you you wanted the Red Riding Hood that was just right or whatever that myth was. So Charles, yeah, I would um, based on the new Resolve, right? That we have the HDR controls. We actually have like blacks and then darks and then shadows and then lights and then highlights and then <laughs> peak brights. I would love a panel that has a ball for RGB and level for all six of those things that would sit between the $30,000 advanced panel and the mini panel that I have here. I think that would be amazing. And I would pay whatever they ask for that because just being able to control those individual things, as you get used to using the panel, you don't think about what you're looking for. You're thinking about what you need and your arm goes to it automatically. Right, so you're just reaching for things. I know where the hue is, the contrast, the pivot. Mm -hmm. And now with 17, I've been doing some HDR and I find myself having to go and click over so I can now get to my highlights and my peaks. And then I have to go back to my shadows and my darks. And it's, it's adding a step, but yeah, I would, uh, that would be a great panel to have. I'm curious if you're, if you're a 3D mouse, function and or <laughs> and or and or foot pedals i'm thinking you know you'll be like an organist at some cathedral somewhere you'll 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 play a sonata completely with your toes i might try to figure something out with the stream deck you know um but but still having just the six controls in front of me i think that would just be amazing and sky I got a ping from goldilocks she's upset that you gave her credit to red riding hood i'm just saying well, you know, Cinderella was right there with a the, with the stick. I was sorry. Sorry, Goldie. And and the thing is, is that it's really fascinating when you get into it. I was in a mixing stage where, I don't know, it's 20 or 30 feet of mix panel you know, of, of control. And uh, and you're like, why would you need all those sliders? But it turns out you have a couple of people working on it and they're all listening to it. And they're all some, different people are accountable for it. You have three or four people at the same time, you know, working on the mix. And, and or you, or even if you're just on a roller on a um on a chair, you're rolling over there and grabbing, you know that this section is the orchestra and that section is the effects. And this section is, you know, and you can grab onto it and it, it, there is a reason to do it. Uh, go ahead, Peter. And then Chris. 
I was just going to make a comment to Charles reference to the Stream Deck. I don't know if that would Stream Deck necessarily lends itself to what you're talking about because that's what you're really talking about is converting analog, an analog motion, into something that will count. And Stream Deck is is for the most part an on-off conversation, yeah. right? Uh, yeah. You push the button and it does something. It doesn't slowly do something yeah. and go back the other direction. I do a lot of work with my stream deck and that I have, I have been confounded by that problem and thought about designing some, getting out the soldering iron, Alex, and building some analog controls. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, go ahead, Charles, and then Chris. Yeah, yeah. Um, not to fade something over time, but actually just to switch from my dark HDR options to my light HDR options. If I could click back and forth on something aside from having to grab the mouse and click on this, it just, you know, slows everything down. Yeah, go ahead, Chris. Uh, is it okay if I ask a, a sound question again or a fair yeah. question? No, absolutely. Um, uh, two little things. First of all, do we know whether the ma the main bus is stereo only or does that go to multi-channel if we wanted to? And my second kind of related question is, is there a licensing thing in Resolve when you buy the, the full version that has to do with the rendering the surround into some kind of like special file or are you just doing a multi-channel a uh, big file output, and then that gets dealt with later. Yeah, I think this latter, it's just you're dealing with multi-channel output. I, I don't believe there's any licensing for how you output. Um, you could send all your tracks over to the uh, deliver page, which we'll talk about more next week. And there's a Pro Tools option there. And you can actually spit out AAC files. Uh, I'm sorry, not AAC, the- um, AAF. AAF. Yes, that whole AAF of every track. You know, and you know, Pro Tools Editor has you know all the little pieces they need, um, which is nice. Or you could spit out individual files of each track. In other words, a traditional spit out the stems of all your tracks using the deliver page. So you could technically give another you know surrounded, or you can give them the you know uh, the center left right LFE track. You can give them that. You can give them as a stem mix, um, right? And well, you can also yeah. I was just wondering if there's a codec or something that is in there somewhere. I don't even know how Atmos works, so forgive my ignorance, but right. I wasn't sure if there was a, a codec that needed to be in there that came, you know, the license for which came with, you know, I don't know where that where that happens. I'm confused yeah. about that. We're all confused about it. Um, you know, so, so it's, it's, you know, like, go, you got Mickey, did you want to say something there? Yeah, I think uh, just to go back to uh, Chris's first question uh, regarding the, the monitoring of the main you could set that up to be a a uh, surround format if if you want and you do that in the preferences of resolve on in the io page yeah. um and regarding uh deliverables uh it depends exactly what you're what you need to spit out like for more traditional like channel based uh, uh deliverables we can just output you know uh either a, a poly poly polyphonic wave file where all the channels is in uh, one file or you can export uh, multiple mono uh, files that you then feed into. Like, say, if you're creating a DCP, um, you feed those individual um, mono files in, into the your DCP authoring software. And what's the DCP off, off, authoring software? Uh, there's there's a bunch of them. I think the 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 more popular one is uh, from from NEC. I think uh, mm -hmm. if I if I recall correctly. Um, but but yeah, when when you need to create the the actual packages that go out to cinemas, then you just, most of them just require individual mono files unless you are delivering Atmos, where you you need the, an Atmos uh, mastering suite to do that. Right, and the Atmos mastering suite for cinema is expensive, right? I mean, it's a piece of hardware. Yeah, it's hardware plus uh, certification from Dolby. I think that's what costs more. <laughs> right. Well, they don't and, let you touch it without a license. I mean, there's a there's a difference between like building something for everyone to listen to and putting it in a cinema because the for every cinema that supports Atmos, they're actually um, they model that cinema. So there's a, there's someone who comes in to certify it that actually models how it handles audio. So where all the speakers are, the reverberance, like how it sounds, and then that has to be synced with what you're putting out so that so that and, and so that that whole process becomes 
for cinema becomes much heavier um, than than everything else. Go ahead, Michael, and then Mark. I, I guess kind of a two part question. Still dealing with audio. Um, does Atmos do object oriented mixing? And if not, do you see uh, that kind of immersive audio? You know, is is, is Fairlight or, or anybody looking at uh, beginning to integrate that as we are in in the live world? Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Mickey. Uh, yeah, Atmos is uh, object based. Uh, you can create beds that are standard multi-channel based, uh, uh, channel based uh, audio tracks. But on top of that, you can have up to 118 or 119 uh, object tracks. Um, in terms of the live uh, environment, I, I think uh, Michael, you may be uh, talking about more and like actual live, like front of house kind of stuff. And I don't think Dolby is thinking about that, but definitely in live in terms of live broadcast. Yes, definitely they're doing well, that. They've been okay. doing that, doing that for a couple of years. What I mean, object based mixing is where you're actually placing that object mm -hmm. in the audio scope. Which is not just left or right or behind you or in front of you, but actually, you know, like, yeah. Okay. So, right. so the, the deliverable of for Atmos includes the actual raw audio stem that you're feeding into the render plus metadata. So it doesn't, Oh, the file it doesn't, isn't just like, okay, this sound goes out of this speaker. It's this sound is in this place in the room and it doesn't matter how many speakers you, you have, it can scale up or down. It just knows that the sound should be in this place in the room. And and the private conversations with a lot of uh, with some mixing folks that we worked with is that the Atmos fold down into stereo often sounds you know they, they don't want to say it sounds better but <laughs> some they'll go you might want to try listening to it you know once because because it knows where it should be and so it actually is a fuller sound because it's got all that resolution of where it is. But the the Michael to the to the what you're talking about though is is where we're going. The goal has been, we got to get off the ground with resolve. And then the next goal after that is we have to understand vision and Atmos, you know, are the things that we'll, we'll play with more, um, you know, kind of as we, as we go forward, go ahead, Mark. Um, I was very interested in the Atmos mixing and I went to Dolby's site and Dolby actually has a very well laid out, uh, beginning intro to object-based mixing and the whole Dolby suite with um, test questions. They make you take the test over and over until you get them all right. Um, I learned a lot about the whole setup for it, um, the amount of equipment you need to actually encode things. It's three different machines. There's one that actually sets up where you set things. Then there's one that um, that turns that into what you're listening. And then there's one that creates the authoring output. So it's three separate different boxes from Dolby to get it happening. Um, but the training is on the Dolby site. I found it and I'm not that you know, much of a hound. So if you're really interested in it, it's actually really helpful to learn like, five you know 5.1.4 is the standard mixing in a truck for atmos standard five one surround but the extra four speakers are the uh, the above speakers that go in a square around the mixer and then they show you how the pan the, the panning will allow you to place it anywhere within that box that's between the ear level speakers and the ones that are you know on the ceiling of the truck or the ceiling of your theater and then taking that information of where you put you put that and then they output that so it can be played back in any theater or any place with the with any number of speakers set up and it'll play relatively in the same space no matter where it is and it's uh, it's really worthwhile i'm not even so done with it yet, so but... they made it five times as complicated as lisa is <laughs> in l acoustic well it gives you a lot of, <laughs> yeah it gives, gives you a lot of control uh go ahead yes. charles yeah um i'm actually going through that process myself since since i got the dolby vision certification i wanted to move on to the atmos and that's uh, an entire other process and they're very specific about positioning of speakers in the type of space at the right angle to everything and that's something that i'm like slowly working my way into now but um, um it's going to be great to have an entire panel of people that, that understand that because right now it's a lot of facilities but um they keep those things to themselves. That's the, yeah. I mean, that's what we're trying to break out, break apart is, is that, and, and I was the, 
the worst at it. I, we've talked about that in the past where I just wouldn't tell anybody anything. And I learned that that wasn't the most efficient way to do that. And so, um, you know, so my goal here is to get hundreds of people able to talk about it, at least high tens, but, but pr preferably hundreds of people able to talk about vision Atmos and, and really understand it. So we're all getting kind of getting started, um, with it right now. But the goal is the, the more of us that are thinking about it together and trading notes at first, we'll start behind, but my experience is, is we'll pass everybody if we do it that way. Like if we all decide we're going to share our notes and work on it together, um, we'll, we'll pass everybody because they're at, at some point they're an island, they're an information island, you know, and sure we'll start behind them, but they can't compete with a hundred people thinking about it. Um, Sky. Just quickly, Charles, do you have a Dolby certification? You do. And so did they come to your facility and, and measure and tweak and all of that? Or because that you're talking about certifications and to Alex's point of a system for a very minute product that is going out to a mass audience. I, I really like you flipping the script, Alex, on those that are going to be attracted to a thing are going to invest in it. But the rest of us are just going to be consumers. So yes, and thank you, Charles. Hey, Charles. Yeah. So, so I did the certification for vision and, and they had to figure out a way to teach it online because before they would come to your facility and they would have everybody sit down, the technician, the colorist and whoever else sit down in the room. They would sit with you the entire day and make sure everybody understood. And at the end of it, you do the test, yada, yada, and you get like this um, cert. Now what they're doing, and they actually released uh, a certification for, for individuals now, which is great. When I did it, I happened to get in because I was working with a company and I just walked in, but I happened to be the only individual doing the test, not at a facility. It was just me. And then a bunch of companies, and I was the tiny fish in a very, very large, large pool. <laughs> Well, the goal is, again, that with the help of Steve and Mark and, and yourself, the goal is to get a bunch of people, you know, up to, and, and we'll, you know, Mickey on the, on the audio side and, and other folks to get, to get up to that, that level. Uh, by the way, uh, there is a Fairlight audio post via DaVinci Resolve 17 beta certification class next week. Do you guys know anything about that, Mark and Steve? Is that a... Well, um, yeah, um, what, what they're doing at Blackmagic is um, breaking the pages down to individual certification modules. So, mm -hmm. for example, you can get certified in the overall DaVinci Work with 101 course with all the pages, and you can get certified as an end user. Then they break that out into like advanced color correction, fusion, like you can take a fusion. And then there's one on Fairlight, I believe uh, Mary Plummer teaches. She's really good. So, yeah, you, you take her, her, you watch her, you read her book. She goes through her book, and at the end, you take an exam. Yeah, in fact, I've been going through those because they're, they're offering it, these courses for end user certification and train and trainer certification. So I've been doing the trainer pages. Last week was Fusion and Color. This week is the Edit page. Um, and I, ha I haven't seen the Fairlight one because I'm not. I'm, I'm picking three because each one of those are like five day courses that you have to sit through and then do the exam. So if you want to do every page, it's a big commitment. Mickey, you had, did you have last words before we uh, set um, set these guys free? Kind of a, uh, another rabbit hole question uh, for Charles. Like Charles, when you <laughs> when you master anything for for vision, do you have to pay a license fee to Dolby, um, or 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 not? Because like for for sound, every time you master anything in in uh, in Atmos, you have to pay a license fee to them. No, what I had to pay for or the company paid for was the license and the ability to inside of Resolve to do all my trims because you could actually see the Dolby Vision controls inside of Resolve, but for you to be able to do your trims for everything that you need and be able to get the metadata and output that, then you have to have like the yearly license and you have to have it installed and yada, yada. Um, it's good that you no longer need the, uh, the CMU. No, the, sorry, the, oh, uh, is it the army? CMU. Or CMU? Uh, the external, uh, the, mm. the, color sorry, the, yeah, yeah, yeah. That because 
Now it's internal. If you are trying to do HDMI tunneling, that's a whole nother rabbit hole, then you need the external CMU. But for the stuff that we're doing here, you're perfectly fine. But I didn't have to pay anything aside from the yearly fee and uh, you know the cost of the class and cert. Yep. Interesting. For for Atmos, it's every title that you master. <laughs> and not only every title that you master, but each time you make a master. Interesting. Um, you have to, yeah. Huh. The the uh um I'm really interested to see where music goes. I don't know if you guys saw the announcement that they're now supporting they're putting Atmos in the car. Like they they announced that last week. Ooh, you know, so sounds, is this gonna be an overall fun. choice? Uh, no, like that there. Yeah, I mean, like, well, it's a perfect place to put Atmos. You know, if if you have a good car, it's a perfect place to put it because it's all around you, and you can listen to it, and you could probably set it up so you could feel, you could hear it, you know, hear it, hear the surround. It'd probably be a really great place to enjoy it. Go ahead, Stuart. Uh, a Rolls Royce probably not such a good idea because of the shape of the volume. This sort of surround sound would actually work better in a minivan. Well, the funny thing is, is that is that the. Uh, with the modeling, with a lot of these things, they're, this, there's all these mics being applied to it. And so what they're doing is it's listening to how it reverberates in the space. So it'll work in a lot of different spaces because of that. So between that and I, and I do think- It works I really, on AirPods. And, right, exactly. And, and I gotta say, I, having listened to a lot of Atmos music at this point, you know, um, uh, Tidal has Atmos on it. Uh, it's, um, stereo feels really flat. <laughs> like it's like eh, it's okay. Uh, uh, go ahead, uh, Peter, and then Stuart. And and by the way, Steve and Mark. Uh, first of all, I just want to thank you guys for coming in and uh, and answering our questions there. Sorry, sorry for the quick uh, jerk there. But um, if uh, we're we got the, our last week with you next week, ten a.m. and um, and we'll we'll see you there to to close this out. I, we're going to keep talking, but I wanted to make sure that you know you're more than welcome to stay. But I didn't want you to feel like you have to wait until we finish because we never finish. We just keep talking. Like it's it, 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 if you think never, that there's some point. You, if you think that we already we have another talk at noon, we've started it, you know. So that's talking about Arduino. So um, at some point we'll probably take a little bit of a break, or which means that we'll talk less, not that we'll stop. So uh, so anyway, just wanted to let you know. All right. Anyway, go ahead. Uh, thank thanks guys. Thank thank you so much for coming Great. in, um, uh, Peter, and then Michael, and then Stuart. Well, going back to your car point, the the point about cars. I mean, it, it wasn't more than maybe ten years ago they started to put just basic Dolby and some of the higher, even the higher end trucks, because as you said, they have mics in there too. So they're even, I, I've read the, some of the stuff that they do, they're dynamically adjusting for noise reduction and listening right. how the audio is coming out inside the vehicle while the vehicle is moving. It right. is, is quite amazing. It's And it is sometimes the best place I can go to listen to certain music. Yeah, yeah, Michael and then and the Stuart. Well, my question was really, how long do you think before we start seeing some of this in like YouTube or, or something like that? I mean, because if it's only audio, you know. Well, I think uh, we're getting closer. Kill. You know, YouTube now. So one of the things that happened with YouTube is that you can now stream to YouTube with HLS. It's a little geeky to do it at the moment. And that's so that it will support H.265. Um, so one of the problems with RTMP is that RTMP is really only two channels. Um, so, so you, you can't really go, I mean, Mickey has proven that you can do some of the surround with just stereo. So, um, binaural, binaural is, is something that can be done right now in YouTube. Um, you know, so, so that is possible. Um, just manipulating the fact that our ears aren't paying attention to, we've talked about this before, but our ears aren't paying attention to volume. They're paying attention to timing, you know, and that's the, the whole trick to putting things in different places. Um, and, uh, so we can do it with stereo to some degree, um, but I think there's going to be a lot of pressure. I think I believe that Apple will eventually, you know, add Atmos to music, and when that happens, everybody has to. Like you know, like it's 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 one of those things. Yeah. Like once once they go down that path, everybody has to do it, or they can't keep up. And so it's just a matter of when Apple gets their you know, gets their ducks in a row. I'm, I don't know what the, what's delaying it other than there's just not a ton of content. So they probably want to have, um, you know, some, some stuff out there, but I think that, I think that'll hit it and then everything will go really fast after that. Stuart. Just a couple of quick final points on minivans. 
the shape of the interior is also the same sort of box shape that we used to get in theatres with the, the way the audio progresses down. So make it easy. Well, I, I, but, I, I, and, but here's the thing. Once that sort of technology gets in the minivans, that's like the final bargain level stereo that goes in any car brand's uh, equipment. If it's there, it's ubiquitous. It's already taken over. The third point, I have a minivan. Well, I... My, I, I think we've talked about it. My dream. I'm sorry, Stuart. I, I'm so I'm slow. I have I have a minivan, and I that's my my car is an old minivan. <laughs> so anyway, I, but the uh, it's funny. I went from I have a BMW that died. Let me use an old one, but so I've gone from that to a minivan. I'm quite fine with it because I can carry things. The BMW was always like bashing things into it. It was really annoying. Anyway, um, uh, my dream car. I've decided. We talked about it a little bit, but is just a box. Like it can be slightly aerodynamic, but mostly just a box. No driver, no space. It's just the other apartment. The, it's the apartment that moves me places. You know, like, like you know, and so I go in and I just want to be able to fold out a table and go back to work. I want to be able to pull up a, a, a stationary bike and bike if I want to. And I want to be able to have a little bed that it can pull out and I can just go to sleep for a little while. And but I have a little space that I can just kind of hang out with in there. And uh, and it just move, the it's the apartment that moves me. And I've the funny thing is before this announcement, I had already been designing that it would have, it would have to have 10 speakers, you know, so that I'd have, you know, I'd have my, uh, I'd be able to watch in an 80, 80 inch 8k screen in the front. So I can sit there and just watch, I can watch movies while I'm going to LA or going to whatever. And I don't really care whether it's a hundred miles an hour or 50 miles an hour or whatever. Cause I'm just like hanging out doing my thing. And, um, you know, got 5g and 4g and everything else. But to me, that would be like, and then the idea is that the the drivetrain. So a lot of the new drivetrains with batteries are just the, it's literally a drivetrain, and you put the car on top of it because you don't have to have the engine anymore. And so my whole thing is is that the drivetrain becomes something that I don't own. I just own the in in the the box, right? So you drive up, you want to go to you want to go to um, Pennsylvania or New York or whatever. I just drive up to the train, and it picks my 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 box off of my off of the the drivetrain, which I rented, you know, like you pay a lease on that or whatever, sets it on the train. Then we're gone. Then it just keeps it going. I don't even have to get out. Wow. <laughs> like, 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 like that in my, in my, like it just takes me somewhere. And then I, and then I get there and I still have my little apartment, you know, it might even have like a, you know, like anyway. So that's, that's my, that's my, my dream car is that so the, it just, so it's the very 80, modular. So the, so the, the passenger version of the 80 foot cargo containers, right? Well, I was going to say the next thing is, this puts me in a cargo like like if I want to go to if I want to go to London it just it just moves my little my little box around and uh and no, where, no matter where I want to go it just my little box goes with me and and that's it and then I, I have all the things that I need there and then I don't have to think about this anymore and it doesn't God. matter how if if the satellite it with with uh you got to get with um Elon Musk I can I can literally be you know anywhere if it takes five weeks to get across it just means it's five weeks I don't have to deal with people <laughs> I just, I just I keep on doing what I'm doing, Chris, and then the Charles. Dodge Mercedes almost fits your bill, except you're not yep. putting an 80 inch screen across there. Well, I don't want any, I don't want the driver area. It's a big waste of space, uh, Chris, and then Charles. Well, uh, to your thing just now, there I just saw an article about uh, kindergartners and elementary school kids who have desks with little bikes under them so that they can get into that mm -hmm. beta or theta or whatever it is mm -hmm. while they're working. But also, um, back to the audio thing for just a moment. And and maybe this is my complete misunderstanding. The reason why I asked about Codex earlier is because, is it my understanding that the old surround sound was essentially a two-channel mix with with like added like metadata on it that would tell mm -hmm. the machine to like shoot some things to different speakers yeah. or? Yeah. Mickey? Yeah. Yeah, um, it's kind of actually the other way around, uh, Chris. Uh, you would build a proper, like, you know, multi-channel mix, like in, in the channel-based uh, uh, system, um, channel-based uh, formats. You would actually build a multi-channel mix. And then one of the uh, techniques of distributing that uh, back then before it was feasible to actually send out multi-channel was to encode it and um the, the more popular format is uh, dolby pro logic and also pro logic 2 which is essentially a two-channel audio stream you can actually listen to it in stereo but then on the other end a pro logic decoder can spit that out into lcr and surround uh channels so that's a what four i meant. channel output yeah, yeah that's what i meant 
And yeah. that's um, mostly a Dolby uh, technique. DTS also has a competing uh, format to that as well, but I can't recall exactly which one. Uh, but for Dolby, it's uh, ProLogic. Can I just throw a comment in here? Sure. Uh, audio in an automobile is almost the bane of live guys' existence. Here's why. Everybody gets so used to whatever audio, whether it's good quality, bad quality, whatever, what they're listening to in the car, that when they get to a live event, that's what they want to hear. That's that's They've trained themselves to listen to, you know, and pick up on that. So now that's what they want to hear. And when it's not that way, there's 10, 15 people that come up that didn't like it because it didn't sound like how it sounds in their car. You're saying it's impossible to recreate in a baseball stadium well, what you get in an enclosed car with a subwoofer. Well, yeah, pretty well, much. Yeah. But I, but I think that I think that that's the the bands that are the best to listen to are giving you an experience that just isn't comparable. Like they're not playing the you know when you look at a when you when you watch a Foo Fighters show or a or a Dead show or a you know or or something like that. Those every show is is a creative experience, and I think that I think one of the problems we've gotten into with a lot of shows is that they're so um pre-built with click tracks and process and everything else that you sometimes you've rung out you know it's it's a big show and it's got big lights and everything else but you've lost that authenticity that you get with just freeforming you know some of the stuff like we've already heard the album like i don't need to, i don't need to go i don't need to go see a bad version of the album. like I, I i that's my whole thing with with bands if if they're doing something creative with their song, that's great. If they're going to give me the a bad version of the album, I'm, I'm like, I don't need to, you know. And, and I very quickly made a decision when I was a music director because I would see two or three shows a night. And I would just be like, ah. Eh. You know, like like I would literally get through a couple a couple songs and I was like, oh, they're reproducing the album in a bad way. I'm just going to go somewhere else. And, and I'd go to the next next club because I, I could go to every club in Pittsburgh for free. You know, like, yeah, you know, as a music director, I, I have, you know, I just knew everybody, you know, you just walk in and I could just go sit and watch three songs of a band or eight songs of a band. And I just make sure I would just look at it, make a decision really quickly about whether they're going to replay bad versions of their album or whether they're going to do something special. And I could tell within three songs, <laughs> you know, like, you know, like, like, you know, like, where, where are they going to go with this? And I would immediately write them off if they were just doing bad versions of the album. But if they were going to do something where they're experimenting, they're riffing, they're, there's something going on up there, I would stay there all night because that, that's what you want to see is them. Go, in my opinion, that's what I wanted to see. Go ahead, Ray, and then Peter, and then Charles. Uh, going far afield for a moment. Ever since Eastman 910, I've been very interested in, uh, uh, very instant glues, and now we've got super glue and all that. But what I've found is all of those glues, you have to have an absolutely smooth surface, and they have to be joint, pressed against each other very tightly, or they don't work. And a friend introduced me to something new, and it's called Rapid Fix, okay? And it's a two-parter, but this second part is not a liquid. It's a dust. It's a very fine powder. And what is amazing about it that I love is you, it can, uh, you can apply this to a rough surface or you can apply it to a gap and then pour the powder in and it will create a fillet. And, and, it, and, it, and as soon as you I don't, I don't you know how this it, is related to what we're talking about, but I'm really interested in it. What, what is the... Like, <laughs> Like, I don't know. I, I feel like we went into some kind of weird non sequitur, but I was like, so I wasn't really listening. And suddenly I was like, what is he talking about? And um, so the, the, what is it called? It's called Rapid Fix. Okay. okay. Whoops. It's called Rapid Fix. There it is. It's okay, finally right. in focus. And, and I just thought everybody would be interested in this stuff. Like I had, yeah. I had the, uh, the rubber uh, guard on my, I'm gonna try to fix. I, I actually have a. I have a. I have something I need to do with that because I need to fix my my uh, Google Glass. So I'm gonna. I'm gonna try. Try to yeah, use that. But but broken. the thing that I love is, like I said, all these acrylic glues or whatever they are. You have to have smooth surfaces and press them together. Okay. Right. But this stuff, you can fill it with it. With right. the powder, you pour the powder in, and it sets up in seconds. Again, again, I don't know how we got there, but it was fascinating. I'm going to move on because this is like completely non sequitur. But but it's a, but it was a fascinating conversation. Go ahead, uh, Peter, and then Charles, and then Mickey. 
Well, I'll do I'll do in two parts. One is my parents took me, I'm dating myself, to see Moody Blues in Shea Stadium years ago. And they were trying to reenact Days of Future past the album on stage, and they couldn't do it. I mean, I was a little kid, and I was very disappointed because if you've ever listened to Days of Future Past, there was a lot of stuff they did at the audio control level in the studio that you couldn't reproduce correctly on stage, like a gong going backwards. They just couldn't figure out how to do that. And then going to Ray stuff, you can thank the space program for that because that was that's what they carry on the uh, ISS to patch help patch small leaks. Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead Charles. Uh, one, Ray. Yeah, with any compound that comes in two different bottles, uh, Ray's a pro. I'd be highly cautious because I went to art school, and that ended up badly for a lot of people. As far as going. <laughs> Back to the Poxy concerts. Problem. <laughs> yeah, it's another, it's another story. Um, I love bands that when you get to the concert, like Dave Matthews or like Coop, where you right. go for an experience of them listening to the crowd and feeding off of that, where you won't get that anywhere else. It's a one of one experience. Yep. Yeah, and and and, and and I think that that's what a lot of the things that. Uh, when you see the infamous queen at, at Live Aid, you know, the infamous, he's interacting with the crowd the whole time. I mean, I know we're going kind of off, but he's interacting with the crowd the whole time. And if you've ever seen um, people sing uh, um, Queen before a Green Day show where they all sing it together, they play it and everyone sings it. And there's a, I think there's a, I, there's a, uh, um, a GoPro shot of, of one of those on YouTube. And they do it a lot. Um, it's oftentimes the best part of the concert. I mean, Green, Green Day is good, but there's something about having the whole 70,000 people singing the same song together. That unified experience is something that is part of why we, I think why we go to those shows. Go ahead, Mickey. And just going back to uh, what Ray showed us, uh, cyanoacrylate, uh, also known as uh, super glue, that plus baking soda equals instant strong adhesion. As in like that. <laughs> wait, 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 what is it? What are, what are the two mixes? S super glue and uh, baking soda. Ah. But be, but what you were saying is with great power comes great responsibility. Yeah. Super strong bond in like two seconds. The funniest thing I learned on the farm, we all, we all had, um, a lot of us had like sitting on the tractor, we had super glue. And I didn't know what it was as I was growing up until I was about 12 and I cut myself out in the field. And my uh, my uncle just came over and poured water and put super glue on it and pinched it and it was like okay we're done let's go let's go back to work <laughs> and it turns out that's what it was created for like it was it was actually super glue was actually created to bond skin which is why you have to be so careful about pinching after you've used it is because that's what it's designed to do uh, go ahead Peter yeah I was gonna say I was gonna just I mean it was really originally just, my my dad was a mash doc yep. equivalent of a mash doctor in Korea and that's that was what it was created for was quickly fixing yeah. problems that they could fix but we we way. we i used it fairly often as a as a kid or a teenager you'd have you'd just super glue i'd super glue cuts all the time and it was remarkable how well they healed um you know uh compared to, i used to think that i have i do have a fair number of scars but not as many as i would have had <laughs> i have a lot of scars on my hands you yeah, farm boy good john i just i i touched base with rogers he's got some demos ready to go he'll probably oh, excellent a little before I assume that you'll do your normal sort of interview with him. Yep. Yep. Okay. Yep. And um, I'll do a quick demo. This is me asking a question about cutting something. And then Excellent. this is me cutting it. Ah, uh, yeah. I can, remotely, yeah. I can give you camera control that will let you do these. These are all presets if you want to do that. We, strong preset. You know, our, our, our system isn't built for that. So I don't think, I think we would have a hard time running. We would have to test it a bit. Well, we'll, we'll see. I, I think that I would rather test it on the rehearsal day than the than the shoot than the the event day so uh, I, I had it but there was a lot going on yesterday but this is what i would do is ask a question about chopping and then i just go like this and this is how you chop yeah it, and i go back that's awesome that works pretty well yeah absolutely good i, I don't have and i'm gonna on all that other stuff but i'll I'm gonna, I'm gonna leave you guys amongst yourselves for a couple minutes i gotta go deal with something at the house 
gentlemen, I'm going to bid you adieu and bow out, and um, I will have to send Alex photos once I put seats backwards in my minivan with a desk in the back for doing live <laughs> streaming on location at racetracks. I'm going to thank you. Good morning, Stop guys. calling me nice names. So, so I I just jumped on here last minute to try and try and help Chris, you know, understand this Dolby thing a little bit better. Come, come, coming in the five six dB, too hot, to, Greg. Too hot. Gotta love it. Gotta love it. How now, brown cow? Are we? Uh, is that making a little better? It's twenty one twenty. Still hot. Okay. And coming down and looking at 26, 27, 28, overshot just a little bit. And we'll bump up like three. And uh, we're at 32, 29, 27, 26, 25. That should be enough of me. Yes, sir. Um, you know, you kind of have to understand. Number, the first thing is there's a difference between Dolby noise reduction and Dolby stereo. And, and there's a lot of people that don't understand that. Dolby noise reduction was just simply that. It was a way of reducing reducing the noise. And that transferred into, uh, into consumer, uh, various consumer uh, grades. And you would find that on all your cassette players, for instance, Dolby B and then Dolby C, you know, for the really high end players. And it was just, it was just a little better unit. But Dolby had been used, Dolby A had been used in films for, for a long time, okay? But Dolby Stereo was a way of encoding four tracks, which were left, center, right, and surround, into the two optical tracks that were on the film. All film sound used to come from the optical tracks that were that were physically printed into the print okay and for for many many years it was mono and they had just figured out a way how to get stereo and then um boy what was the what was the first dolby what was the first dolby show walter merch was involved in some way um but anyway then there was this whole encoding process so anything dolby is an encoding process Okay, um, the the left center right surround was simply simply steering the channels. There was no no encoding in the mixing. There was, however, uh, some some um, kind of an encode decode process in the playback. But then then we got to once we started producing uh, CDs and DVDs, uh, DVDs mostly. Um, this is when Dolby Pro Logic came in. And Dolby Pro Logic was basically a consumer version of Dolby Stereo. Okay, so and, and that was all that was all done. Mickey used to do a ton of it um, at our, uh, our our studio in the Philippines. And um, you know, so so that's that's kind of where this all came from. Um, and the the, the fact that every theater that was the, intending to do any kind of Dolby production had to be certified. And it was certified based on a number of things. It was based on how quiet the room was. It was based on the frequency response of the room. It was based on the playback system that, that was in behind the screen. It was based on the distance from the, from the console to the screen. Okay. And it was, and it had to have all the, um all the Dolby processing gear. Uh, it was also based on if you had a 35 millimeter projector, projector back in right. the dig when even when we were in full digital era, you still needed a 35 mil projector in there. Yeah, but he was trying to get away with an Optima projector. It wasn't really a uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. but still. But still. Yes. So you have to have a 35 projector. Um because because the the sound comes from the print if you don't have a 35 millimeter projector how can you play the print right um but the, but the the concept of loudness actually came from them um 
Oh, that's what's that? Oh, there's the, there's the optical track. What and there's is that, the, Mickey? Well, this is the this is Dol, this is the this is Dolby Digital. This this thing that kind of looks like a barcode in the center here, black and white. That's the Dol, <laughs> that's Dolby Dolby Digital. And if you if you pan left, you no know, no keep going. You were you weren't going the right way. Pan left. That's the optical track. Okay, so this was on the edge of the film print. What's what's on what's to the other side though? That looks like a that's it a could, digital digital yes, as well. It could, be, it could be DTS. It could be Sony. It could be yeah. Because, yeah, what so they, are they so are the Dolby Digital. And I, they almost look like QR codes, but yeah, the yeah. white one in the middle is yes, Dolby Digital, uh, most likely two channel Pro Logic. But, and this but one, yeah, do they either... insert those in between the fr in, in in between the visual frames? Is that what? Yeah, if you doing? yeah, pan all, pan all the way. Pan, well, it's off to one side. You you don't you, can you see the? Do you have a um, picture on the other side? Uh, if you no, this, right, this image is just it's just the audio strip. Okay, well you can see that you can see the sprocket holes on the on the on the the other side of the. Okay. The, um, so what's in the white space? That's the sprocket. That's, that's a sprocket hole. Oh, that's the sprocket holes. Yeah. So it would be in between the. It would essentially that that QR code would fall in between the frames. It, right. Yeah. Right. Or line that, up with the. I should say line up with the frames. I should only. That line this up. Uh, the the Dolby the the Dolby stream is read by a Dolby optical reader and sent to their cinema processor, which then turns it into an actual uh, audio output. And you can it, see how, it, how the, proud they are of their technology because the Dolby, a, a very oh, yeah. small yep. version of the Dolby yeah. logo is yeah, right logo. in the middle of it. <laughs> yeah, and the touch. analog, the analog audio on the right side is a is typically a backup or the main uh, play out. Uh, or if uh, the theater stream. does not have yeah, Dolby depend. Digital, yeah. Or if the theater doesn't have Dolby Digital, so the the Dolby the Dolby optic the Dolby reader would read both of these. Okay, so that the, so that the, the the theater the print could reach the maximum number of theaters. So do and then, uh, then the, the the one the one on the on the far left is either DTS or or Sony or another digital format. So does this strip hold just the audio for digital and analog? No. Or does it? The, 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 this thing that looks like a QR code in the middle of the frame with the Dolby right. logo. Right. That's the picture? Dolby, no, that's, that's Dolby digital sound. But that's not in the middle of the frame. That's between sprocket holes. That's correct. Yep. So they time it uh, just so that it comes out all in sync when it's run through the, uh, the cinema processor. And if it's 35 millimeter film, there's four sprocket holes for per frame. Correct. For I, most I, prints. My, my days of being a projectionist in the evening during college went back to dual prints that had the optical track and four magnetic tracks. That that uh, was that was also yeah before before any of this that was that was an option too. Because there were there were projectors that had mag reader mag head readers just like a tape machine on the on the projector itself, and that would play that would play the uh, that would play the, I mean it was it was oxide mag just like tape, <laughs> and then you get into all kinds of things about tension, and you know the, the correct placement, and this is where. You know, you could easily tell a good projectionist from a bad projectionist. A bad projectionist might you might have a little wow in there. You know, not not the tension wasn't quite tight enough. And how fast, he, fa how fussy he was when he made his loops, top and bottom. Exactly, exactly, exactly. And they were okay. So and. But the other thing about the other thing about Atmos does does I don't know does everybody understand that this that, that this uh, object based thing comes from games? Yeah. 
Okay. Okay. Just wanted to, wanted to make sure because the, the, you know, the unity engine and the unreal engine, you know, does this internally. Um, but the, I, I think the Atmos was a way of incorporating both the, both the linear track functions, the bed, if you will, you know, and the specifics of the object based, um, pieces. I, I'm, I'm just curious, uh, if you can tell us where the, uh, uh, digital reader is like in the magnetic days, the magnetic heads were above the, uh, projection right. thing and, and the optical right. track was below it. Where are the digital ones? It was with the optical below it. Okay. Yeah, they, they, they had a, they had quite a time trying to retrofit a lot of the projectors because, you know, some, a lot of post places didn't want to replace, uh, all their projectors until Magnatech came out and just, and just, just took over, you know, it was just a superior machine. So then, then you had a reason, <laughs> you know, to, to change over, but it was, a, it was a, a very interesting time. I Brian, remember can I just do an audio test for 10 yes, seconds? Yes, of course. So just very quickly, Mickey, can I have a meter? Oh, yep. Yeah. Uh, this is Leo coming in from uh, London, just testing my sound. Uh, hopefully I haven't touched it, touched it since I was last on. Uh, uh, Leo, will you be here for the noon event? It depends what it's about. Uh, about building Android devices. I'll be on for whatever uh, I can. Uh, I, I thought this was the, uh, this is how to repair your car show. Well, we did that. We talked about the glue that you used, but that was, what I saw did. that. I saw that. <laughs> I was like, I was like, what, where is Ray going? Um, and then I like, I've got a very similar product or I've seen as a very similar product in the UK with that dust. Um, and you pour it in, as you say, and then it, and it goes in with like a, the equivalent of super glue. And it forms the bond. It's it's super great, but I found that it actually then can bond the thing. And if the thing's a bit crumbly, you end up with half of what the two bits you've bonded. It's stronger than what's around it. For for you over on that side of the pond, isn't it Bond James Bond? <laughs> wow! Oh dear. Okay. Wow. Um, TJ's I'll not leave, here. I'll leave uh, now. TJ's not here because the rugby is on John, at the moment, John, which I've got I, on. I, I applaud your dad joke, sir. That good job. <laughs> That's All right, it. I'm going to bail to you guys. I just wanted to pop in for a sec. Yep. Greg, so no, what are we? No, I need I need help, man. I'm the only audio guy here besides Mickey. I need help. I, I just we... find it fascinating. I, I and I don't mean this is meant with all due reverence, gentlemen. The fact that we have somebody like Ray and Greg on the on these calls at the same time. The history they can bring to this, why something works the way it does, is yeah, seriously, it, like national treasures. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I think it's really I, I have, I have, yeah. I, I. There are many times Sorry, where I'm explaining to people why things work the way they do in in classical computers. Yeah, is is. People don't understand that we've tried some things before. I mean, I go back on the mainframes. When I joined IBM in, in the late 70s, the mainframe was exactly 14 years old. It's now 56 years old. And why it works the way it does and why we went down some rabbit holes and came back and said, nope, that ain't going to work. We're going down this path. Things we take for granted, like cash, Memory cache? Yeah. You know, that was that was in the late 60s. That was a controversial topic of whether it would benefit computers or not. That it is a very bizarre story to read that. It was a bunch of research scientists who had different views on life. Would we ever think of having a computer without a cache in it? Yeah. My my cache was the spare punch cards I kept in my desk. Yep, exactly. <laughs> exactly. But I was I was actually I was just looking it up. I mean I was I was trying to figure out, you know, we everyone thinks about 
well, spinning media or solid state storage, but you start to think about how you do, and I don't know, how do they distribute digital print prints to movie theaters? Is it, is it, you know, if, if I were doing it, I'd probably send out, you know, high compression tapes. I mean, because I can. Oh, get, oh you mean you mean for you mean for um to, for, di- for for totally for, digital delivery? Yeah, for totally digital delivery. I think I think they have a I think they have a a, a net solution. Yes, yeah, they absolutely I, th- I think do. it's satellite downlinks. If I'm not well, mistaken. I'm just I'm just thinking mm, about. Highly. I mean, as the one of the things we've learned, we keep thinking tape drives are going away, but I will tell you, in in government and corporate environments where they're storing literally terabytes a day and putting it away to iron mountain um it's tape and you know tape is not going away anytime soon i don't know how they're storing it but as as somebody who's uh for example uh a convention called comic palooza that i uh did for years down here in uh houston we did a uh dolby surround sound movie theater for new releases and you know had to have the machines there to bring in the movie and unlock the uh the permission codes you know from yeah. hollywood to to be able to run those um so it's they they didn't send us a disc they didn't send it they didn't send us anything other than the permission authorization right. and we you know i had to make sure that we had a good solid ethernet uh connection to that machine or you know we were gonna have problems <laughs> you, you know, I, I had one more thing i wanted to i wanted to point out to you guys and that was that this whole concept of loudness and luffs is not new no um all of the original dolby equipment you know and the dolby certification for a movie was based on the fact that it that it satisfied very specific loudness standards 85 db it could not go and and they had a whole the cp650 processor did all these calculations i and they had short funny term. i was about i was about to bring up the cp650 greg uh with me just googling optical readers dolby six you can get the dolby cp650 second hand for a thousand us now really yeah that'd be worth just to have on the shelf exactly let, 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 let me let me share share with you how old I am. Uh, when I was doing projection work at night, uh, we were given paper instructions with the print, and the one that I remember was Guns of Navarone. You know where they blow the top off of a mountain, oh. and in the paper instructions, they gave you the line. There was a Q line. When you heard it, you were to turn the volume up so many dB <laughs> to yeah. blast them out of the theater when the top of the mountain came off. <laughs> Talk about non-automated audio. Yeah, now if that if that was the studio and if that was a Dolby a Dolby print, and that theater was was caught doing that, they would lose their license. Exactly. Well. A lot of a lot of uh, cinemas don't follow. No, I mean, things. That's, what, that's what I'm saying. It wasn't it wasn't really enforceable. You know, there's, yeah, I've there's... had I've had shows play on cinemas and like me come into random cinemas just to review how it plays and different uh, you know venues and it's like that's totally off. Yeah, but the idea was, you know, the idea was sound. The idea was that. Any any picture that was mixed in a Dolby theater would have the same level, the same maximum loudness. But, but you see, the, you see, you see their Dolby processors running at five point oh instead of you know seven seven point oh in terms of the 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 Dolby fader. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Well, come on, because oh, they're saving I mean, they're saving their amps. Ooh, you're not gonna you're not gonna have the same theater set up you know, at the mall where kids are going and all that kind of stuff as you are at, I don't know, the village down in Florida where everybody attending the theater is 80 years and older. It's no way. No, but probably they, I mean, not. They, they, it, I want to go to the 80-year-old. Well, 
Oh. <laughs> My ears can't take it anymore. <laughs> with, with, a, you know, with, a, with a boost at 13K up. Oh, well, I need Ooh, that. You're right about that. Now oh, no. he's getting ugly. No, he wow. knows. He knows. He knows my see. He knows my dirt. He knows my. You secret. know. You know. Speaking of all of this, the one profession that has radically changed over the years is the projectionist. When I was a projectionist, the uh, twelve minutes was the longest reel you could load on the projector, right. Right. and you had to trim the carbon arcs and rewind the reel. Yeah. And what I'm saying is, you were busy the whole yeah. time showing whole time. the movie. And yeah. then they went to the horizontal trays with the continuous loop of uh, film, you know. That's what, and, we had. That's what we had in the Philippines. And, it was a movie. Yeah, and and yeah. and the manager in his office. I mean, they had a technician come in and set it up. Okay, you know, put put thread the projector and everything. And yeah, and and they had a uh, uh, a xenon DVD. lamp in the thing. And then the manager in his office could flip it on a switch to start the movie. And there was a metal, uh, you know, a piece of metal or on the print that shut it off at the end. And right, now right. there are no projectionists now. Yeah. Yeah. I was going to say, what's a, what's a projectionist? The, the, only place I've way, ever the, seen a, the only place I've ever seen a projectionist recently is, well, recently, a year plus ago, was I happened to go. And they always make a show of it anyhow. Is an IMAX theater because they've always got yeah. as you're walking in, they've always got the behind the glass booth area. They show the IMAX projector and how they handle those massive reels of film that they 70 use. Seventy mil, baby. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it's 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 amazing. You were... It's amazing mechanical operation to watch, and I emphasize the word mechanical operation to watch. <laughs> We did. We were doing all these all these movies when I was at Disney. We were doing all these movies for the uh, for Orlando, and it was the the these they were called Circle Vision. I don't know if they still have them there or they don't. But yeah, no, no, they absolutely do. They still have them. Absolutely, it was nine panels, nine panels of seventy mil, all the way around. Okay, with a speaker behind each panel. One overhead and two subs. My so my favorite, was, of course, of that was to go to the Canada exhibit where you where the uh, RCMP yeah, the RCMP ride in around you and yeah. then come at you. But yes, yeah. And I and I also remember watching you know Disney at uh, you know Wonderful World of Disney where they would show how they would film it. You know, having hanging those cameras off of the helicopter. <laughs> Did you see the camera that that camera rig? Unbelievable! Yeah, well, it, that's now it, being it, superseded it, by the new version of that. Is things like soaring is the new way that they do the sort of immersive version of that yeah. sort of around. Yeah, vision. and soaring is soaring is all digital. I know because well, we, I helped install some of that hardware, the the computers that support it. We had two shooting stages that 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 we used one. In one of them, we put the we put the dubbing stage, and built a built a giant you know arena around with nine Sony projectors on a ring in the center, and we had there were four con dubbing consoles in a square you know in a square, and all the mixers and the recordists sat in inside, and it was just it was just spinning, and these the guys in the engineering department devised these wireless joystick uh panners i don't know they weren't wireless they but they were joystick and we you could you could sit in the chair and if you were panning a seagull you know around you could spin with the seagull and pan, it was just nuts can but i do then they a check a, sure let's hear it for disney imagineering right hell oh, god <laughs> Can I get a quick audio check here? I've got a, a pile microphone into a Cybrant USB. And it looks like I'm a little bit hot on the... Uh... Yeah, maybe two or three dB too hot. Okay, so I'm using the, uh, the Zoom uh, slider here, which is calibrated in, in strange, strange things. Uh, yeah, you're, you're okay. close, maybe just close another enough. dB or two down. 
one or two db down i can do that thank you thank you very much and so, on the uh, other stage the other big the other big stage they built a preview room with nine 70 millimeter projectors all on the outside fit you know cross shooting it was just insane if you bring that forward to today and you think about what was not this year's super bowl the year before they had that donut around the top of the stadium mm. of uh led screens i can't yeah. remember where it was you know it's effectively it's a reverse of what you were saying of that right. you know we now right. have moved forward to oh. technology that it's just amazing how we can we've moved forward that way at the uh at the world's fair in vancouver in 1986 expo 86 the uh, raging thing at the time was show scan and yeah. they had uh, 70 70 millimeter mechanical projectors running at 60 frames per second Ooh, think loud. think about what was involved in that yeah uh, i would just like to understand how they got so these are analog these were analog uh film right I mean, yeah. it was, it yeah, was a film. Was so, right. I, I, I can just think about the chemistry involved of how they can make the film strong enough that it wouldn't snap. Well, not I know, only that, how they, how they would open and close the shutter sixty times a second. Well, there's that too. But I was actually, I, I, I got involved early in my IBM career where we were working on a, a new style of tape recording. You know, magnetic tape on computers. We were huh. going from reel to reel to to a cartridge and there was lord knows how much money was spent figuring out how to build the backing not not the actual recording the the dust that you sprinkle on it but the recording media because those things were going from you know measured in feet feet per second to you know upwards of 100 feet per second the tape would and it would have to be able to stop on a dime yeah Wow. <laughs> and stopping yeah. at a dime equals snap if you're not careful. <laughs> another another interesting product of the era, um, the company I worked for that did the computer to plate and and proofing systems, laser based. Their very Creo, their very first product was an optical tape recorder because, and they made it for the Canadian Center for Remote Sensing because the Canadian Center for Remote Sensing had warehouses full of uh, nine track magnetic tape and you know every time landsat came over every 90 minutes they had to recapture all of that data and they you know were having quite a problem so creo built a optical tape recorder i cannot remember how much data went on a reel now now it's surpassed by you know other technology but uh, Dan Gelbert, the founder of the company, who was a brilliant genius, uh, he designed this optical tape recorder that uh, uh, wrote with lasers and read with lasers uh, this optical tape. Wow. Now, what was the nine tracks, though? Oh, uh, you had uh, eight tracks of uh, digital data, on, and the ninth track was a, a parody track because okay. uh, it wasn't reliable enough. Yeah. Cool. The track closest to the edge. Yeah, that's that's where <laughs> that's where you always had always had to put your time code if you had the if you were, you know, putting on uh, you know, audio time code. Yep. Yep. Okay, anyway, guys, you guys are you guys are close to another meeting here in six minutes or something. Yeah, what's the next session? What's happening next? The Arduino thing. Arduino. I think I'll stick around for that. It looked it looked interesting. I I'd, I'd never heard of it and looked it up and I'm going, hey, it's uh, Heath Kits. <laughs> All right. See you guys later. Hey, the, hey, Greg. Come back when you don't have to stay so long, okay, bud? Really, really. Yeah, get in and out and move along. <laughs> See you guys.
I will say, Ray, that digital tape density, digital tape density has gone almost asymptotic over the last few years. I mean, we're now up to somewhere in the neighborhood of well, an LTO tape cartridge, which is about the size of four deck of cards and about twice as thick, is up to you know somewhere in the neighborhood of 1.2 terabytes and something the size of a MixPre 3, I guess is the better way of putting it. I mean, yeah, what, whereas what I, I have remember... a 6250 tape drive on or an old reel to reel tape, I'm doing good if I can, I was doing good at the time if I could put 50 megabytes on it. What, what I remember absolutely vividly, there's two things engraved in my skull. One was uh, right when the Mac Plus came out. Shortly thereafter, Apple came out with a 20 megabyte drive for yep. it. Okay. And uh, we were all, you know, we got one and we were all looking at it. And they said, now, listen, the next thing, we're going to turn the domains on end. And uh, uh, then it's going to double the density. But after that, it's a brick wall. The physics is such that it'll never get any more dense than this. And of course, <laughs> looking back now is a complete joke. And the other, the other one that I remember vividly is a guy I was working with at McDonald Detweiler came in one day. He said, Ray, Ray, come in the lab. He said, look at this. We had a Perkin Elmer computer in a 19-inch rack. And he had this 19-inch board, you know, 19 inches wide. And I don't know, 19 inches deep. You know, it was almost two feet square. And it was covered in chips. And he said, Ray, Ray, look at this. This is one megabyte of memory. <laughs> and it and it only costs ten thousand dollars. Can you believe that? Well, my 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 late father-in-law would tell the story. So, my late father-in-law also worked for IBM. He was on the team that invented the disk drive, the random access disk drive, right back in the early fifties. And and they he tells a story. They said the first time they turned it on. Now these are all PhD types, and you know. And they all realized they would have failed fresh, freshman physics because the mass of the platter exceeded the mass of the base and the, and, the, and the random access arm. So what happens when you apply power to turn the platter? The base turns. Because an object at rest tends to stay at rest unless it equal or greater forces apply it, right? You just got to bolt it down. And that's why you, uh, that's why in the modern days, PT, you never take out a spinning disc because your arm starts doing this when you take out a live disc out of a hot swaps uh, server and your arm starts juddering. Yes, yeah, so it uh, well, but because uh, it keeps moving. It will it will keep spinning, but you can you yeah, can you just spinning. imagine the shock on everyone's faces? They said they probably all as soon as they realized that the base was kind of trying to twist away, yeah. but maybe we my, need to think about my that. earliest machines that I worked on were the HPs. Um, and you know, we have to take the platters out and, uh, the vacuum comes onto the machine to suck the platters into the drive. Yeah, well, exactly. Uh, well, I mean, uh, they, my father-in-law would tell great stories about how they, you diagnosed a problem in the, in the computer. You, you opened the door, you walked in and you turned off the lights to see which tube was not glowing. Yeah. Well, it's <laughs> way before my time, but you know, but, uh, but all of these things, are and, and we were, you know, we, you know, when I, I was clearing out a garage and, you know, I'm throwing away one gig RAM chips because they're just useless now. Well, I, I, I actually have one downstairs in the garage. I have an old 3330 Mod 1 disc pack. So it doesn't mean anything to anybody, but understand that was a, in 1981, that was a, a modern disc drive. Hold a grand total of 100 megabytes and it weighed 25 pounds. There's, you know, all of these things, and I mean, going back, listening to the discussion about um, the retro stuff of uh, retro is probably the wrong word, but of uh, you know, cinema projection. And actually, I know this show is all about where we're going, but some of that is just absolutely super fascinating for certain people. I love the history of things. I love like how how we got there. That's why I like connections so much. I, I mean, I'm, I, uh, I think I probably now, now that I have a digital version, I watch connections like once a year. 
So, so Alex, I meant to, did, were you on, I think it was Andy brought it up that National Geographic apparently did what you suggested already, which is they had followed around the, uh, the Perseverance team as they were building Perseverance. Yeah, it'll be it'll be it'll be it'll be interesting to see how far they. Uh, it's just that they didn't use as much of it during a live show, probably because it didn't make as much money to put it in the in the live show as it did as it would doing it later. So it's probably my guess. Yeah. Hopefully, it'll be a ten part series or something, not a one hour special. Well, I'm always interested in how much it's the wrong term anymore, but how much got left on the cutting room floor if it was a cut. We had when 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 I was working on Star Wars. Um, you know, I had, to, I had to rebuild, um, the pod hanger. So I had to build a, I had, and I, and in building that pod hanger, I had to calculate, um, where all the pods, um, pod engines were sitting and then build it all around it to reproduce what they had done at Leaveston. But they, in this case, the production people got ahead of our animatics. So they built it without any interaction from us. And they didn't have any drawings for it. It was like they just kind of moved things in and moved them around and everything else. So I had to watch behind the scenes videos and figure out, like based on what I knew, literally just find my way to a solution of how, where all the pods were so that they could be built at ILM and do the, you know, all the stuff. And I had to send down these models of, of all this stuff. And uh, to do that, I had to watch hours and hours and hours of behind the scenes of John Knoll and George Lucas walking around talking about stuff. Because everywhere George went, for Star Wars, there was a camera. There was literally a camera crew every moment that he was there. And um, uh, anyway, so uh, it was, I was just like, I can't believe we didn't build like a 20, 20 or 30 hours of how Star Wars got made. Like it totally would have been, people would have paid a lot of money for that, you know, to, to, you know, to, to have that, that special, I don't know, at the time it would have been VHS. You know, VHS uh, series of uh, 20 VHS of how Star Wars got made, just follow shots. And every shot is this whole story. You know, there was a shot that we worked on, that I worked on from Pirates, that was, um, there's a shot where all the little um, uh, crabs go into the water and pu they're, they're pulling the ship into the water. And you'll see a shot where there's a, it's a, it's a, um, uh, it's like a, um, uh, a dolly shot. So it just comes, it kind of, this dolly shot kind of comes across and it goes behind a person's head. And then there's CG, there's a, um, the CG crabs. And then there's the ship, the, 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 um, the, the black pearl and the black pearl is a motion control shot. So the black pearl is a motion control shot that was, but, but what you had to do to do that is you took the, the shot of the, so the, the track, the trucking shot on the beach is match moved then you take that match move and you apply it to a motion control arm but the ship is one twelfth size of the of the actual black pearl so you then shrink that movement down to one twelfth size and then you go past it you know to have it do what it needs to do and then once you put it into the tracked plate because of the idiosyncrasies of cameras and everything else it it bounces a little but its perspective is correct and its movement is correct. So then you track it. You do a 2D track on the plate and 2D track on the ship. And you push them together to, to make it so that it feels like it's locked into, into the scene. Then you have to do the composites. And then to get the water bouncing off of the, of the um, to get the water to look like it's coming off the ship and it's going through the waves, you actually take a, one of those little amphibious units and you, and you have it go flying out into it and, uh, and pound into the waves. And then you composite those back on front of the ship. Anyway. There's like a, an hour that you could do on a shot that meant nothing, like almost nothing to the, to the actual film. <laughs> that was one, that's one shot. I was like, you just keep on putting those out every week for, for a movie. Hey, Roger. I mean, the closest you'll find come to that is, Hi. I mean, I have the book. I'm, I have a book downstairs. It's the first mm -hmm. 10 years of industrial light and magic. Yeah. I have that book too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's good. Roger. Welcome. Welcome to our, uh, our little, um, club. It's so it's so good to have you. All right, can you hear us okay? I hope you're muted, I think. I, I can hear you fine. Can you hear me? Yeah, and we're just going to check your mic real quick before we get started. Or, or as we normally do here, Roger, Roger. Roger, <laughs> Roger. Over. 
Go ahead and talk just a couple. We're just going to look at oh. our meter for a second. Keep talking. All right. I like meters. Meters are good things to have. Meters tell you, well, metrics and metrics allow you to measure things. And meter sticks are metric sticks. What do you think, Mickey? I think we're pretty close. Uh, yeah, maybe if I were to <laughs> pick a DB or two down. But John Edelson okay. is uh, coming in a little hot. Sorry, I, I now have my headset microphone on for. I'm here in the kitchen. Oh, I'm okay. confused. I was looking at this black this black space that was that was that says John Edelson. And no, uh, I, there there are multiple Edelsons here, but I'll I'll get off up there. But chop chop chop. He's chop. replicated. He's replicated. All right. One of me is so, enough. I think two would be way too many. Right. So Roger, so for, for yes. everyone, um, so for everyone uh, he, here, uh, what we wanted to do is is uh, we're really interested in in playing, you know, in, in kind of learning how to use Arduinos and learning how to build stuff with them. And um, you know, John had rep, had had uh, um, recommended Roger might be the right person to partner with. And then once I did a little research, I was like, oh yeah, I kept on telling John, like, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. And then I then I went to the website, and I was like, oh yeah, that's perfect. So, so uh, yeah, like like I was like like, like do you think he'll actually do it? And John was like, I think he will. And so so anyways, that's how we got here. And we're really excited to kind of prep it for everyone. We're gonna we we're gonna do something later once we want to kind of design a kit. And, and, and then Roger will, uh, Roger builds these kits. And so, so we'll give him some time to do that. We've got a couple other things to do in between. Um, but then we're going to come back later uh, in, in five or six weeks or, or, or whenever we're ready for that and actually do some Saturdays, much like we did Raspberry Pi from last week, which I was pretty excited about. And um, so anyway, so Roger, can you tell us a little bit about how you got here? And by the way, if you have questions <laughs> for Roger, put them into Makana. Um, and, uh, but if, uh, but can you tell us like, we got a little time, so just tell us how, how, how you actually got to where we're, where you're building hyper Duinos. Well, okay. I uh, never ask an old man questions, but okay. Especially, <laughs> especially with, and we've got a little time, but yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> but, yeah, but, uh, uh, yeah so notes. yeah, the cliff notes, the back of the flap, uh, the back flap of the book version is, uh, um, I started off as a middle school, high school um, math science teacher back in the 70s. And um, along about that time, the Apple II computer came out. Um, and so I, I bought, I bought, yeah, so, <laughs> we, uh, so I, I bought one of the early Apple II computers. There weren't any books on it. So I had, you know, just kind of muddled my way through, but I'm so old, I ended up writing the first book on how to program an Apple II in assembly language. Um, so I... It was that 1982? Yeah, you have a good memory. 81 is close enough. Um, um, so yeah. The reason is, is that I'm, I'm, it's now coming back to me that I'm pretty sure I had that book. Because I was, <laughs> yeah, because yeah, it was, that's funny. I just, I just, I didn't, I didn't piece that together until you just said that, but there was an assembly book that the assembly, uh, I bet you it was the same book. It probably was. I could probably uh, only one out. There was only one that I knew of. I mean, the, yes, the well, was, yeah, yeah. Yes. So, um, wow, so, so yes, I'm, I'm tempted to, uh, to, to rush over, but if anybody goes to rogerwagner.com scrolls to the very bottom, you'll find copy of photos of the book in German, French, and English. Um, and, um, so yes, yeah, so I got an Apple II. I did that for, um, you know, back then software companies consisted of uh, copying things at the local Kinko's, Ziploc bags, um, and originally cassettes. So I had one of the first software companies. Um, I did not have one of the first billions, so don't get all excited. Uh, <laughs> I didn't even have one of the last billions. <laughs> uh, but anyway, so I, so I started back when, you know, everything was you know, local computer clubs and such. Um, and then fast forward another decade um, in the early 90s, um, I created a, a program inspired by HyperCard. It was called Hyper Studio. And it was um, uh, sort of, I, I say it's like Andy Warhol and uh, Timothy Leary's version of HyperCard. Uh, so it was color, it could control laser discs, uh, even John Idelson has heard of, of laser discs. Um, and uh, we connected the Lego robotics. And at the time our, our motto was, if you can connect it to your computer, hyper will know how to, how to make it work. It's part of a big project. 
So that did really well in schools. Um, by the end of the 90s, it was the number one K-12 title worldwide. Um, I was sure that any day Microsoft and Apple would clone it and put me out of business. So I sold the company uh, around 97. Uh, over the next 20 years, I discovered it was total paranoia. They never even had an idea what it did, let alone any desire to clone it. But <laughs> a wise man once told me, you should have an idea that's good enough somebody actually wants to copy it. <laughs> hey, I see Guy Cochran in Seattle has, our, has on his screen. <laughs> There you go. Hyper Studio. Yes. And look at there, the Hyper Studio sponsored race car. That's yeah, great. It's corporate America has nothing on us. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. So, yeah, there's, uh, oh, right, you're on the webpage. So, yeah, there were, you know, I, I tell people my career is more like Forrest Gump than, uh, than Elon Musk. Um, I was largely being, there are a lot of firsts on my webpage only because nobody else was interested in this at the time. But, um, you know, so that screen that went by, that was the first multimedia mixer. That was the first device created. And really, that just means I went to China and had it relabeled with the word multimedia. But um, <laughs> but still, it was, it was still the first That's that had funny. computer on, on the panel. Uh, but then a little further down, we, I started with kiosks. So there was a, a scene down there with putting an Apple II GS inside a, a kiosk with a touchscreen. Um, so that's at one of the early Apple shows. Um, and then uh, the Arduino. So anyway, 97, I sold the company. I kind of retired for a while. Well, there you go. You're now Hyper Studio. There's the first one. There's a nice picture of Ted Nelson and, and uh, Doug and Engelbart. For, and for, and, and my, my uh, experience has been for, for teachers, it's hard to, uh, or for thinkers, it's hard to retire. So you, you take some time <laughs> off, but it's really just a way station to find the next thing, right? Yeah. So I, I, Strangely enough, I ended up with a rare book auction house for 10 years, <laughs> which someone once said is the slowest way ever invented to lose money. <laughs> <laughs> so it took 10 years, but eventually it succeeded. So uh, in losing the money, so I sold it for a dollar. That was another financial breakthrough. But anyway, um, so around 2007, um, I was working on a new version of Hyper Studio for some Russians. Yes, that's a true. All my stories sound like bar stories, but it turns out they're, they're actually true. So Hyper Studio had been acquired by some Ukrainians, to be more exact. But um, so I was working with them and I was at a, um, a grandson's open house and they had all these dioramas um, with, um, you know, volcanoes and you know, Greek temples and whatever. And then science fair poster board projects kind of thing. And having done Hyper Studio, I thought, wow, you know, this, this would be like the perfect thing to, um, you know, like make interactive, like attached to Hyper Studio. And so I'd heard about the Arduino. I knew nothing about it other than just heard about it. And so um, I, I thought that would be the brain that could connect um, the physical, a physical sensor of some kind to the computer. Uh, namely Hyper Studio. And since Hyper Studio could do anything as far as web pages, video, audio, you know, any, anything media you can think of, the software was capable of displaying it. Right. So I went to a, a conference with my breadboard and an Arduino. There were 200 people in the audience. They were all excited. A hundred of them wrote to me saying, tell me how to do it. And I sent them a, uh, an Amazon shopping list with a breadboard and resistors and, you know, everything they needed. And none of them ever wrote to me again. <laughs> so, so I realized that um, I realized that um, you know the breadboard was a problem. Um, right. That that was a that was a showstopper for sure. Um, I'll say yeah. Here's a good illustration on your screen share here. Um, <clears throat> and so I made this shield called the Hyperduino, and the Hyperduino. Um, eliminates the breadboard. So no matter what you're doing with an Arduino, um, I mean, literally anything, it's a lot easier <clears throat> with this shield on top because it makes the connections, the rain, those ribbon cables plug in like you can see in the middle photo. Um, those just snap in. On the board on the left, you can actually see there's a row of 12 resistors. Those are exactly the right values so that any LEDs are plugged in you don't have to put in current limiting resistors on your breadboard because they're breadboard because they're built into the Hyperduino. 
but the re resistance is so low, about 150 ohms, as I recall, um, that it doesn't really affect anything else you plug in. So if you put in, you know, whatever, any kind of a module, um, mm -hmm. you know, it, it works just fine. And then there's a blue on the, on the board, there was a blue uh, box that's for analog inputs. There's a voltage divider built in. So you can't quite see it, but both in behind this white, the gray ribbon can, can cable um, is a box for analog connections. So there's six of those. And then those trim pots on the right allow you to, you know, adjust, like tweak it a little bit. Like pressure sensors have different kind of medium uh, resist and nominal resistance values than a photo cell. So you can use those to kind of balance it a little bit, but it has a voltage divider built in automatically. Um, so it works. It, it, it worked for the, the school projects. Um, so kids can make all kinds of, you know, home, home, you know, take their science fair projects or their, their dioramas they make at home and make them interactive. And nobody ever done that. Um, so, but then it turned out, um, that once the friction had been re uh, removed in an Arduino project, then you could do all kinds of things. You could, you know, uh, so what I do now is I look on Hackster.io, I get their daily news feeds and they'll have a project for something. And invariably it'll have Arduino IDE code and it'll have a breadboard and then an extra power supply and, you know, all the things the guy had to do to make it work. Um, and then I just look at the concept and say, okay, I, you know, five LEDs, there's an input here, a servo there plug it into the Hyperduino and it becomes a one hour project. Um, so That's it's um, that page you were on um, a moment ago, there is a video that I don't know, it's about a five. Uh, I'm happy to answer questions. I also have, you know, some uh, well, I got like that. Yeah. yeah and yeah, if, if, people, if people have questions, uh, go ahead and put, put them into Makana. I know that everyone's just kind of seeping it in right, you know, right now, but um, so, how would you define the difference? Like we just all, we all built yeah. a Raspberry Pi last Saturday. How, how would you define the difference between in utility between a Raspberry Pi and an Arduino? Oh, actually, I'm glad you added the word utility. <laughs> I, have a, I, I have a saying I used to use in my classes, clear in language, clear in thought. <laughs> um, so um, the, the, I, the Arduino is a microcontroller. It's merely a little bit of memory, a processor, and some IO ports for inputs and outputs. And so if what you want to do is take an input and turn on a light, that's all you need. And if um, if you need to do, you know, multi-threaded mathematical Fourier transforms, an Arduino is not going to do that for you. Right. Um, I think so it's kind so of, for, oftentimes I think of it as a, I mean, I, the way I think of it when I, when someone asks me, I was like, it's kind of like lower brain and, 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 uh, frontal lobe, you know, maybe not frontal lobe, but, but yeah. upper brain, you know, like the you know, Arduino is kind of lower brain response. Like I'm just going to react to the things that are coming yes. in and, and, and do those things. Whereas the raspberry Pi will think about it at least a little, you know, like yeah. it's, you know, before it, before it goes there. Yeah. And I think the spark fun had, had, and I, I'm, I'm badly paraphrasing, but they sort of said, if the project you want to do is like one sentence. Like I want to measure some mo soil moisture and squirt some water in. Then it's an Arduino project. If it's two sentences or more, <laughs> and tweet a message and whatever and whatever, it's probably a Raspberry Pi project. <laughs> That's great. Uh, so one of my, you know, one of my guiding principles there was a, a an educational uh, figure named Seymour Papert. Um, you know, behind uh, the language called Logo. Um, he has saying about low, low floor, high ceiling. I paraphrase a little bit to say low threshold, high ceiling, but it has to do with how easy is it to start an endeavor, photography or, you know, skateboarding or whatever, or electronics. And then how far up can you go? So you might get a simple camera, you know, that takes you know, simple pictures has no adjustments. It's a low threshold, but there's no, you know, the ceiling is much more difficult to reach. Right. Um, or you might buy a high-end camera that's, you know, not even sure how to turn it off. Um, so my, my kind of guiding principle is to try to create environments. Hyper Studio did it in software and the Hyper Duino does it in hardware, is to have a low entry point 
where it's very easy for, in this case, a kindergartner to build a project. And yet exactly the same materials, if you, at any moment, if you say, what's next, could I do the next step? Not the hundredth step, the next step. The answer is, oh well, yeah, actually that's not too hard. We could just do this, we'll just do that. Try that, plug that in over there. Like, hey, let's do a Google search and find that. And in that path, you can go you know, the maximum distance. Um, right. There's going to be a point where you're going to be ready to go to a Raspberry Pi, but I don't personally. I don't think a Raspberry Pi is an entry point, a low threshold device. Um, so, um, and I and I'll just mention because eventually I've been also working with another microcontroller called the BBC Microbit, and that was that was presented to me by by Doctor Butterfly, otherwise known as John Idelson. Uh, uh -huh. Butterfly is in the butterfly effect where he said, hey, Roger, take a look at this. And then the next, you know, five years of my life was took a, a course change. Um, but so, yeah, the Arduino, I think I I also I said I'm more like Forrest Gump than Elon Musk. So um, I like simplicity. I like things that are, um, you know, more like. Um, I don't know, they don't break my head to to do things. Now this looks official. <laughs> well, and, and while, while we're playing through this, this, uh, this movie here, um, uh, John Puitt, well, I got, got a couple of questions coming in. John Puitt said, what should we buy for office hours? A link would be great. And I think that's what we're discussing. We're going to going to discuss a little in a little bit. So we're going to talk about, um, you know, what we would want to have in a kit that we were, that we were building out. And maybe there's one that's already pre-done, or maybe it's something that, that gets we, we kind of customized. So we're going to have that discussion about what we think uh, might might make sense. Um, yeah, this video you're looking at is actually a really good one. It's done by a guy who has something called the um, it's like the Programming Academy or Programming Electronics. Mm -hmm. But in you know in about five minutes, he does a really good job of of explaining and presenting the Hyperduino. Um, and so I'm, I imagine that guy could probably put a link to that video in the uh, the chat. Um, it's good. And yeah, so, so, it's so this is the Hyperduino R. Actually, maybe pause for a second. Oh, don't, nope. Actually, this is a great part of it. It's a wonderful video. It's the best one ever done. Um, if if Guy can just um, shuffle back just a little bit in that video, maybe just to like the frame think, before this one. By the Anyways, way, I did, did, yeah, right did, there. I, I did. Someone did. I think it's comma and po and period. Turns out is frame forward, frame back in, in YouTube, oh, which, which okay. I didn't know until like two days ago. That's really this good. One of yeah, our so discussions. Go, for, go backwards, just go back to where it shows that other device. So there are actually two there, right there. There are actually two Hyperduinos. And so the one that we'd be contemplating for this group would be this one. So the, the simple Hyperduino that you saw at the beginning is meant to be visually non-anxiety causing to fourth grade teachers and such. Um, so it's the minimal configuration necessary for the interactive dioramas. It's still quite versatile, but this one is kind of the notch up. It's called the Hyperduino Plus R. And what it adds is really just kind of two things. It adds um, a motor controller. So that green terminal connectors at the top, uh, spring connectors, those are to attach like robotics motors. Um, you can do, there's a guy brewing beer using this. You can uh, Alex, you could read that top as controller for your pan tilt device, just so you. Uh... I, I, <laughs> I have, I have, I have pieces. <laughs> okay. you know, so, so we're, uh, yeah, we're, we're, I'm working, I'm playing with it, and my that is the, the one of the projects that I want to take on with it is is actually oh, okay. a pan tilt zoom head. And then what the black, red, white uh, connectors are the strips on the left and right is every single pin of the Arduino is brought out on the edges um, as ground five volt signal as a three volt. So if you have a module with three pins, that's a good place. So the way the general rule that I use in figuring out how to hook stuff up is when you're holding something in your hand that you wanna, you know, you wanna connect, you wanna use in a project, it's up. There's a box called the 37 sensors kit that you can get for under $37 on Amazon. That's like the best bargain of the century in components. So when you pull something out of the box, if it's got three connectors, uh, or let's start, if it's got two connectors, like an LED, you use the boxes in the middle. If it's got three pins on it, 
then you use the red, black, the black, red, white strips. And the left hand side is digital IO, the right hand side is analogs. If it's got four, like this MP3 player, then you use the white box at the lower left and the upper right. Those are called Grove connectors. And they're cables that have ground, five volts, and then two signal pins. So for serial communications, there aren't too many things, but an LCD display, the MP3 player module, um, an ultrasonic range, you know, the range sensor, stuff like that. So again, the idea is, oh, you're working on something, you go, oh, here's a module. Oh, okay, four pins. Okay, it goes there. <laughs> right. um, and for the software, there's kind of a big, you know, division in, in how people use this. A lot of you are really familiar with the Arduino IDE, and that's wonderful. I admire and respect your, your amazing powers. Um, every time I try to use the Arduino IDE, it says variable declared out of scope and unbalanced semicolon somewhere or a curly bracket. And being a grumpy old man, I have less patience than I used to. Um, so I really prefer to use a block programming language. And so there's kind of two. There's one called mBlock from a company called MakeBlock. And it looks like it's made for kids and whatever, but there are a lot of extensions for it. And I can, as I said, I can look at a Hackster IO project and assemble it in a block programming language much faster and then edit it. You know, if you want to move functionalities around, I'm not copying and pasting and accidentally leaving a character out in the copy paste. I drag a block to a new position and, and you know, the struggles are with my own limited ability to, to control logic, <laughs> not, not typography. Um, so, um, anyway, there's two languages. One's called Snap for Arduino. That is, is, it's from Berkeley and it's like beyond. It's just, it's, you know, if a person said block language is too simple, I'd say spend a week with Snap for Arduino and come back and tell me how recursive. I can't even understand the first three chapters of their manual, <laughs> <laughs> which, which isn't, a, isn't a negative against the programming language. It's just saying that when they wrote it, it's a very high level team that created it. And so right. you're not going to run into something and say, oh, this was made for fourth graders. It's, it's a very sophisticated environment, but it uses blocks as the coding interface. So Snap for Arduino and mBlock, I find to be very, very useful. And Mickey, I think I made you just host. It doesn't seem to be the right. I don't know. If I it says right it's on my screen. It says Mickey M in the Philippines is the host. I know, but I don't know if I grabbed the right one. He's got a couple. Oh. Is, that, is that the right? <laughs> one? He got he got pushed no. out, and then yeah, mid mid show my uh, Zoom just. Did, did I give you the right one? Are you host now? Yeah, you did earlier. Okay. It's just the uh, my Zoom crashed. Oh, got it. Okay, but you have it now, right? Yes, I do, sir. Okay, great. All right, thanks. Um, oh, so oh, oh, sorry. I'm sorry. I just tried. I, I, I didn't warn you, I take too long to answer simple questions. No, 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 it's, it's Back perfect. to what the group's gonna do is one of my challenges in thinking about today and the group is, is, is the wide diversity of things a person could want to do. So I, I view my function as a tool maker. I try to reduce friction wherever I'm aware of it and I do the best I can. This isn't something that's, it's more like a Lego set or DNA. It's not, you know, a build a ham radio kit from Heath. I only say Heath kit because I know you would remember that, Alex, but. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I had a lot of them. My, my, uh, my, um, my grandfather built, I think it was like a, I couldn't believe that it was like an 1100 watt ham radio transmitter. <laughs> Or transceiver, and and uh, it was a Heath kit. <laughs> wow, I think the I think the Voyager is still the space probe is still getting signals from it. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> it, it, well, it was it, he 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 also had an eighty foot antenna, so it was <laughs> he had a lot of reach. Um, uh, the um, so it, it, I get the geek the geekdom. Um, I learned to program on his computer. He was my grandfather. Wow. It was his t trash eighty. Wow. Uh, yeah. So. Um, <laughs> Anyway, uh, uh, Jason Parks asks, for production use, uh, what are some ideas? And I think this is kind of for the overall group, but also for Roger and what he imagines. But I have, I mean, this is, and this gets to one of to uh, Tommy's questions also is, um, this is the beginning of a pan tilt zoom head for those watching, um, uh, being able to, uh, what I need to build is a, and I don't know whether we'll make this one of our projects because mine requires a bunch of hardware that is outside of that, but controlling motors, I think is really interesting. What I'm trying to build is 
I have a need. This gets, and Roger can contribute to whether this makes sense or not, but I have a need that is unusual. And I think that's what's really cool about Raspberry Pis or, or Arduinos is that you have this custom need of something that you that you have that maybe somebody else needs, but not enough to put it into manufacturing, most likely. So I need to be able to take a teleprompter and a pretty heavy camera, and I need to be able to move it around, but I don't need to, I don't need to be able to have a joystick and have it move smoothly. I don't need it to do any of those things. I just need it to go back and forth and up and down by about 30 degrees max. You know, I just need and it to go this way. That's the teleprompter? Well, the, I need the teleprompter, the camera, the whole rig it sits on to oh, go back and right. forth and up and down. So it's, let's say it's 12 pounds, you know. And it's just, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm a, I'm a deconstructor. So is the idea that the subject um, can kind of move their head around, but not their body. It's, and it looks more natural as they follow no, the teleprompter. No, it's, it's mostly that we send out kits. So I send kits out to put folks and they put them up, but they're, but people who aren't camera people don't know how, don't know how to <laughs> position the camera. Oh, so it's to so fix it. <laughs> it's just for me to fix it remotely. So I want to be able to log it. In. I already have a computer that's part of what we call the brain. So right. we have a brain that we send out and it's got a Mac mini in it and it's got, and I can shade the camera so I can change the colors on the camera. I can make the camera brighter, lighter, you know, darker. The next uh -huh. version of it will let me change the color of the lights and everything else. But what I can't do without asking them mm -hmm. is to adjust the camera. Like they're a little framed this way or a little right. framed that way. And they're just sitting, Okay. but I need, right. I need to be able to adjust it. And the problem is, is when you're the per only person in the room, like if we send out a remote kit, you're the only person in the right. room, how? Do you, you know, like, 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 how do you right. adjust it to frame yourself from there? So what yes. I want to be able to do is look at through zoom, which is what we do now. Right. Now, I think that this, this would be a, it's a, this is a motor that is powerful enough to move that kit, but mm -hmm. a much, and yeah, it's, it's also powerful enough to do a, a, a motion, motion <laughs> control, uh, system for something like the Mandalorian. Um, yeah. but the, uh, so the, um, uh, but it is, I think that there's also a possibility of building one with little motors mm -hmm. that would be useful for webcam. Same thing. You put, you send it right. out to somebody and they, they have it there because the, this is this little like thing right. that I need, that you need to be able to do with a webcam that you can't, you can't get done. So that, does that seem like so, a kind of, the kind well, of thing? Well, that would question be? is, well, actually, yes, we're, John and I have been discussing something not off this topic at all, but once I understand with the teleprompter, but once you use the word you know, a little webcam, then aren't the webcams pan, tilt, and zoom already? Well, kind of. But the problem is, is that, is that they, so you can pan, tilt, zoom them inside their own frame, right? They're a 4K, it's a 4K sensor, uh -huh. and then you crop into it and you just move it around. But oh, limits. wait a minute. I thought it had served. I wait, I thought the, the ones I, the pan, Not, tilt, well, zoom I saw have motors. You can. Usually, here's what happens though, is when you have a, the, the, the huddle cam, for instance, that John uses is still just, panning and tilting inside of that space. Okay. Also, also, um, there's only one camera and it's that that really does that well, well, two, but but the huddle cam is the only one that really does that particularly well, which is what john uses. But I need something that I can do even smaller than that and possibly put on different kinds of cameras, you know, onto it and be able to make uh -huh. those adjustments. Okay, so right. So it's, putting it's on a, different kinds of cameras changes the and, but, and just be able to, you know, make some subtle, <laughs> subtle changes because right. right now, if you don't have that, that camera, um, uh, then you, you have a hard time. And even then right. it only has a little bit of adjustment. Like it's not, right. it's not as much adjustment as I'd like. Right. So. And so for the project you're describing, I mean, one thing is you're all, it's, I think you're already raspberry, raspberry Pi adept. Is okay. that correct? So. Awesome. Uh, no, I'm saying I think you are. Are you? Are you raspberry? Oh, barely, Pi? barely. Oh, okay. Yeah, like thought... we, we we built one. I survived building one last week. That's that's his Raspberry Pi adept. Oh, and, and okay. I, and I loaded a flash memory card into it that was already done. Okay. So so that's that's yes, as good uh, as I I would not say right. that I'm adept in any way, shape, or form. Okay, then. Well, yes. Yeah, so if you were so yes. Yeah, so if I was just picking a random person and saying what's the shortest path to controlling three motors, then I'd pick an Arduino. Um, or right. a micro bit, either one. Um, again, just for the, the shortest path to the objective. Right. Um, because otherwise I'd say, oh yeah, just get out Linux and just get the compiler going. And I'm sorry, there's a bug you need a fix from the guy in Iceland, but don't get his latest patch because that one's broken again. You have to get the 1.63 patch. <laughs> right. Right. So, um, 
So that's and then that really that, the that next question is just power. Oh, sorry, I was just going to say, and this applies to everybody listening, is the other issues that are just power. You know, how many amps do we need for various things? And so that's where, although the maker bit's designed to try to do as much as possible without ever adding anything, there's a limit to that, which is current. So anything right. above, you know, I'd say above one amp um, gets into needing some kind of, you know, a, a mitigation of, you know, how many amps do you, how many amps do you need? Um, and there's also a difference between continuous current and little bursts. Mm -hmm. So you can do more if you're just, you know, doing a little, like an adjustment or something that's not, you know, a continuously running motor. Right. Uh, and, and by the way, if you have uh, ideas, either you can either put them in a condo or raise your hand uh, for the folks. I'll just keep talking or I'll keep asking <laughs> Roger things if you don't. Um, uh, Jonas and then John. I think there are two main concepts we could do for our production usage. The one is like build a control surface to control some of our gear. That could be a cool mm -hmm. project, like add a slider for a T-bar or buttons for the ATEM and something like that. And the other way is to make something react to changes in our workflow, for example. A simple project could be um, if you press a button on the ATEM, for example, the live from a light outside of your door starts blinking to inform people. Simple stuff like that could be useful. Yeah. Yeah. And that yeah. actually, uh, Jonas, that's the other thing I just introduce here is the I do a lot of my work with cardboard boxes. <laughs> uh, they're cheap. Um, it's really easy to poke holes um, and cut out, you know, spaces for LC. You know, I'm not cutting out, you know, sheet metal boxes. Um, to attach components, I use two Velcro dots. So this is actually a multi-purpose controller. It's got an XYZ or an XY coordinate, a trim button. This is Wi-Fi. This is called an ESP8266. This is an infrared receiver. There's a trans infrared transmitter on the front. Um, you know, inside, in this case, it's a, a maker bit, but it could have been a, a Hyperduino. Um, and so for, you know, for building, you know, what you just described, I would say, yes, I could build that tonight. <laughs> um, I'd get oh, my I cardboard can... box. I'd, you know, make a list of the controls you wanted. And then I would use the way the, as you saw in the video, the way, like you mentioned, the light going on, then the way local things attach is with the ribbon cable. But if I want to do it at a distance, then I would just use either Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, or, or in, you know, not infrared for your door, but, you know, Bluetooth would be easy, and so would Wi-Fi, except, you know, the difference being Bluetooth, you just send out a signal and you're done. Wi-Fi, you've got to, you know, have your network on, but either one would be about as fast. Well, and, and, and I love the idea, Jonas, of having like something on, uh, because there's so many buttons, especially on the new ATEM, <laughs> that I'm probably not going to, not going to use. And, What's interesting is, is that if I'm not going to use those buttons and they're not affecting my show, all I need to know is what what ATEM is sending. When I push the button, what does ATEM do? Like, what is its report? And I can grab onto that. Like, that button now is my on-air light that's sitting outside my room so that my kids and my wife don't <laughs> come in. So um, so I think that, that that's a great one. So turning on lights, a tally, you know, would be the mo most obvious one. So I don't know, Roger, in video world, you know, we... Our tally is just telling you that you're that you're on your cameras on, <laughs> you know, oh, so we put okay. so we have little lights that we'll put all on on right. all the cameras and that little that's a tally light um, and there's two different oftentimes there's two different tally lights one is preview and mm -hmm. then the other so it might be green and then it turns red and so being able to turn those lights on and off based on the state of the of the uh, switcher would be right. kind of and if I was doing it especially when you get into multiple devices so you said oh I've got ten mm -hmm. cameras and I've got a light over the door and whatever I don't want to Personally, I'm a cheapskate. I don't want to buy 10 Raspberry Pis. Right. And also every Raspberry Pi is ultimately, you know, the idea was it's going to be attached to a keyboard and a monitor. And for a light, well, and, you don't need a keyboard or a monitor, right? Well, so that's where for, we go in the area of microcontrollers. Well, and, and one of the things I think we've that we've done, I think that our our tally that was Arduino based was a whole bunch of lights all just plug in into one yeah. case. You know, like they were all, <laughs> right. you know, so like all of the, all the lights were just, it was just one, one Arduino and a whole yeah. bunch of, whole bunch of lights. Yeah, this um, is, this is actually something I prepared for today. We're not, I don't think we're going to use, 
What? Oh, hold on. <laughs> hold on. Um, it was talking to me. Okay. So what this was, was something I prepared this just a row for touch sensors. What I use are earring posts. So this is, I don't know, you can really see it on the camera, but that's mm -hmm. actually the, it, from Michael's craft store. That's an earring nice. post right. and it's conductive. And it turns out that it fits perfectly into a, what's called a DuPont socket. But these little connectors that are on like jumper wires and whatever, mm -hmm. um, an earring post fits snugly. I mean, it even has a little notch on it that clicks. So when you, when you poke that, when I was holding up this controller earlier, I didn't mention, you know, what are these touch? Those are earring backs, and then they're just attached to the wires. So for instance, this, if we were doing screen, actually, maybe, can you, can I share my screen for just a minute? Yeah, absolutely. All right. We'll just try this to see if it works. Let's see. Share, share screen. So this is a, that doesn't look like the right thing though. Screen. Oh, there we are. Oh, I see. It's because of the tab. Oh, there we are. Can you guys see something that says Hyperduino? Yep. With a green list. And so in the first one, if I touch this first sensor, it goes to that web page on the right. If I touch the next one, it goes to the second one. If I touch the third one, it actually will start playing a YouTube video uh, with minus the M. Um, and then if we make this full screen like this, and hopefully we'll skip our little ads here. Any of the ones that I touch brings up different videos, right? So th the way this is programmed, these are little, basically this is a selection of different different examples of projects to show you right. um but they're all based on the same idea you touch a touch sensor and so this is kind of what it looks like in in this app this is but without the app you're doing the same thing as you say when i touch a certain sensor then right. it would it would it would get picked up and then stop 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 so then we get picked up and then whatever action you want to make you know is in your code right um, so it's just to say that, you know, when you were talking about, and I'll turn my screen sharing back off. So you're talking about a panel with buttons. That's, that's actually what I built out of some <laughs> yeah, foam core, great. foam core and some LEDs and whichever one is that's active, awesome. uh, yeah. then it just lights up that channel. That's awesome. Yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, I've got a couple more questions here. Yes. Uh, the, um, Jason Pank said, uh, which Arduino model is best or are they similar? Are they also? Uh, they're they're not similar, and, and again, this is very much my personal bias. So, one, the Arduino is like this giant family tree. So, it started with an Arduino Uno that, that I think you're familiar with. So, and then back to the Arduino and the Hyperduino. So, the Arduino Uno is the first one, um, and that's what the Hyperduino fits into. So, any any Arduino that has this pattern of of headers, this will go into fact, they even make a Raspberry Pi header adapter for the Raspberry Pi. So if you bought the Apple Pi, which is an Arduino, just physical adapter for Raspberry Pi, you could plug a Hyperduino into it. So there are Nano Duinos, Micro Duinos, Bob's cat Duinos. Um, <laughs> and, and what's your, and your preference is the Uno? The well, Uno and, and I'll just explain it. It's back to Forrest Gump. If I go and get something for the Leonardo or the Mega, it's, I mean, a project. Like I find a project that the code was for the Mega. It's not going to run on something else. And it's probably not going to run on a Mega 3, only a Mega 2. Um, and so it's you start just, getting into the complexity. You start, exactly. Starts... So, so I stick with an Uno. <laughs> Mm -hmm. uh, it's the oldest one. It's the least capable, but it's okay for me because I'm the least right. capable Arduino guy. Um, <laughs> you know, I, we're well matched. So, right. you know, I use the Uno or something that has that header pattern. So as long right. as it has that layout, then you can use the, the Hyperduino to plug into it. And so for my purposes, I'm using the Uno, but there are you know, if you were in the Arduino IDE and, you know, clicked on the button that said boards, you'd see this, you know, this huge list. 
Right. And so at the end of the day, if it's a little mini micro thing, then the Hyperduino is not going to help because it doesn't have that, that header pattern. Right. Uh, Jonas? Oh, I'm sorry, one, John. One big part with the Arduinos is that you don't have to buy the original Arduino one because they publish their um, schematics. So I, I think you use a Fundrino in some of That's right. Products. I was going to say, that's right. So this has been out there. Arduinos is an open source diagram thing. That's why I said you can literally, this is a Funduino, which is identical in every single aspect to an Arduino. It just costs much less. Um, so... <laughs> So for my kits, you know, you guys may right. have some, but when we, when we, and I can build these kits anyway, you know, we can, yep. we can make what's in them any way we want. For those who don't have an Arduino, I would be putting in either, you know, either this and Arduino Uno or whatever I happen to have, you know, a pile of at that moment, but right. they're very, at this level, they're very standardized. Um, you know, if you're getting again, a mega, an Arduino mega three from spark fun, that's something different. <laughs> no, absolutely. Uh, John. Well, I, was, I think the challenge with Roger is to figure out what Many. we want to do and let him think about it. So I'm going to, for the tally light, I want to use this, which Roger and I are using with another project. Oh. So we can not only do red and green, but we could do countdowns, cues, and other things. Yeah. Now, this is a point to me about introducing to the BBC computer. But it went from, Roger, will you look at this computer? No, I won't look at this computer. Roger, will you look at this computer? No, I won't look at this computer. I'm, I got everything I need. Roger, I sent one to you. <laughs> and the next thing I know, we're using the BBC computer to control devices through Zoom calls. So what we're, we're able to do is use the pan tilt control of remote cameras to drive a little robotic car with an iPhone also in a Zoom call. So I think the challenge for this group is let's think of what would projects we want to do. Right. And then Roger can make a kit up with the parts right. and then we get assembled very much like we did the, uh, the play out device. But my vote is for a really cool tally light system. I like that. By the way, I just want to say, since John introduced that, you know, it's like now that the testimony has been introduced in court, um, what, how this got, how the reason John has one of these is one of the things I always wanted, I imagined existed and didn't was a real battleship game. Yeah, so, so this one, this is the, your fleet, the enemy fleet, and we're connected in a zoom call. So any, all of us, any of us can connect. And when we, we place our ships aim and fire, it lights up on yours and yours lights up on mine. And we can play real electronic battleship in a Zoom call. <laughs> That's great. That's great. And it, this, I, by the way, this thing is a it's a eight by eight LCD or LED display of any color, and then they make sixteen by sixteens also. The uh, the interesting thing is, I, I love the idea of using the boxes to build them, and then a fair number of it, what it leads us to is that there's a fair number of us that have printers as well. And so that like to start with the boxes where we can move fast and furious and, and think about it and everything else. Yes. And then, uh, cause how many people here in the, in the group have a, have a 3d printer just out of curiosity. Yeah. So no, not as many oh, one thing I should start when you mentioned the box, my, I have great breakthroughs that are on my, uh, um, I don't know. I was trying to imagine something like the Smithsonian or, you know, the know, Winchester, but whatever my great breakthrough this uh, past year was, realizing I could fold a pizza box inside out. So with a clean pizza box, the print goes inside and the blankness goes outside. Huh. And now you can draw on whatever. So I could right. see for a while I was actually, you know, like gluing paper over the Domino's label. Right. It turned <laughs> out you didn't need to do that. You could, you could. I, yeah, it was, a, it was a, for me, it was an impressive moment. But anyway, so I just suggest, you know, when you're doing your projects, you can get pizza boxes, you fold them inside out, you can draw on it, you can glue paper on the outside, they really are wonder. And then depending on the thickness and the size, you know, you can, you can really have a lot of, a lot of versatility very, very easily. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, I had I, one person I'm trying to, uh, I'm trying to get an engineer that used to work at Hallmark, um, you know, to come join us when we start to do these and if she's oh. if she's open to it and she used to make she used to work on the little 
So he's got three pennies literally to work with on a card that has to work all the time. And they were, you know, what can the card do? And, wow. uh, but, and she did some stuff for us where she hacks, she rips the card apart and says, well, that's one thing you can do with it, but let me show you all the other things you can do with this card. And, wow. uh, I, I thought there's, there's a whole TV show there of just, of just someone who goes like has to like a MacGyver, except they just yes. go to the card store, they buy a card and then they build something for it that, that, you know, takes down the bad guys, you know? So anyway, yes. um, Great Jonas, idea. <laughs> Jonas, uh, Jonas Detel uh, asked, uh, he's here, um, how hard would it be to add Ethernet slash Wi-Fi to the board? So, uh, very easy. Well, so now this is, the, I have a saying, if a person has two choices, they choose none of the above. So, um, so I'm about to introduce the, you know, the alternative is the maker bit. And the reason, you know, the, and, so if I was going to do that, I would use the maker bit and the BBC micro bit. And really for anything you're doing, this is actually the way I would go. So the way the way the party started, I was invited to an Arduino party. <laughs> now that I've had the hors d'oeuvres free food and wine, um, I'll just say that the, uh, the maker bit is where I'm putting all my energy now. And this... The micro bit is done by a, a collaboration between Microsoft, a hardware manufacturer, Farnell, and the BBC. And the goal was to introduce a million kids to programming in the UK. And so on this, this little chip, these cost about $15. It has Bluetooth built in. It has an accelerometer built in. It has a compass built in. It has a five by five LED display built in. And then the programming language is called um, make code. And you can program in Python, in a block language, in JavaScript. And, and in that case, when I plug this in, when I mentioned this controller, this little chip is called the ESP8266. It's a couple, whoops, couple dollars for something with an antenna that can connect to Wi-Fi. At this moment, it's trivial for me to attach it, and I do mean trivial, to the maker bit. It's not trivial to attach it to the Arduino. So, you know, I, I'm, I'm and, hesitant and what, to introduce what, this, but I'll say, yes? What utility is lost by the, the BBC then that you have with other than the breakouts? Um, well, my 98% answer is none and about mm. a tenfold increase in utility. <laughs> the, to represent the Arduino enthusiasts here, I'll say there are, there's 50, well, Metcalf's law says the bigger the network, the exponential increase in power of the network. Power of the network is the square of the nodes. So on the Arduino, you have 15 years of people, you know, creating things. And I often say, if you wanna make something, anything, like a movable teleprompter with a water cooler. <laughs> you type that into Google and you just add the word Arduino and you'll find it. Somebody somewhere has not only done a, a movable teleprompter with a camera, but they've added a water cooler and a, and a right. espresso machine <laughs> or something. So what I do is I add the word Arduino to what I'm looking for. I find the concept and then I build it on a maker bit, on a micro bit. Um, so yeah, yeah, Jonas, what I found um, my university worked with both. Uh, I started with Arduino, and then we had uh, some maker bits with near field communication and stuff like that. Um, we basically built digital name tags. And the one thing I found is that with an Arduino, you are much closer to the hardware and to a standard size set. The micro bit really is built for education, I found. Yes. I would I'd find it hard to adapt it to, yeah. Well, for, hold on though. So yes, everything I said, I and I, I'm sorry to interrupt the, the hard to adapt part. The there is always a tension and a conflict between closeness to the hardware level. Remember, I wrote the first book on assembly language, which is only one level above machine language. Um so, and so, for instance, when, when we built the maker bit, one of the things we did was I did not use ISP. I didn't use techniques like something called the I2C protocol as an intermediary between the maker, between the micro bit and the motors. 
So when you're going to, everything is pin to pin. So at that level, if you want to go down to Python or levels below Python, you can go down to whatever level of, of, of absolutism you want. And the, this is still just a bridge between the, the hardware of the board and the, the physical world. Um, I, I, and I don't know, there isn't really a perfect, it's like what's this, the Zen Cohen is what's the perfect balance between non-opaqueness, being able to see every bit and every bit of memory and every process where the power of that understanding gives you power right. um, and low friction where things have been facilitated enough. Like if I want to attach an ESP chip and I want to connect to Wi-Fi, I don't really want to be down at the packet level. I just want to put in my network name and my password and, mm -hmm. and say, send John, you know, my, my battleship coordinate. Right. Uh, so, but that's a, you know, it's a really good point. That's, I think the Arduino is much more exposed in terms of how every single thing in it is going on, where the friction, you know, rises like a hockey stick is when you get into the, I, the code that you see in any given project, and then you're trying to get your libraries to get along. Um, so, but good point. Yep. Um, Tony Mobley said, did you know the 27th is the worldwide Arduino celebration day? I should. I know there is a worldwide celebration day. <laughs> um, you think I'd uh, have it tattooed, but I, I don't. Tommy, Tommy, uh, <laughs> Tommy Chance said, uh, would, would this be something to control servos for a, a tilt pan? And the answer is yes, we covered that. Yes. I think you, yeah. And there the issue is just current. Yep. Yep. Um, and then Stan Chan says, as a general rule of applications of Arduino versus Raspberry Pi, would you say that it is between a single re repeatable use case and a multi-purpose deployment of applications? Is that question for me? Yeah. I, I, it, just, it, it sounded really good. It, I, it, <laughs> it, it sounds like a, 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 a really concise version of what we talked about earlier, which is if you have I one think, sentence. May I refer you to my press secretary who will uh, give you a yeah, position paper on that later. No, so say it again slowly. I, I need to As a general it. rule of applications of uh -huh. Arduino versus Raspberry Pi, and this was written a little while ago when we were talking about it. Um, okay. Would you say um, uh, it? It is between the single, um, uh, would you say it is between a single repeatable use case versus a multi-purpose deployment of applications? I think I actually understand that question and I'll say no. Okay. <laughs> We're number five. Well, how'd I do? Um, so for instance, I'm involved in a commercial app, you know, I, I do scaling, not well, but I, I attempt it. Um, if I was going to make an electronic battleship game and sell it at the New York Times toy fair, I wouldn't put a, a Raspberry Pi inside. Well, well no, but I think that, yeah. So when he said multiple, so I think I understood it to be multiple think, embodiments or multiple copies of the thing. Well, so I think I it's multi-purpose, multi-purpose deployment of applications. So like an, a Raspberry Pi is just, you would possibly use it for lots of different things. Whereas an Arduino, you might build it in, you, you can use it for lots of different things, but each one is you're just having it do that thing. Uh, I think that would be require a beer, maybe tequila and a longer <laughs> venue. <laughs> okay, very good. Chris, Chris Whitner <laughs> said, I've seen farm robots and vehicles aplenty. Is there a simple way to use this for talent focus? Uh, oh, so this is like being able to track somebody. Um, oh, oh. That I'd say, you know, probably. Um, so on the Arduino says, so the more kind of specialized the concept, the more that it's never been done before, I think an Arduino would win the competition because right now there are little robotic vehicles with cameras. They have, you know, all the stuff's commoditized. Now you can get a little tiny internet connected camera. It goes into a Raspberry Pi. And it does image recognition and artificial intelligence and tele intelligence <laughs> uh, and whatever. So if I was going to do something that followed a person like Dan, John knows this guy, Dan, what's his last name? Oh, he's muted. So he doesn't have a name. Dan Freeman. <laughs> uh, yes. Dan Freeman. So he showed me that, right? That in, I was talking to Dan, we were on a Zoom call and the camera was following Dan as he walked around in his, his room. Um, Ash Yadav said, uh, what are the best motors to use for a project with Arduino? 
depends on the project. <laughs> um, James Babbitt Good said, uh, yeah, James Babbitt <laughs> said, uh, could Roger Wagner post the link to 37 sensor kit on Amazon? Uh, I can actually carry on. You can also Google it faster than I will post it. Yeah, okay. You know what? In my family, that's <laughs> that, in my family, that, that's called your Google is as good as mine. Um, <laughs> Uh, Jason Panks uh, said, idea, make a momentary or latching mute button for Unity comms or Zoom. Uh, what would the pieces that would be needed? Yeah, that would totally be a... Oh, sorry. Um, a, a type send. So say that again, because I follow, I was, I was Googling. The idea so. was to make a momentary or latching mute button for Unity comms or... Unity comms is one of the com communication systems okay. that we use or Zoom. So, so maybe a, the... a momentary switch to do... Right. So one, the link is in your chat. And the reason I put a link and just instead of punting on that one too, is another funny story. And I know I didn't, we probably are getting to the end of our time here, but I have all the time in the world of an old retired I, guy, but I'm afraid I have to go, <laughs> I have to go be part of a show. So I have to leave. Okay. All right. So real fast, 37 sensor kit became like Kleenex or Xeroxing. It's like a, a dozen companies, 24 companies, a hundred companies make them. Elegoo is, you know, as is the one I've been buying. And now I just noticed, I Googled it. And of course now there's a 47 sensor kit. Uh, right. So I'll just say in general, they all have terrible documentation. The quality is surprisingly good considering you're paying 75 cents a sensor. <laughs> um, and beyond that, I'll leave it to your enjoyment. Back to the question. It, there's a final, you know, a last mile of interfacing, which is Roger, I've got X. You know, can I plug this into it? And, you know, how easy is it to get to the wires? What's inside X? Is it just an on off? So duplicating the function of an on off momentary switch, easy. Connecting it to um, device X, I'd have to look inside device X to see, right. see what's in there. Right. Last question that we have here is, uh, do you ship to Canada? <laughs> Uh, I'll, uh, you know, Alan Scott. that was a good last. Uh, so I have shipped to Canada. The problem is to ship anywhere outside. And this is one of my concerns about this group. And we'll leave it for further discussion. The problem is the post office charges $60 for the first gram. <laughs> uh, and after that, everything's free. So, you know, just be aware. Yes, I can ship to Canada. And no matter what I put in the box, it's 60 bucks. Right. And then, so if you're getting 10 Hyperduinos, it's not bad. It's $6 shipping a Hyperduino. But if you're getting one, it's not so good. Um, so it annoys me, you know, and the same for Philippines, Australia, Germany, you know, anywhere. Um, I can ship anywhere in the world. It bugs me to, to pay the price. But, but that's really, you know, that's tempted to say that's your problem, not mine, but it still bothers me. <laughs> Right, right. I'll I'll take on the problem if it becomes really an issue. I, I okay, a little bit good. More pull. Guy has, right. guy has, guy has. He knows people. He knows people. Good. He knows people. Well, he's my new best friend then. <laughs> yeah, we just happen to do a lot of volume worldwide, so we got some negotiated rates with UPS. So it might be oh, easier good. to get ten from you and then ship them to the group. Yes, and I would be delighted. Rates. I'd be delighted yeah, to take a load off you. That. You know, freight forwarding is that what they call it? Yeah, or even better. <laughs> Freight case, forwarding be... plus negotiated rates. Yeah, we'll figure something awesome. out. Oh, okay, excellent. excellent. So, so I think we're, we're at the bottom of the hour. I think that some of the stuff we came up with uh, there was tally light, you know, controlling a uh, uh, tally light controlling possibly a PTZ controlling you know a signal back to let's say an ATEM switcher, so a, a communication with the switcher. Um, yeah, go and, and the the incredible heads up. LED. So there's four things that I think we're, we're on, our, on our way to, Jonas. One thing we need to keep in mind is for everything you now mentioned, we need some form of Ethernet or Wi-Fi or some protocol based on that. We might need to do some basic, I measure something analog and do something else first, because that will be, yeah. I don't know how easy it is to add a... I Oh, sorry to interrupt. I was just going to say, I would. I think what I'd like to give the group as a homework assignment is to meditate on Arduino versus Microbit, because for that Wi-Fi connector, 
I can do that today easily on the micro bit. On the Arduino, we can do it. There's a ton of articles written. There's a ton of resources on the 8266, but it's just a little more disjointed on bringing them together. Okay. Jonas, yeah, so continue. We'll, I didn't have to. I, I think that what we'll do is we'll probably talk about it this week and then come okay. back and say, this is what we're interested in. We'll, we'll okay. the, the Congress, the Congress will convene, <laughs> convene for the week and we'll probably, um, I'll warn people that probably the deepest conversations will happen in the pre pre show about it. So, um, <laughs> so that's hidden. That's our, sh that's our, our, our convening at 5. AM every morning. And you're every safe. Cause I asked Roger to come to the 5. AM and he said that was too early so we could talk about him. Yeah. Yeah. So, so that's our, our, our 5. AM pre pre show is probably where the deepest, longest conversation will be about it, but we'll, we'll probably talk about it during our shows, uh, you know, a little bit, um, this week. And we'll come, we'll come up with a solution. I want to come up with it by the end of the week to make sure that you have time to do what ne is needed and we get a sense of how many and, you know, everything else. So we'll probably, you know, we'll, we'll first give you a, like, this is what we want to do and you can figure out what the kit is that's required to do it. Then we'll um, uh, give you some time to tell us how much it costs and everyone gets to order at once. You know, yeah. like, like everyone gets to just put the order in and then you yeah. and Guy can figure out how we're getting them out to everybody. Okay, um, sounds fun. I, I, I think this is for me, for me. This sounds like a lot of fun. So yeah, I, I think it's great. I think it's we're we're really uh, you know um, I think we're very fortunate to have you. And so I just thank you so much for taking the time to hang out with us. And yeah, well, absolutely. And likewise, you know, a tool builder is unfulfilled without somebody to actually use what gets made. So well, I think I think we could you know the 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 goal here. We kind of do this different group dynamic thing where you saw, I guess, the video from last week from the Raspberry Pi or a little bit of yes. it. Is that you know my concept is always if you can get a lot of people to think about the same thing at the same time, and then what we have is a persistent community. So it's not a class that we all come together and do it. We have a community that's going to probably stay together for a long time. And so when fifty or a hundred people learn it. It means that now when other people are coming in to learn it, there's a other bunch of other people to ask answer yeah. questions, you know, that are really part of the community. And yeah. so it's a slightly different structure. So it's uh anyway, so we're excited. Well, very good. Likewise. And All thank right. you, Alex. Thank you, everybody. Jonas, Guy, Nikki, thank you. And uh thank you. It's been really great. Thank you. Well, and we'll so we'll we'll uh we'll we'll have more information to you by the end of the week. All right. I'll All be right. Here. Thanks, Roger. All thank right. you so much. Sure. All right. And thanks to everybody else to the end of the long day. Um, you know, so, uh, so we, we it was it was easy. We only went eight hours today, so it's like 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 a a relaxed a relaxed uh, session. So uh, for a Saturday. So anyway, thanks so much. Uh, remember that that Sky is got his thing at five o'clock. His his live stream with Mad in the Kitchen. Um, so everyone should go up and watch it, and then we'll talk. We're going to talk about it tomorrow morning. Uh, so if you don't watch it by tomorrow morning, then you'll just have to follow along. So anyway, so uh, so anyway, so check that out. And um, John is going to star on it. He's going to actually teach us how to make jambalaya. That's that's the story. That's the story I've heard. Is it's actually John teaching us how to how to do jambalaya, and 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 uh, Madeline's just going to follow along. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, all right, great work, everybody, and uh, we will see you all um, tomorrow morning. Sounds good. All right, take care.